Hello, welcome to Portland, Oregon, those of you who are here in person. Um, and for those of you who are online, uh, my name is Kiba Ashkan-Haller, and I am a um, dean in the College of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences at Oregon State University. And we are right now um, in a... Uh, a jeep, we go. Very limber. We are right now in the building that is part of the Oregon State University campus. We call this Oregon State University's Portland Center. Um, the building was originally a department store, Meyer Frank, um, in the 1920s, I think, and um was completely remodeled. And during the remodel, it was also retrofitted for a seismic um, fit. So we are in a safe spot if the big one was to hit. Um, but of course, before, way before then, this land um, was the land of tribal nations. And you might not be surprised to find out. Oh, echo again. Uh, you might not be surprised to find out that Portland, what is now Portland at the confluence of the Willamette and Columbia Rivers was a very important trading post um, for the indigenous people who lived here before us. And some of those folks, um, some of those tribes, you will see their names represented in streets and counties. So Multnomah, Wasco, Powlett, Clackamas, Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Molala, you will see all of these names all around us. Um, uh, so people know that those are the people who uh, inhabited this land for centuries, for generations. And so I do want to start out with the land acknowledgement. Um, Oregon State University, and I'm going to read our land acknowledgement um, as OSU really paid attention to the wording. So OSU recognizes the impact of its land grant history on indigenous communities in Oregon. Through the Morrill Act of 1862, which established land grant universities in the United States, the federal government seized nearly 11 million acres of land from 250 sovereign tribal nations with little or no compensation. Oregon State University in Corvallis is located within the traditional homelands of the Mary's River Ampinapu Band of Kalapuya. Following the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855, the Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon. Today, living descendants of these people are part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Rod Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of Left Indian. Indigenous people are valued, contributing members of Oregon State community and represent multiple sovereign tribes among our students, among our faculty, staff, and alumni. The part that really resonates with me, um, Oregon State University accepts its responsibility for understanding the continuing impact of that history on the communities, and we are committed in the spirit of self-reflection, of learning, of reconciliation, and of partnership, to ensure that this institution of higher learning will be of enduring benefit, not only to the state of Oregon, but also to the people on whose end and we are now today. I think this committee really takes this to heart, right? These are not just words. Um, there are actions that we can take as a committee um, in the spirit of self-reflection, learning, reconciliation, and partnership. I really like those. And in particular, over the past month or so, we've had some conversations about what it would look like to include um, the voices and needs of indigenous communities, of uh, tribal nations here, of indigenous communities elsewhere in the U.S., how to include their voices in this work, right? So as we're thinking about ocean science priorities, um, we want to take into account the ocean science priorities of tribal nations in the um, We will hear some of that perspective here today, but primarily we as a committee decided that instead of trying to invite uh, folks from tribal nations and indigenous communities into this meeting and give them a few minutes to speak to us or be part of a merely one hour panel discussion, we have decided that instead we will go to them. Um, and I already have some meetings set up for November and December um, where I will go and we, hopefully some of you will join and we will go and talk to uh, tribal caucuses, um, you know, specific tribal nations who have expressed interest on their time. And of course, only if they have time and willingness to engage with us. We know they have other priorities as well. And I know there are others on the committee who are making similar uh, context so that we have a better sense of um, nationally uh, what the needs of tribal communities are, as well as indigenous communities 
um, in, in Alaska and Hawaii, for example. Okay, so with that, I want to welcome you all here into this space, uh, both um, physically and virtually. It is great to see so many of our um, uh, committee members here. Um, and Kirsty, you need to make sure you, you have a seat at the table too. We, we need to squeeze together a little bit more and rearrange the tables to make that possible. Um, yeah, we can do, we do it now. We can do it at the break. That's important. But, um, Sounds fine here. This sure. meeting has been one that I've been really excited about. Um, and I will tell you, I had a hard time sleeping last night. So uh, I'm caffeined up. So if I, feel, if I look like I'm a little overexcited, that's where that's coming from. And the reason why I've been so excited is because we've been doing a lot of work um, that's been focused on ocean drilling lately. And I want to thank those of you who really poured blood, sweat, and tears into our interim report so far. You've been doing an amazing job. Um, and those of us who have not contributed as much because ocean drilling is not part of our, um, we don't feel like it's squarely within our expertise, please know that we have been reading and thinking about what you've written um, and we want to make sure that this is the consensus report. So even uh, those of us who haven't written a word must must make sure that we agree to every word that is in the report. Um, and we also promise you that we'll do a lot of heavy lifting on the report, um, along with welcoming, of course, you all. Have to think about. Now, the reason why I was excited about this report is because this is our chance to really open our aperture a little bit more and really think about ocean sciences. Um, overall, right? Um, and so here too, I will remind you, and we've had this conversation many times, that each one of us brings to this work a specific disciplinary lens. Yes, but each one of us through that lens is responsible for thinking about the ocean science enterprise as a whole, right? If each one of us only advocates for our piece of the pie, we will have failed. Okay, so please keep that responsibility in mind. We are here representing the entire ocean science community. And we are here from, to hear from some experts about their ideas. Now, um, the intention that I set for this week, um, I thought to myself, you know, what, what is my intention for this week? And the words that I came up with myself were pay attention. This week, these next two days, I want to pay attention. And what I mean by that is not just listen to the words, but really pay attention to the whole. Um, and so I invite you to think about what intention you bring to these next two meetings um, and make sure that you stick to that intention, right? That, that we bring that kind of um, intentionality to that this meeting. Let's see, what am I forgetting? Logistics. <clears throat> There's some coffee and pastries and fruit over just on the other side here, for those of you in the room on the other side of the panel. Uh, the bathrooms are around the corner to my left, um, uh, down that way. And um, Oregon has uh, is promising kind of a mixture of an October day for you, which is very convenient for this time of year. I love October in Oregon, so I'm really glad that you all joined us here. Um, for this season. Let's see, our agenda, um, we have a packed agenda today. We've got a great show tonight. Um, <laughs> we have a number of panels. We try to really you know, build in a few breaks here and there so we can network with the folks who are visiting with us. Um, but mostly I will say we have a very packed agenda today. Um, so again, try to keep the intention, try to keep the energy level up and let's make sure we take as much out of this. We really appreciate um, that our panel members and visitors have joined us. Some travel from far away to be here in person. Um, so let's make sure that we give them. All right, it is 8.44. So I think I'm right on time with my introductory comments. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to Jim. Yeah, I'm uh, Jim Yoder. Uh... I'm a co-chair, and uh, so I'm sort of moderating the next session, which is on ocean observing infrastructure and innovation. And so we have uh, three people uh, talk uh, about OOI in different parts of the world, different parts of the world, water in the world. And uh, so we'll go ahead and. Excuse me, sir. Wait, sorry, we're having a little bit of trouble hearing you. Back. Okay. All right. Uh, Jim Yoder, I'm the co-chair, <laughs> and uh, we have a panel to talk about the Ocean Observing Initiative. Uh, and I think we'll just let them 
but I'm sorry, I'm not sure which one of you is going to go first, but uh, go for it. Tonight. Nice. Nice. So I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully this works. I think we're there, right? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Jeanette Simmons. I'm the lead PI of the Program Management Office at OOI. Uh, we really welcome the opportunity to talk to this group, to this panel. Um, it is going to be a jam-packed presentation, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide other than to say Ed Deaver is uh, to my right, your left, um, who's the OS from OSU in the Endurance Array. Beth Kelly is to my left, your right, um, who's from the University of Washington, who's um, lead PI of the Regional Cable Array. Anthony Copper is maybe online, I'm not sure. He's at OSU and he heads up our cyber infrastructure. And Al Kudeman, who may or may not be on, he had a doctor's appointment, we'll see, um, from Wood Soul, and he runs the Global Coastal Science Unit, CGSN component. Um, so we were given a number of questions. Uh, I'm not going through all these. We hit, I think, just about every one. Maybe not in the exact order. Uh, and we went off menu maybe a couple of times to talk about previous things. Uh, the one bullet that we will not address because you will see after our science highlights is number three. We hit all subfields of ocean science and the relevant. Um, and so well, uh, without much further ado, because we do need to get through these, I'm just going to introduce the, the arrays themselves, what OOI looks like. And what we're looking at here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven arrays, two of which have been discontinued. Uh, we might have some discussion about that at some point. But of the five active arrays, they support 900 sensors, 80 platforms, and we're hoping to keep this thing running for 30 years, starting in 2016. And so we're about eight years in. So we don't have um, and so what are these arrays? There are two global arrays in the Gulf of Alaska in the Hermager Sea. There are two coastal arrays on the West Coast, the Endurance Array, and on the East Coast, the Pioneer Array. And there is our regional cable array uh, operated um, on the seafloor off the Washington, Oregon coast. And you'll hear more about all of these arrays I did want to point out the Coastal Pioneer Array on the Mid-Atlantic Bike is no longer there. We're going to have to put a little discontinued in 2012, I think, or 2013. I forget. I think it was fall of 2012. Oh, the first of one. Yeah. So that will be discontinued. What we are working on now, and we can ask questions about this uh, later, is we're moving the Mid-Atlantic Bike Pioneer Array, as the name implies, it's on the move. Right, so it's chuck wagon and moving to North uh, Carolina off the coast there. <clears throat> um, a lot of excitement is being built around that. So, um, do want to make it very clear this is a collaboration between the three institutions that you see on the bottom. That you can see on the bottom of my slide between Woodsall, UW, and Oregon State. And so, um, that's what we've got our our um, guys. So, I love to work with geophysicists because you get some really cool photos. <laughs> Lots more than that, but you get some really nice photos. This is a nice shot of a hydrothermal vent that Deb's group um, routinely uh, makes movies of. Uh, beautiful, right? I, as I mentioned, am a meteorologist, um, a bona fide meteorologist from Penn State, but I'm a marine meteorologist. And so I work on air sea interaction and I work with oceanographers on the near surface processes. So this slide is meant to do thing, two things. OOI operates and maintains sophisticated instrumentation and demanding locations. And you can see a couple of them, lots more examples. Tell me the size of that buoy for, for scale. Yeah, so that is a, um, I imagine it's a three meter discus buoy. So you're probably up, well, I know you're up six meters. So six meters tall is where that anemometer is. Right? And you ask questions. If you so um, in demanding locations like this, and we really, really try at each of these arrays to be, make measurements from the sea floor to the lower atmosphere, every array, right? That's our goal. Now, we a, a lot went into designing the OI, and many of you in this room were involved in many meetings, uh, white papers, you name it. There were some curveballs thrown at us at the end. 
but we have a, a truly remarkable observatory. Um, here are some of our science themes that came out of all of those meetings. I can confidently say that we've hit each and every one of those science things, and then some um, through the operation of the OOI. Um, we will probably work on um, another one of these documents, working with our OOI facilities board, who is primarily responsible for this document with our help. And we'll probably do something just like this, and, and then some, again, in the upcoming five years. So I'm going to do my best. Oh, and actually, I can really do my best to take um, the slides. These are uh, Alf Ludeman slides that I said I would um, talk to him on. This is our the previous Pioneer, which is on the um, New England shelf and, and is on its way right now to the Mid-Atlantic Pipe. But this place was pretty amazing place to do research. Um, it, it, it really did result in many insights related to physical processes um, in the region, and you can read them uh, in, the, in the bullets. But Al wanted to make this point. The bottom line is that the dominant processes are, are not the ones we expected. Remember, this was to look at how do we get stuff across the shelf break front, you know? Well, it turns out it's pretty easy to get stuff across the shelf break front, even from Block Island, where we saw influences of both the shelf break front and the Gulf Stream. So it's something that we did not expect. Um, there's some talk about perhaps putting an element back, but that's that's to be discussed. Um, so, um, and the other thing that I wanted to make clear is that this started out mainly as a physical oceanography experiment, but in the last years, more and more biogeochemists have been using it, more and more and more. That is one of our goals, is to get the broad community using these observing arrays and now we're starting to get papers out of all of these subdisciplines from um, pioneer beings. Next one is this Erminger C. Uh, it's a great place to do work if you're really interested in nasty conditions, which I am. High winds, high waves, you name it, we get it. Uh, we've gotten very good at maintaining the, these um, arrays out for a year. These have to be deployed for a year. And uh, a couple of highlights, very challenging environment. I think we know that. Um, and really, really strong collaboration with OSMAP, right? And, and some of you are familiar with OSTAP. We form sort of the western edge of OSTAP East is where we are, right at the tip. You can see the tip of, of Greenland. Now, this is something that Al wanted me to mention. It's easy to forget the idea that Erminger Sea was, was not a hot spot. Or well, was was not a hotspot for um, convection like deep convection like AMA. It's now unequivocal. It is an extremely important region for maintaining AMA, perhaps even more than the Labrador Sea that was its competitor and remains its competitor. But this, um, it's very clear that the Amur Sea is, is vital for the maintenance of that and the weakening of that, as we're finding. And then, lastly, for Al. Um, so Papa Genie, it's been here forever and ever, right? And one of the key things about Papa and why you uh, provide it there, um, in addition to the long time series of atmospheric measurements, it didn't have um, so much to say about deep water in that region. And so that is what OOI is providing. It is It um, sort of connects with the other regional observatory, that means RCA and Endurance and Papa, are a, sort of a triangle for things like modeling and validation and um, initialization of uh, numerical models. And Ed's going to talk about that a little bit. Um, and I think that's, uh, I think I'm going to stop there. So, one for the meteorologists. I don't know if there's any other meteorologists in the room, but uh, as I said, I'm a marine meteorologist. The OOI is the only continuous network uh, measuring, directly measuring momentum and process. The only one, right? We go on our research cruises and occasionally we'll put these out. I now have five years of data from these various ones. With that, you can do things like improve model parameterizations, model physics, using this data. And some of you may be familiar with things like the drag coefficient or the buoyancy, the buoyancy coefficient is the Dalton and Stanton number we use. But these are all to improve marine forecasts of wind, waves, and currents. And they talk about that a little bit. 
Um, and then lastly, there is a group working to direct outside of the MIOs if you're helping that are working to, de to uh, deploy their system that can directly measure CO2 exchange, not just bulk, but direct CO2. Now with that, I'd like to end. Let's read over to that. So one of the great things about the original cable array is it has a submarine fiber optic cable that unlimited power basically and bandwidth, which means that all the data for over 150 instruments come streaming in uh, in real time. And we have two-way communication. Um, it spans the seafloor to um, five meters below the air-sea interface. And this is just one example that this is not my world, I'm a geologist, but um, it provides unprecedented full full water column measurements of ocean acidification. You know, most cruises go out maybe once a year and get a few samples. In this case, we have over 45,000 profiles. There's three of these that span blue ocean uh, 300 miles off the coast of coastal environments. And so, and the other thing about this is that, um, here's the, is, oops, sorry. <clears throat> Um, so this is one of the profilers that goes up and down. Um, so it goes up and down nine times a day, three different locations. And one of the great things is it's incredibly multidisciplinary. There's nothing else like it in the world's oceans. Uh, they've been a real workhorse and it's connected. Uh, pH CO2 is connected to 16 other instruments. So it includes biological measurements. So with this platform, you can get a, a really amazing data set on the ecosystem and how it responds to different events. And this is the longest time scale, highest resolution, continuous record in the motions regulations. Uh, the other side, so this is more of uh, what I look at, underwater volcanoes and hot springs. So one of the incredible successes for the regional cable array, this is 300 miles offshore, it's about a mile down. Uh, and there's a this is eye candy here, but there's a whole suite of instruments that are not only core instruments for the OI, but it's been a real hot spot for PI instruments. And I'll hit on that again. So these are externally funded projects. Um, over 70% of the volcanism on Earth occurs underwater. The mid ocean ridge is the longest mountain chain on Earth. It's erupting all the time, but we're never in the right place at the right time to see it. So this long term observatory has captured uh, the very first time live. Uh, underwater eruption it was erupted in 1998, 2011, and then 2015. In 24 hours, there was a major seismic crisis with over 8,000 earthquakes. In 24 hours, the seafloor fell about seven feet. Um, and uh, there's a really interesting microbial story where the during these eruptions, there's huge microbial blooms with billions of microbes streaming from the seafloor. So it's a super exciting um, place to operate. It's also a hotspot for many, many researchers. Uh, because of the array, there's, it's the best imaged underwater volcano in the oceans, uh, and it's really changed. Uh, there was hypothesis terrestrial environments that the volcanoes have stacked magma chambers, these folding tanks of lava, and this is because it's in water, we can image, actually image those. Um, since it was first installed, uh, we've had, um, there's 43 investigators from 23 institutions, and over $21 million in funding that's been uh, supporting this uh, outside of OI that's been supporting this research. Um, I'll touch on it later, but it's also it's approved for a, a drilling program uh, to put quartz observatories in the subsurface to look at the subseafloor biosphere. Um, one of the coolest things I think, again, not, not my world, is um, this is probably one of the most exciting things I've seen for a long time. Uh, it, to me, it's like bringing the first telescope into the ocean. So with these submarine fiber optic cables, to hook up a system in the shore station, it, it sends uh, light pulses basically, and it interrogates the fiber. And basically, the, the way that the fiber behaves during that can pick up a real time monitoring of earthquakes, volcanoes, internal waves. And the cool thing about this is that um, it ex extends so far right now over 100 kilometers offshore, and about every meter to 10 meters is basically a sensor. They're using this on land, they're using it to look at glaciers, but this was the first community experiment in the oceans. Um, and it was phenomenal. And one of the great things I saw, um, this is from William Wilcock. We, they, right, currently you do it when the cable is turned off. Um, we had a maintenance period. And they measured over ten, tens of thousands of whale calls in just four days. When we talk about big data, this is big data. It's terabytes of data per day. Um, and now there's new systems that are coming on so you don't have to turn the cable off. You can do it power live. So this is a great opportunity, I think, to look in our future.
I'm hand it over to Ed. Sure. <clears throat> One of the main uh, reasons we have observatory science and the Ocean Observatory Initiative is to look at uh, uh, long term changes and in things, including uh, uh, effects of uh, ocean acidification, hypoxia, wave climate changes, et cetera, in the, uh, in the coastal and in, in the deep ocean. And uh, the OOI endurance arrays is one example of observatory science. We just look at some of these things. And in particular, uh, recently, you know, there's been a lot of interest in green carbon dioxide removal, wave energy, offshore wind energy. There's interest in using long term observations uh, for uh, background environmental information on these uh -huh. purposes. Um, I think one of the more important things that observatory science gives to the community is the validation extrapolation of in situ measurements. And uh, time series measurements are quite expensive. And in particular, when you're starting to take a lot of different uh, multidisciplinary measurements the way the Ocean Observatory Commission does, uh, it, it's something that can't be replicated every place. And one of the, one of the big uh, things that people want to use to replicate or understand and extrapolate of uh, Ocean Observatory's uh, measurements are uh, remote, remote sensing. So this is some, this is some early work done by Hendricks Fibasol right here. And what it shows is uh, in-situ chlorophyll on uh, the horizontal axis and satellite retrievals um, on the uh, on the vertical axis. <laughs> and um, <laughs> what it shows is that the you know uh, if you just look at the, the chlorophyll uh, estimated from satellites, you get much higher uh, estimates off of Washington than you do off of Oregon, and in particular in the near shore. And the uh, the indication here from the comparison with in-situ measurements. Is that the uh, uh, the scattering is actually affecting the satellite retrievals of chlorophyll? It gives us a way of uh, better interpreting those satellite measurements, um, and that's one of the reasons that uh, uh, I think up to four now uh, uh, proposals to the NASA uh, case validation uh, has to use uh, OOI data or or OOI ship time, and then and then similarly, uh, in situ measurements can distinguish between surface phenomena or uh, subsurface phenomena. In particular, we're seeing uh, you know, sort of climate change play out, not as a steady increase in, uh, in temperature or a decrease in uh, oxygen, but in terms of uh, events that happen uh, rapidly and the uh, in-place measurements provided by ocean observatories are one of the, uh, one of the ways to uh, look at um, those measurements in, in real time. And so uh, this is an example, you know, the, the Famous infamous uh, warm blob from uh, the early part of the 20 teens. Um, and just using satellite images, uh, uh, what was seen in 20, uh, in, uh, in 2014, 2015 is a pretty impressive uh, area of warm temperature water. That's That area is replicated in, in other events. But what really distinguishes the blob is its persistence, but also the, the anomalies seen beneath the surface. Uh, Rather than just at the surface, and that's so that's what's shown at the at the bottom slide there. In this case, uh, using um, OI data from uh, profilers at station pop uh, Some of the in, uh, kind of ongoing innovations in, in ocean observing, you know, I think one of the more important things we can start to do now is to is to pull together ocean uh, ocean observ observations from a number of different networks. Uh, the Northeast Pacific is one of the most highly uh, sensed areas in the world, and what's shown here, this is from a uh, 2019 paper by uh, Barth et al. The figure is from Ocean Networks Canada, and it shows the, the number of observations. It's, it's even hard to see at this scale. But there's a large number of observations that span um, from the uh, from the uh, northwest of the United States up into Canada, and include uh, not just uh, OI and Ocean Networks Canada, but centers from uh, government agencies, private, and and now even um, uh, coastal tribes are making uh, measurements off of, off of Oregon. And Washington. So that's these are improving our ability to work across uh, these observing networks, combine data from them, and make the whole greater than some of its parts. Something I think is uh, is, is a worthy goal for the next ten years. Um, other things, you know, uh, on the previous slide we showed uh, the marine heat wave, um, better profiling technologies. I think that's important. Um, in situ and uh, detection and identification of changes. And, and ocean ecosystems. The Ocean Observatories Initiative uh, sensors that we purchased back in 2012, they include measures of ecosystem function, but we have much better sensors now. They can start to look directly at uh, DNA, 
indicators of blooming composition, um, better indicators of ocean productivity, harmful algal blooms, and, uh, et cetera. And then uh, validation of, uh, of observatory data is important, not just for remote sensing, but also for models, including uh, physical models, uh, by the chemical models that the model that uh, Parker and Craig did, uh, this is the live ocean model that's shown on the right hand side there. And if you look carefully, not only is it just temperature and salinity, but there's also oxygen. This model has in it uh, things like aragonite saturation, nitrate, uh, any number of different uh, different parameters that include uh, uh, again measures of ecosystem function. And we can now start to validate those models um, using. Uh, uh, using this data. Um, one of the challenges that, uh, in terms of doing this validation is that uh, modelers have a tough enough job ahead, just ahead of them just making uh, making their models uh, uh, run, and uh, they're not expected to be experts in all the types of sensors. As we start to get into uh, sensors that go beyond things like temperature, salinity, wind, and velocity into more defined chemical sensors, uh, uh, we've heard from the community that that uh, modelers prefer sensors or prefer data sets with quality control data, regular time and space interpolation, and, and embedded metadata, including error bounds. And uh, putting together that kind of that kind of data sets uh, can be a big challenge when you're taking as many different types of measurements as something like OI. Um, one of the things that we do, uh, I, I think, uh, positive impact, broader impact on the community is that uh, because we operate so many different types of sensors, we have some leverage with uh, uh, manufacturers. And so these are some examples of ways that we've improved uh, uh, measurement technologies through, uh, I'm not going to name the specific vendors here, but you can kind of see them on the, uh, as indicated on the uh, uh, the images. Uh, we've improved the uh, vendors uh, dissolved oxygen to low calibration procedures. Um, we have uh, we worked with glider manufacturers to update their firmware to lower power consumption and meet specifications to be developed for, uh, for OOI. Um, and then, uh, especially on the cable array, uh, we have worked with manufacturers to improve ground fault testing for externally powered instruments. We have annual meetings with vendors to coordinate maintenance schedules, discuss product updates, issues, uh, obsolescence, etc. Uh, observatories also foster uh, student research and work develop, uh, workforce development in a number of different ways. I think it's a great plot. It's uh, it's uh, it's uh, uh, work done by uh, Brianna Velasco back in 2020 uh, as part of a virtual RU program that was run by uh, Rutgers University and so the Rutgers Ocean Data Labs. You're probably familiar with it. Many of you are probably familiar with it. Well worth checking out. Uh, in terms of uh, their ability to facilitate use of observatory data uh, for student lessons and for student research. And what, she, what, uh, what uh, Brianna uh, did here, she was working with um, Rachel Avila at Oberlin uh, College. So going outside the bounds of sort of traditional oceanographic institutions, she's looking at uh, air sea, uh, PCO2 off of, uh, off, of, uh, this, off of Washington, or the continental shelf, and you can see here the orange shows the uh, uh, shows the uh, PCO2 in the ocean. The the, uh, the blue is the uh, PCO2 in the air, and you can see here that uh, the upwelling system is a significant um, sink of carbon dioxide in this case at that location. But it, uh, so so again, uh, observatory data in, in competition with other things uh, can really enhance student research. So one of the great things about the OI is enabled is um, a program out of the University of Washington to take undergrads, grad students, or the current folks to see with all, all of our interviews. Our students are usually 45 days. Over uh, the last few years, we've taken, this last decade, we've taken over 200 students to see. Um, some familiar ones, Deb Lixon. So these are a couple just highlights of Deb Lixon, who was a vision student, is now director of our science and resources, National Academies, Raymond Phillip, uh, He's worked with us for a couple of years as an undergrad, uh, went out on numerous vision cruises. He's director, director for deputy director for water infrastructure in the White House. And we just, just got a new NSF postdoc. So really forms a foundation for uh, workforce development in many different areas. Um, and the students go out and work in engineering. There's no requirements for the students. Typically they'll go for two weeks to 45 days of key. Um, and many of them have gone on to work for industry, um, biotech firms, geotechnical firms, academics, Coast Guard. So 
really we're bringing up a lot of students say this is fundamentally changing lives. So um, I, I'm really happy and humbled that we get to do that with all this stuff. So, um, so um, we have, we, there was a question about uh, our, our impact or our measurements in life. Um, and this is a, nearly a decade of ocean observations through the observatory. This is just one example. Um, if you could hear that, you would hear that it's uh, whale calls. Um, it's a microphone data. So um, we can track mammals off It turns out that fin whales' vocalizations have changed over the last decade. I'm quite sure why. Um, the best hypothesis I like is uh, with the embargo on whaling, they don't have to yell as loud to hear their friends. <laughs> Um, and then I mentioned DASH already. One of the newer instruments we have, um, which is also really exciting. So the EK sonar, EK60 sonar, it's a sonar that images uh, organisms in the upper water column. But in this case, uh, this is a great example during an eclipse where the zooplankton, uh, they go to the surface at night so they don't get eaten. And then during the daytime, they go down. And so they, they were thinking during the eclipse that they're trying to come back up again. And we just refreshed this. Um, there's a question about fisheries. This EK80 sonar, uh, it has two different kinds of functions. And one of the functions, a broadband function, enables it to actually quantify fish uh, in the upper water column now. So that's a really exciting technical um, look. Um, so we also have a, a, a variety of cameras uh, in near shore. Uh, deep and then clear off with access seamount. Um, access seamount, uh, we have a dedicated fiber for that. This streams video of the hydrothermal vents looking at the vent communities, how they change over time. It's really the only place in the world. Uh, Neptune Canada has one also um, that looks at the biology, how the chimneys evolve over time. Uh, and there's it's a great outreach. There's lots of students that are working on that vent imagery. So we get to quantify the temporal spatial changes in vent environments. Uh, we also have a really unique instrument, um, I think, uh, except for the EPS sampler um, by Ambari. This is one of the few samplers in the world that we actually have a, a tube that goes into a hydrothermal vent. There's a lot of interest in viruses, uh, the deep biosphere, how the microbes in the oceans evolve over time, especially when there's volcanic events or earthquakes. And so this is an in-situ sampler that measures, that samples the fluid, temperature, and the chemistry. So you look at you can look at the change in microbial communities over time, and it's a the NSF awarded uh, Rika Anderson an early career award, and she's been out there she'll be out there for four years looking at the samples and looking at viruses. So these these time series really provide a, a one of a kind time series of microbial and viral viral metagenomics uh, over or multiple years. Okay, so in in order to deliver all of this data, we have to have a world-class cyber infrastructure um, system. And we have just that at Oregon State University at their data center. Um, it really is, keep in mind that the data, all the data that we're collecting is freely available to anyone, as long as you have an internet connection. It's democratization of the data, is what we're trying to do here. Um, the center itself is, is focusing on low risk, but cost-effective ways of, um, that allow us to do things like improve compute power for things like Jupyter notebooks. Um, it's what they're working on. Modernizing the storage um, facilities, both in Corvallis, but also in Bend for additional safety, um, where they're real big on cybersecurity in our data center. Um, so you can see that provides a secure data link. They do follow fair and uh, trust principles and we do provide a lot of extra storage. Uh, it's not infinite, but we are expecting the data to be quadruple um, by the end of this program. And so we are planning ahead so that we can accommodate that. Uh, this is just some metrics that we use to show how users are, you know, the type of usage of this data. Um, the first one is, I will, you know, I will say, the OI does not require users to register before they use. That was a decision made a long time ago. And there has been some discussion about that, but that's how it remains right now. Um, so we have to find creative ways of counting people. And one is through Google Analytics, you know, take it with a grain of salt. But this profile shows the accumulated number of distinct users based on IP addresses since the um, Data Explorer system that we developed was uh, christened in 2020. And so there's, you can see it's well over 5,000 users accumulated because these are distinct it's accumulated 
But if you go in 10 times, you get counted once. Okay, that's, that's the deal. So uh, you can see from that curve, lots of users. And of course, publications are our currents. And you can see there on the top uh, right that from starting in uh, from OOI 2.0, which began in 2018 to the present, to OOI, you'll hear 2.5, um, we've had a, a dramatic increase in the number of publications used. The last column, 2023, that's halfway through. We do have a calendar year. So I have a whole nother group of publications that will be adding, and then one more before Christmas. And I'm hoping to beat the record, which was last year. Okay. This one's kind of cool. As, as I don't know if people realize, it's very difficult to get information about funding, especially dollars, right? And so um, you can get it through NSF, but that's not the best search engine I've ever used. So what we've been doing is, is data mining, data mining acknowledgements of all of the publications, OOI publications, to find out if they reference a, a funder. And most people do, we're smart. We want NSF or ONR or DOE to know that we're using their money wisely and here's the publication. And so what you're seeing down here is it's still primarily NSF, as you might expect, but you can see it's a broad, it's a diverse number of funding agencies um, including OR, NASA, NOAA. But interestingly, Europe and the UK are two of our biggest users. I think they're a third of what of uh, the usage is through those, all of the countries in the EU and, and the UK. Well, so, yeah. Does this break apart funding when it's like multiple funders? So like, let's say someone. That's a good question, right? And and please note, this is not money. This is, these are um, no. people that are, Indicating they use the data, and to your question of yes, I will. Is it's it's uh, it's a bit ad hoc how I'm doing it, but if someone uh, says NOAA and NSF, I'll check both. If it's very clear, I'll check. So again, it's because it's counting and it's not money. So that's a good way. So let's keep moving. This and Deb, do you need anything? So, so um, the early on it was um. Iris is basically the geophysical uh, database that everybody puts their seismic data in. So we did that from day one. It's where the geophysicists would go to, to look at the seismic data and store it. Um, and so this is just a, another population of um, really good population of, of people, over 800 unique addresses. Um, and you're looking at the seismic data. They also bring in low frequency hydrophone and some pressure data. Um, and planning is underway to bring these data because they're coming in at real time. Um, there's a shake alert system that's now been uh, installed. And so bring that into early earthquake warning system because uh, we have very poor measurements. We can do it on the continent, but very poor measurements. Not, not as good as measurements in the ocean. And it's really critical for figuring out when a seismic wave is going to hit the upper condition of the ocean. And I should also say that uh, from the Tohoku earthquake, one of the big lessons is that they really needed when that tsunami came in shore, they really needed near shore measurements of pressure. And our system is one of the few systems that has that near shore environment. So we can have coastal warning on this important for tsunamis. Uh, Margaret Lennon in 2006 said, if you build it, we will come, they will come. And one of the great things about the RCA is uh, it was designed and built for looking towards expansion over 30 years. So we have a lot of bandwidth and power for people to add instruments on. Uh, we have over 78 total funded awards, that's PI and sub awards, from lots of different institutions, 38 institutions, over $46 million of outside funding has come in uh, to OOI um, for the RCA in a really diverse portfolio, um, which is something OOI is proud of, NSF, ONR, BOEM, and NASA. Um, and this doesn't count the ship time. So if you figure ship and an ROV is $100,000 a day, it's a big investment outside of OOI. And I'll uh, put this one up. I like this one. Uh, there's there's always been question about ROI and who's who's taking advantage of all this data that's coming in. And there has been a, a tendency for RPIs so or our colleagues to think that it's all going to benefit the MIOs, the UW, OSU, and who, right? Yeah, well, they, they benefit from the data. This is, these are just uh, researchers at those institutions, of course, are going to do research. We're three of the biggest, three of the largest uh, research institutions in the country. So we're going to have some large fraction of the pie. But what this shows, it's not the dominant fraction. It's about a third versus two thirds publications by institutions. So all of the yellow 
is all of a lot of that was all of the other science highlights that we provided are from outside our home institutions. Okay. And the same can be said about the NSF awards. Here it's well, it's actually closer to, to a third there. It's a quarter of publications by institution. So we hope this kind of puts to bed this notion that we're the only ones benefiting. That is not true. Everyone benefits um, from OR. So maybe I can uh, take this. This is uh, so this is the parade for us slide. I have to say we submitted a proposal in 2022 um, to renew the OI for five more years. And we heard about three weeks ago, I would say, that we were provided that award and we are for another five years. We're extremely happy about that. Um, so this funding is sufficient to maintain the race and keep them operational for um, another five years. It does provide, as you know, if we get what we are hoping to get from NSF, we does provide for significant support for increased capacity for the cyber infrastructure. It does provide um, funding for small teams, data teams, for QA, QC activities, and something we're calling data ambassadors, where we will set a team of scientists and data specialists to various places, community colleges, research universities, you name it, to explain how to, what the use of OI data and how to access it. Yeah. So that's something we hope to be able to do. And then you can look at us up here. <laughs> um, we're not getting any younger. We would really like to bring in some younger scientists to, to uh, learn at our knee before we move on. Um, it's, and this would allow us to do that with three associate project scientists Plan for OI two point um, and and I don't know if you want to speak to this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so and uh, this is a, a nice point. I think Deb's made this. The OI team is significant breadth, but little depth. Right? We we do cover a lot of things, but we we have to grab someone who's working on you know biogeochemical sensor quality assurance to go to C and run the CTD which we don't have people dedicated as much as we'd like to things like a data, especially quality control, quality assurance. Um, this would allow to have us these uh, enhanced data team members. We're, the, the OI is getting kind of old. It's a lot of the equipment has been out there for 10 years and you can only refresh instrumentation so much before it just breaks and it's there's no fixing. So we are desperately in need of both tech refreshing and you know, physical infrastructure um, refresh along with cyber infrastructure. And also we have these real exciting new technologies that are coming on, online, like the flow side about which people are really excited about um, uh, the Pioneer Array and that things work out. I'm sure it's going to find its way to the uh, Endurance Array and the not too distant future. So we show these things because we have the question, what if we get level funded? Like we had been level funded for five years at 44 million. Uh, for 2.0, no inflation, no increase to tech. We got it in 2.5. If we, if that doesn't hold, if we don't get the anticipated amount of money, it's going to be very hard to conduct these sorts of things. And something's got to get if, if that happens. So we're hopeful that it's all going to work out just fine because we're really excited about the opportunities that the new um, budget provides. But let's let's keep our fingers. And uh, so, so one of the questions was about the interface of the do that this uh regional table rate team interact with the um seismic subduction zone 4D community initiative. And um we're super excited about this. Uh William Wilcock Wilcock put in a um MSRI proposal. It uh, goes through a lot of a pre proposal, full proposal. We had a, a reverse site visit with NSF. Um and we were he was just awarded uh their PIs are from the UW and uh, Scripps. And this is a $10.6 million uh, award to add on to the infrastructure uh, to look at the seduction zone along the cascading margin. And what you show here is the two cable arrays that come out from Pacific City. The one on the bottom runs out to Axel Seamount, and then there's another one that runs um, out to uh, off to Newport, Oregon. Uh, the, the exciting thing about this, so we do have a small suite of instruments. Um, it's very rare in the world's oceans to have instruments on the subducting plate as well as on the margin. Uh, so it's very hard to look at the coupling between uh, those, those processes that happen uh, uh, when the plate's being subducted. 
On the Cascadian margin, so the last major nine magnitude earthquake was in 1700. Um, gigantic tsunami came ashore. Uh, it's had multiple breaks, and it historically, when a magnitude kind earthquake occurs, it basically unzips the whole subduction zone from Northern California all the way off to Vancouver Island. That plate has been locked for a long time since 1700, meaning that we don't see a lot of earthquakes. The only place, uh, luckily or not, where we do see a lot of earthquakes is right where our array is, and those are those green dots. So the interpretation is this is the one place in the on Cascadia margin that is not blocked. Um, and so the the um, for the 4D community um, is also interested in this. You know the next one. Yeah. Um, this is the infrastructure that we're putting in. Uh, these are one of the nice things about this is the, the some of the instruments were funded by NSF as PI instruments on the to C map with the idea that they would be tested there and then they could be transported to uh, the Cascadia subduction zone. And that has happened. Um, so we have lots of pressure sensors. Uh, we're putting in three new junction boxes. These are small substations on the sea floor. And these uh, are big enough, they have enough um, power and bandwidth that there's ports available for other research scientists. So it's not just for this installation. Uh, it'll be a, about 13 days um, installation in 2026. There's also an educational program, and all these data will flow into the Shake Alert um, and the NOAA Tsunami Warning System. Uh, it involves a, a, the PIs, there will be a science oversight um, um, committee or science advisory committee, and um, this includes uh, involvement with Crescent. There's a meeting going on this week. It's a large $18 million award to OSU for Cascadia Region Earthquake Science Center. Uh, there's members of uh, um, the uh, 4D community actually wrote an endorsement letter for one's proposal, so there's been lots of communication between those. And then there's also a, a large program for looking at the relationships of indigenous people hazards uh, along coastline. Um, uh, there's also a question about uh, the IODP. So there's been a, a long history of IODP drilling. Uh, uh, both on the Juan de Fuca plate um, as well as uh, along the margin there. And there was a series of three proposals that, are, that have gone in. Uh, there's one from ONC or from Canada that goes off of Vancouver Island. There's a full proposal, 947, um, which is to look at uh, the, the boreholes, the core conservatories from the north and the south. And then a particular interest is. Um, uh, and it's, I should say, you know, there's no place in the world that's planned, spanned a one of a tectonic plate right now in terms of looking at uh, cable observatories and putting uh, core observatories. You guys probably heard about these down hole. You make down hole measurements, so biosphere, seismic, uh, lots of different properties. Uh, Williams, um, again, he, there's lots of PIs, so it's not just Williams, obviously. Uh, there's a pre proposal that went in um, to put, uh, you can blow that up. So the idea is that uh, those blue blue circles there are would be drill sites and then cork those and cable them. So again, we would get real time measurements uh, over over years to um, look at the deformation and the hydrogeology uh, along the Cascadia subduction. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you a real quick question. Yeah. 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 When you look at your the NSF stats for your budget, does that include the cost of ship time or is that not included in your budget? So, as of this year, starting with this year, we will no longer get the ship support you know, to our home institution, which just is then a pass through to UNALS. It'll go like every other proposal, NSF to UNALS. So it's not included in OI's budget. So it just, it's about 220 million that is being shared amongst the MIOs. Um, it's about 61 million they removed that's going down the street to ship. So it's not an ROV. And the other quick question, just one for all three of you actually, is if, if you had you know, a couple of minutes with the NSF director, what would you tell them was the most one of your most or the most you know, scientific discovery that you're part of the observatory has made in the last, say, five or 10 years. Who um, wants to study it? Right, so, in my, so, uh, is, is sort of the, the lead PI, I kind of see all of these observing systems. 
I would say, um, and I've seen Al Gluderman give just amazing talks about what the pioneer array um, is, is doing uh, for science along our coast. But I'm, I've been really impressed with the MOUC component and the uh, cooperative uh, nature of the science being conducted with OSNAP. We really do help. We help them. They help us. We have gotten some really nice papers written as a result of that. Um, and so I'll leave it at this. For me, so that's contribution to AMON. It, it's yeah. contribution to AMON, whether it's weak and aiming, et cetera. We, we are making some of the data that will allow them to uh, say definitively what's happening. Yeah. Uh, from the geological sector, I would say Axel Seamount, um, you know, we had during the Ridge program, there was a set of three observatories, but this is the first place, only place in the world, most of where we're getting all the real time data. You look at the biological, geophysical, chemical properties that happen, you know, something that forms the face of our planet. Uh, it's also the only place where, because we have a time series data set on how the volcano deforms, that it's the only place right now where we can forecast when the next eruption is going to take place. So, again, um, and I think that the thing to come out of that is uh, that we get the real time data and it impacts not only the the chemical um, nature of the hydrothermal fluids, but also the biological activity. And that's been, there's no place uh, right now where when a volcano is erupting that we get there fast enough to look at the, some of the major things that happen in terms of heat, chemical, and biological transfer from beneath the seafloor to the water. Yeah. For me, it's the short time scale and space scale variability in, uh, in particular the carbonate system in the ocean. Uh, the rapid changes in pH and CO2 and the associated kind of ecosystem changes that occur. Uh, that's, that's not enough to have uh, you know, uh, bottle measurements a couple of times a year. That, uh, that real time variability is uh, extremely important. Yeah, and could I add as the meteorologist in the room, I'm really proud of the fact that we are improving uh, marine forecasts of wind waves and currents. And the fact that we're directly measuring these fluxes of surface stress and, and heat exchange um, is making that possible. And so, you know, I, I, one of my missions is to bring more meteorology, more atmospheric sciences into the program, and I think we can get them excited about just that. Okay. I want to remind folks in the room to vote for Slido. So we were thinking that to equalize the online and in-person participation that those of you in the room, if you have a question, please put it into Slido. And if Jim chooses to use that question, then you can you can ask it yourself if you're in the room. Uh, but that way we'll have equal representation. Does that make sense? Um, all right, well, we'll start with uh, Brad DeYoung has a question. So yeah, he's in the room. So. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, so my first question is, is the previous DSOS report was fairly critical of the OI and raised a number of key issues and made a kind of negative recommendation about the program as a whole. And so, I mean, I don't want to relive all that experience, but I'm sure that was a joy for time. But the, the, the question really is, you know, how have you responded to that and where does OI, in your view, sit relative to those critical comments? I mean, I, I can speak that it's not as painful for me because I've only been at this for two years, right? A year and a half. Because what I've seen is they've addressed the two main issues, which was difficulty with the, with the uh, physical infrastructure and getting things turned on time and getting sensors, and also the cyber infrastructure. Um, I think we're doing a fantastic job at turning the race. I think we've figured it out. I also think that. Uh, the Cyber Infrastructure Center at OSU uh, is now delivering data. That was the whole point, right? Is to get data out to people, to archive it um, so that we know that we're going to have it for 30 years. Maybe I can talk about this a little bit more. But those two things were kind of key things, things that were not working well, that have been fixed since 2018 when OI 2.0 took over. To the point where, back to the matter is, NSF provided us with the opportunity to renew, not recompete, because we are doing a much better job in their mind. Yeah. I can just chime in on that, um, because when I was at NSF was when the transition occurred. The previous OOI that the previous DSOS was responding to was administered, the main prime was Consortium for Ocean Wave Care. 
And so COL was the prime, these three institutions were the subs. That structure was very difficult and challenging. I don't want to speak for NSF now, but I can speak for NSF then. Very challenging. So it was recompeted to be NSF, to be OLI 2.0 five years ago. And this team won that competition. That was the fundamental, in my opinion, fundamental change facilitated the type of work that these groups uh, are able to do. Okay, um, I'm going to go down the list here, but so too bad follow up to this. Is yeah, um, so you spoke to some of the things that you did fix with 2.0 to really get the data out to the people. Um, you know, it, I'm drawing some parallels here with the IOD3 program that we really took a deep dive into, you know, very, a lot of useful data, but how do you make that handshake for people who can really use it? And so can you speak a little bit to the remaining barriers? Um, and I'll also add to, the, to that question. Um, I was impressed to see that significant uptick in 2018 in publications. Of course, publications lag the data availability a little bit, right? So it's probably coincidence that that's that's right when to point out. In fact, whatever you did probably is right now is going to lead to open publications. So tell me about the remaining barriers, though. Where do you feel like um, NSF could help you or we could help you in um, in the work of getting the data in the hands of the people who really need to utilize it? I'll take the first shot at it. Uh, at it uh, you know, I think, I, I think one of the uh, main barriers is to chemical and biological data, that the sensors used are uh, significantly more sophisticated and have significantly greater issues than sensors that measure physical and geophysical parameters and biological parameters. And so we have a significant amount of expertise in house, but it's a limited number of people. Um, and uh, we are working our way through what we think of as industry standard, which is the, the uh, NOAA developed Quartal, quality assurance of real-time oceanographic data. We're working our way through that, but in many cases, additional uh, quality control is needed to make that data improve the utility of that data. There aren't a lot of observatories that are making you know, a, a lot of time series measurements of the ocean are still for a relatively uh, limited number of variables, um, and so we're 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 the OI has a, a larger number of types of different variables. And many other different types of observatories. Uh, uh, Probably the closest analog might be the Biogic and the Argos. I think we can we can learn from Biogic and Argos. Um, but we are active participants in uh, ocean best practices. So so we're engaging with, with the community. Um, some of the things that I think can be done uh, include you know facilitating subject matter experts to use and improve observatory data is something that we've done as well because with the with the staff we have uh, and with the data numbers that we're able to hire it's it's never going to be i think one of the other things is um maybe a generational thing where you know we have such a fire hose of data one hertz data or higher um imagine that with 18 instruments all at once and so i think that some of the biggest breakthroughs we're going to um, require new eyes on how do you visualize those in a 20, 30 year time series uh, that are changing over, you know, very short to long time scales. And so um, we've had to move, uh, one of the stumbling blocks is the data sets are so large now, we've had to move our QHC onto the cloud because just to visualize the data alone to do the QHC um, requires that we need to move it onto the cloud. And so um, I think the younger folks, right, they, they don't mind they Excel, they don't use Excel, right? They use um, you know, Jupyter notebooks or Python. So they're getting very adroit, they're super excited about it. But I think there's a generation that doesn't quite know that that technology yet. Um, and so I think one of the powerful things that will come online is AI. And I think we'll also need that for QA A couple people um, a couple people have asked about the relationship between the um, uh, OOI and IUS, if, if there is such a relationship, how does that work out? You did a lot of work. Yeah, so so I think um, there, initially there was at the start of OOI, there was a statement made by NSF that the OOI was 
NSF's contribution to ice. And I think they later walked that back. But having said that, we are um, uh, we are we are partners with um, uh, with ice in many cases. The regional arrays are partners with with their region, regional counterparts. The regional OI arrays are uh, their regional counterparts. Um, uh, we attend a lot of the same meetings. Uh, our data can be, because our data is freely available, it can be picked up and reused in these systems and, and is reused in these systems. Uh, and uh, we also, uh, again, kind of uh, thinking about a broader collaboration with NOAA, uh, OI meteorological data uh, go into NEBC, and that enhances the use of that data by, uh, by researchers as well as provides that data. Uh, to the full telecommunication system, GPS, which, uh, which despite its kind of uh, strange acronym or strange name, is the kind of operational way that oceanographic and neurological data is delivered for uh, model forecasting. So that is getting used as a weather studies religion as well. Um, and, I, and I do want to mention that the Ocean Sites group, um, we were also starting to engage again with, with the ocean science. I, I had a chuckle when this was asked. I remember back in the early 2000s, I had many arguments with Bill Briscoe about this relationship, the difference between NSF operational agencies. Uh, <laughs> NSF has taken pains to tell us we are not an operational right. system. Yeah. But nonetheless, when, when we are operating, we make that data available to operate. Yeah. Right. We're also asked to share the data. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So, um, I, I didn't remember those early projects on the way, but I, I'm also interested in how OOI, Argos, uh, IUS, and other observing entities, how do we get a comprehensive look at what's being measured, what's not being measured? I think we look at the program by program, but not in like a comprehensive, like not a great visual from Ocean Canada that kind of went down the West Coast. But it would be interesting to know what's missing. What are what are those key um, signal areas that we should be looking at? And, uh, I think that's something we should be thinking about is leveraging all the data. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of examples now. There are things like glider dock where it's a way to bring all those people that are running the gliders and on both the coasts into a, a central system. We are definitely talking more and more with, like I just mentioned, with ocean sites uh, and, and Argo. Um, how do we bring these together? Is it is it just going to be a, a web page where we have linked to all our stuff? That would be a start, right? But that's the uh, type of conversation I feel we're having now. We are bringing that conversation actually to the COP28 meeting. Um, we, we are organizing a, um, a session. It's actually, uh, it's not, it's called a side event, even though it has like 200 people are invited to these side events. And it's being uh, co-run by OY Hui and POGO, which is um, the Plymouth Marine Laboratories facility with Goose. So we're bringing the community together. It's, you know, it's, it's a start and it's, you know, likely we are sharing data directly with NDC. Whether we can do that on a you know larger scale, we'll we'll work on it. I think I think we would all like to see that happen. Uh, yeah, we're running out of time. But I think Regine, you had a question about uh, ocean data simulation. Right. Uh, I was curious to know if um, you have any examples of modelers who are actually assimilating data real time to do weather ocean weather. Uh, so glider data do go to the glider data assembly center and glider back. And so that data is incorporated, I think, in data assimilating models. Um, the, the person that I think of uh, most, it's most closely associated with data assimilation. I'm not sure whether he's now using OI data in an assimilative way or whether he's still using it as primarily as validation. Is Alexander Korpov, who's associated with the West Coast. I, I guess just as a, a intent, uh, the intentionality behind that question is trying to see what might be hurdles. 
for assimilating data. And if the people that I've talked to, including uh, Chris Edwards and other folks that assimilate data, they've pointed out over and over again that the, from their perspective, the, the barriers are um, uh, knowing the, uh, uh, getting a, getting a uh, uh, data set that's interpolated on a relatively even basis, but also knowing the error bounds. And, and in some cases, it's not a matter of knowing the exact sensor accuracy, because we, we have specifications on that. But really, in the end, what's the in situ uh, error bounds of the of the data delivered as a whole? And that and that's a bigger question than the specific accuracy set, uh, of big sensor by sensor. So there was a at the Ocean Observatory's initial facility board. There was a lot of discussion of yeah. models there, and they are are um, a very strong. Uh, opinions um, that they would like us to basically give them curated data sets. So completely, you know, take CO2, take all the flyers out and have it in a specific format that they can just plug it into their models. And that was a, a I think it will come out as a strong uh, recommendation. <laughs> it's been something that we've shied away from to some extent, just because of the enormity of the task. But there's also a place where uh, quality control starts to shade into uh, scientific interpretation about what's good and what's bad. What might be good for one purpose is not necessarily good for another. In many cases, I think data that the model modelers may want to use could have looser error bounds on it than, than people that are interested in very finally looking at you know long-term trends of things. In okay. the evolution of 1.0, 2.0, early on, we were told, we do. We want you to give us the raw data. We don't. We don't want. We want to work on the data ourselves. Right? So, okay. I think we got to move on. Um. So our next panel is made up of um a bunch of physical oceanographers. Um. We have one of them here today with us in person, Melanie Pewing. And is my am I correct in that the remaining four are online? Um. Yeah. Hello, hello. Um, I'm now using a microphone for those of you who are on Zoom. Maybe this might improve your sound experience. Um, okay, I'm having some uh, echo here. Uh, Melanie, can we invite you to be up front with us? Um, would you like company? Shall I sit with you or are you okay? <laughs> Um, and uh, do we have our other speakers online? Luann Thompson, Craig Lee, Jack Barth, Joe Schumacher. What do you say, Zoe? Are they all with us? Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, so this really, uh, this panel is about challenges and opportunities in physical oceanography. And part of the reason why we wanted to hear specifically from physical oceanographers, well, one is there happen to be a lot of high quality physical oceanographers in the Pacific Northwest. So we wanted to take advantage of the fact that the meeting was taking place here. But also at some point, you know, we did hear that perhaps we didn't have a, a lot of physical oceanographers on our committee. Um, some of us feel like we know a lot about physical oceanography, but may not be card carrying physical oceanographers. Um, but I'm I'm inspired to to hear more here from these colleagues, especially because just yesterday um, afternoon we celebrated one of the great coastal physical oceanographers, John Allen, who recently passed away. Um, and it was really great to kind of reflect on the approach that somebody like John Allen would take on combining observations models and really getting a, a deep sense of um, uh, processes. So really approaching it from both a numerical modeling, theoretical and observational perspective. So, um, and I think this panel today will be able to give us that multi-pronged view of the field as well. Okay, uh, with that, I'll pass it on to Luann. I think you are first, is that correct? Yep, I'm up. I assume you can hear me at this point. Very well, take it away. Okay, so um, I am going to talk about dynamics, modeling, and climate. I am going to give kind of a large scale perspective on this. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Can you go to the next slide, please? 
So um, first of all, I wanted to say that, um, which I'm sure you guys have already talked about, that sustained observations are needed to detect and validate models. So things like satellite, sea surface height, sea surface salinity, sea, sur sea surface temperature, et cetera. And of course, Argo, the temperature and salinity profiles. And then as we get towards longer timescales, the repeat hydrography program, as well as deep Argo. So go ahead to the next slide. So I wanted to sort of set the context for why we need extra effort in this area and to remind you that the climate model intercomparison projects that are models that are used for climate protections and uh, projections and the IPCC have about a uh, hundred kilometer grid. And we know that that misses an awful lot of the dynamics in the ocean. And in particular, I chose this figure because it shows the really large biases in sea surface temperature in eastern boundary upwelling systems where up to 40% of global fish catch happens. So when we think about um, climate models and what's done in the IPCC, it's really missing and has an error a lot of the important regions of our ocean for people in the planet. Go ahead to the next slide. So I, I think the challenge for ocean modeling um, compared to the atmosphere is that the ocean scales are small and the motions are slow. So this is just a snapshot, a sea surface temperature um, from August 12, 2023. And you can see um, eddies, uh, lots of, lots of um, small scale variability as well as large scale imprint of um, climate. So can we increase the spatial resolution, particularly to the sort of climate projection class of models from 100 kilometers to say 10 kilometers, where we're starting to resolve eddies? It creates 100 times the amount of data and the time step has to be smaller by a factor of 10. And that makes those models about a thousand times slower per model day. And we have to recognize that the ocean takes cent centuries to spin up and that we need multiple simulations for climate projections and for climate predictions. <clears throat> In addition, this is big data, really, really big data. We're talking of petabytes of data. So the analysis needs to happen where the data resides. This is not something where you're gonna download the data and analyze it on a local computer because we're talking about petabytes of data. In addition, regional downscaling um, for projections can also be used, but those regional downscalings will inherit global model biases. The next slide, please. Okay, so those are sort of the big, big issues, I think, for the future for both climate projections and for climate um, predictions. But I wanted to bring up another issue that I've been thinking a lot about lately, the workforce issues in ocean dynamics and modeling. There's been a brain drain to industry that's pretty astounding. Five scientists from the ocean section at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. So these are the people that are creating the um, ocean models that are sort of the community models for global climate um, prediction kinds of things. And one professor from Columbia University that are now working in industry and no longer working on ocean modeling and dynamics. The other thing that I've noticed recently that there's actually been little progress and maybe even backsliding in gender parity in ocean modeling and di dynamics. So here's a few examples. <clears throat> even before this brain drain, there were zero women on the tenure track equivalent in the ocean section at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Um, there are two women out of 12 in the federal workforce at NOAA GFDL, could you go back please? Um, the Ocean and Cryosphere Division. And um, recently I went to a workshop and an invitation only and only 25% of them participants were women and it was on dynamic sub mesoscale air sea interaction workshop. Okay, next slide. If I have it, if I have time. So I wanted to also put in the wild cards for thinking about um, physical ocean or physical oceanography as we go into the future, the rise in offshore wind and wave energy, and thinking about what are the modeling prediction and workforce needs within that. 
And then also preparing for rapid sea level rise, Greenland and Arctic ice sheet melt caused by potentially regional ocean warming. And um, what is our role as physical oceanography as we look towards the future? Okay, I'm done. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Luann. Um, I think Craig Lee from the University of Washington is next. Great, thank you. I'll uh, uh, share my screen here. Can you guys see that? Oh, looking great. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, so what I'd like to do today is just touch on four subjects uh, briefly and then open up for discussion once we've all gone. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about the need for sustained climate scale observing, uh, coupled with that access to challenging environments. To me, uh, Big part of the challenge in physical oceanography right now is it's not physical oceanography as a distinct and unto itself, but doing science at the interfaces between disciplines and, and areas, and then also sustaining expertise. And I'll, I'll expand on what I mean by that going forward here. Um, okay, there we go. So first, the, uh, the need for climate scale observing, you know, really sustained uh, large scale distributed observing through the, uh, through the global ocean. And I'll, I'll, I'll use a lot of Arctic examples here because it's something I've been thinking a lot about. But th th this is, these are figures from one of Alexander Jan's papers. And here she's talking about um, climate trends, right? And, and Arctic freshwater balances, in particular, the, the exports at the gateways and the storage terms runoff from the rivers, precipitation, um, the different components of that climate system. And you see elements of that balance in the in the middle panel there. And then the, the more interesting part of this is if you look at the right, she's looking at a, a long-term record from uh, CCSM models. And in particular, looking at what she calls shift being the first year that we see a, a change in these fluxes or, or storage terms that's outside of a three and a half standard deviation range from the uh, 1800 year pre-industrial control run, a mean and emergence that the year that uh, the trend remains outside of that, that range. And the, the reason why I've got that here is right, if, if we want to start seeing things like this, we want to see other small scale tra climate trends, if we want to begin to understand some of the long time scale dynamics behind them, um, we really need to be looking at these time scales, and these are processes that unfold over these large space and long time scales. So the the effort itself is different from the idea of monitoring an efficient expedition or a build that may will come uh, kind of situation, right? There, there are real reasons for doing this, but the the duration that we're talking about exceeds the span of individual careers. We don't really have the kind of funding models we need, right? We we need to develop funding models that will facilitate these things. And culturally, we need to learn how to recognize and reward researchers for, for actually making these contributions. Like these are, are tough problems that go well beyond the technologies and approaches, et cetera, that we, we really think about and how we execute them. So that's one of the challenges I see going forward for physical oceanography. Coupled with that is access to really difficult to get to environments. Um, two examples, again, taken from high latitudes. On the left, you see a, a figure that shows you the, the Arctic basin, right? Arctic Ocean, and all the ice tethered profiler measurements have been made from 2004 to 2016. Um, yeah, the ice tethered profiler has been termed Argo of the Arctic. It's an ice space instrument that extends down through the ice and, and profiles over the upper 800 meters or so. That looks like really good coverage until you start to look at what it means on a you know month by month basis, right? That's many years of, of profiles. But on the right hand side, you see a comparison between a month of profiling. The month happens to be January first, two thousand thirteen, but it could be any month really, relative to the Arabian Sea and Argo profiling in the Arabian Sea, which is a sparsely profiled area for Argo. Um, and when you look at the coverage there, it, it doesn't look so good for the Arctic, right? It's a, a few select measurements um, made in, in particular places where those instruments are drifting. We just don't have the ability to make those distributed measurements in the, these remote environments right now, although we're working towards it. And the right, you see an example of a, an ice shelf mission 
uh, gladrins of float used to sample underneath the dots and ice shelf for an annual cycle. But these are, again, uh, ridiculously difficult places to sample despite their importance uh, in, in beating down uncertainties and predictions of global sea level rise, right? This is the, the biggest term driving that, that uncertainty. To get there, we need to have a, a tolerance for, for high, high risk investments, right? We need to be willing to take those risks and willing to, to tolerate failures and losses on the way there. Um, really kind of long-term investments in, in different technologies and approaches. So the other challenge I see for physical oceanography, right? We, we've in the past had big questions like, like finding the missing ocean mixing and understanding what's happening. And today, I think a lot of those questions uh, exist at the interfaces between disciplines and areas. And when I say that, I mean things like the the role of physics in modulating production and export of carbon, or the interaction between atmosphere, sea ice, and ocean, or the atmosphere-ocean interactions that, that govern the monsoons. And I, I've just thrown up here a, a couple of examples from, from something that Mary Jane Perry, Eric Tessaro, uh, and a bunch of us did a number of years ago, making autonomous measurements of the North Atlantic bloom, which wasn't a new problem, right? People have worked on that quite a good deal before we did it. It's one of the reasons why we chose it. But the, the coupling of the physics and the biology, chemistry and the biology, and the ability to be out there for a long time led us to some new insights. And on the left, you see the, the idea that the, the, the slumping of horizontal gradients modulates the, the timing of the, the bloom because it modulates when stratification occurs beyond what just simple solar warming does. On the right, you see an actual quantification of subduction of POC um, along an eddy, right? eddy-driven subduction of, of POC, which is it was hard to, to observe and hard to get at, but with a, a larger team, we were able to do that. So I see uh, there are challenges, right? Being able to communicate and work across disciplines, uh, being familiar with what other people are doing and adapting existing approaches and, and technologies to, to these tasks. But I see that as one of the the real areas where we can make progress in physical oceanography. And lastly, the um, thing I'd like to touch on is the, the need to really sustain technological and operational expertise. And, and here, I, I don't mean uh, PIs, like, like those of us who are giving these talks today, but I mean are the technologists and engineers, software engineers, developers who, who sit as part of these teams of equal importance to to the science piece, right? But who are uh, a little more vulnerable to, to fluctuations in funding and, and other things that happen within the community. And what I've got plotted here is just the, the glider development timeline because it's something I've been involved in for a very long time. Uh, basically 20 years between the start of development and production use in OOI in 2014 or so, right? So that's a very long arc you see. On the right-hand side, you see a list of 45 people, and that's probably not everybody, who are involved in the development of the three production-level gliders within the community today. So long development arc to produce instruments and then bring them into production. The arcs are not linear, right? A lot of the things that happen are side projects or things that people think are going to be important down the line, and so they work on it on the side over the course of several years. And then it intersects with an area where, where the development really benefits from it. There are these uh, ideas that we should be commercializing things and, and sending this to industry. But in reality, our experience has been that the, the scale and the demand for the instruments that we're talking about really limit commercial viability. And so it, it limits commercial uptake and commercial interest in, in producing these things. There are some exceptions, right? And we, we can point to those. But, but in general, that's a, a tough thing to do. What isn't uh, in debate, I think, is that in order to make progress here, it's required really consistent long-term engagement by, uh, by really highly skilled technologists, engineers, software developers, right? That, that's what has given us the, the progress in instrumentation and approaches, you know, ability to do these, these very involved intricate field programs over, over the past few decades. So the question I pose to the group is, is how do, we, how do we nurture, support, and reward these individuals within our community? 
I think it's 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 rather unstable at this time and, and a difficult thing to navigate. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Craig. Thank you both, Luann and Craig. I feel like I'm already seeing some parallels here with what you're talking about. Also with the OI session, right? There's a lot of talk about interactions with physics and biogeochemistry. So physical oceanography is no longer practiced in isolation. You both have talked about challenges in the modeling, you know, how much big data we're producing, how we have to do the uh, the processing on the server where the data sets also challenging environments like the Arctic, you know, we're really daring into those places. Valuing work that we know is important that does not get valued by our current evaluation system. I think that's really important. I'd love to talk about that more. And then the workforce issues, the brain drain, the diversity, the technical staff. Um, so thank, thank you for those thoughts. Um, and we'll move on to Melanie. Melanie is here in person and I'm gonna hand you this microphone so folks online can hear you well. Thank you. Uh, my name is Melanie Fewings. I'm an associate professor at Oregon State University. Um, and in this green box in the lower left are a couple of the main issues I would like to touch on. One um, has been touched on in all the previous presentations, which is our need for long time series to understand our changing climate. Um, and I want to talk about a solution that we've implemented in my lab, but also other other places are doing this historical data rescue. Um, and then I want to talk about a problem, which is what my postdoc advisor, Lai Washburn, said, we have chronic data accumulation. We've talked a lot about how we don't have enough data to answer the questions we want to answer, but we also have these workforce issues. We already have way more data than we are able to get what we could be getting out of it. Um, so it's already more than we can analyze. And at the end, I'm going to float an idea, LTORs, and I'll say what that is if you haven't already guessed. So to understand our changing climate, we need long time series, decades long. Oh yeah, I'm not controlling those slides, thank you. Uh, so you know, we want to identify long-term trends. We want to be able to calculate anomalies and know in a robust statistical sense what those anomalies are, which means we need to have statistically robust climatologies, which means we need decades of data. And we need that to um, know what the typical conditions are and how those are changing in order to identify extreme events against those backgrounds. So for example, marine heat waves, including El Nino's, um, thanks. Um, Subarctic invasions are a thing that we see in the, uh, in the Northern California current system when we get unusual inputs from the North, uh, kind of the opposite of El Nino. Um, severe droughts and their impacts on the ocean and land um, and so on. And we've heard other examples in the previous presentations. And I've already kind of made the second point. Um, we need robust climatologies to identify these anomalies. But we know that most geophysical spectra are red, meaning that there's more and more energy as you go to longer time scales. So really no time series is ever long enough, right? But a community standard that NOAA and others have adopted is a convention that you should use 30 years of data for a climatology. And we know how rare it is to have 30 years of data for subsurface ocean measurements. Um, and like Craig mentioned, that's much greater than the length of a single typical project. And so NSF is presently supporting um, collecting time series that approach this length through, for example, the Long-Term Ecological Research Network and the Ocean Observatories Initiative and other initiatives. But we don't have to just wait to build up 30-year long time series at new sites. We can rescue historical observations that help us fill in the past. And I've listed three examples there that we're working on in my lab, which I can talk more about if you want. Um, another one is Stefan Talka's research, um, archiving, uh, digitizing historical tide gauge data back to the 1800s, really valuable for understanding how things used to work around our coastlines and you know, for our need to understand upcoming sea level rise um, and the effects of dredging on harbors and so on. Um, and so these historical oceanographic data sets, including things like ADCP data collected on continental shelves or in the deep ocean by individual PIs, 
that are retiring and passing away. These are national treasures that are being lost. Next slide, please. So recommendations. And so the first point, um, I want to touch on something more about this issue of what is known in some communities as climate data records. Um, there are areas where Argo floats don't go and time scales that Argo floats don't sample, right? So if you want to know global ocean mixed layer depth on daily or sub-daily time resolution, we would need so many Argo floats that we'd trip over them every time we went to sea, right? Um, and Argo floats don't go on continental shelves and continental slopes and the spatial scales of variability that are important there are much smaller in the open ocean. So could we imagine something like a coastal Argo program? And back to the historical data set rescue. Uh, it's my understanding that USGS has or had an office for historical data rescue. They actually had a, an employee whose job it was to fly around the country, this was before COVID, in interviewing scientists who were retired, digitizing their handwritten data sets, archiving those at the USGS. Could the NSF support something like that for data that has been funded by NSF in the past and are in danger of being lost because those projects have ended? And also just in general with data archiving, I think that um, if there were more support to help PIs archive the data and get that done in a consistent way, it would be more likely to happen. And this paradox that I already mentioned, we have both not enough data and more data than we can handle. I, I think that, you know, with all these data sets we've been hearing about with OOI um, and other efforts, we could be getting a lot more scientific results from the data we already have if just as one idea, there were more grad student and postdoc fellowships funded to work with those existing data. Um, and back to the LTOR idea, um, long-term oceanographic research sites, similar to the NSF's long-term ecological research sites. How is this different from OOI? And I, I don't know, is this like something that would be alongside OOI or would be different locations? This is just the, what I, the important thing that I wanted to bring up for discussion is these would be hypothesis driven and they would also involve funding for the analysis because the way the OOI works right now, there has been purposefully a kind of a barrier built between the people who are collecting the data and the people who are allowed to hire grad students and postdocs. You can't do it with the same money, right? And so I think that um, there's a barrier there that is slowing down the science because the people who are the most expert in collecting the data are fully occupied with collecting those data and not allowed to fund grad students and postdocs on the same grant, if I understand things correctly. So is there some kind of structural tweak that could be made by looking at how LTERs work that would enable us to get more science out of the OOI data faster? This is me as a kind of semi-external observer because I don't, I'm at OSU, but I don't work for the OOI and I'm not funded by it. Um, and on the data ambassadors question, I also think we need something more like data helpers. I understand Ocean Networks Canada has something like this, especially for the interdisciplinary work. I work a lot with ecologists um, and fisheries people, um, NOAA and, and so I work a lot in that space between physical oceanography and marine ecology, biological oceanography. And um, that it, it takes time and work and communication and explanation from both sides. There are lots of people who wanna be using OOI data, but it's like a level up from the volume of data they've worked with before. And so if there's someone who can help make a figure for a proposal and kind of get the effort launched, that kind of thing is what I'm thinking of. And uh, I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you, Melanie. Um, so I wanna move on to uh, Jack Barth and Joe Schumacher who are online um, with us, but thank you, Melanie, for that. I think um, it, one thing you point out yet again is this whole mismatch between what we should be doing to move the science, like archiving our data, and what in a tenure track world were rewarded for 
which is not that, right? So we can keep thinking and talking about that. Okay, Jack, take it away. All right, just Tuba, just checking you can hear me all right? Yep. Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm Jack Barth, and I'm a oceanographer at Oregon State University, and I'm just going to tell you about a particular journey um, working with Joe Schumacher and uh, the Quinault Indian Nation just off the coast here, off the Washington coast. Um, as usual, to do any of these things takes lots of people. Um, Craig touched on that, the excellent technicians and folks that we really rely on and keep funded through our research. Uh, lots of partners here at the bottom, including the IUS Integrated Ocean Observing System elements we talked about, um, basic NOAA funding with sometimes in relation to the fisheries folks. But this all really started out with an NSF um, single PI proposal about 20 years ago. And we got involved with um, flying underwater gliders kind of a third of the way through that timeline that Craig Lee was showing. So we're going to talk a little bit about low oxygen. And I'll just say right off the bat that um, we've kind of moved a lot past that into the multi-stressors world. So I'm going to be talking about oxygen, but obviously the same water has low pH. Um, it's got lots of warming and, of course, harmful algal blooms. So next slide, please. So we're, uh, I'm glad Luann pointed out that Eastern boundary current issue. They're really exciting places because of this, both the um, closeness of the so-called oxygen minimum zones onto the, co the continental shelf, but then this very active upwelling driven by the winds, which of course are in turn subject to climate change. So the, the setting here is we're going to upwell from the very top of that OMZ, put, put the water up on the shelf. The nutrients are going to cause things to bloom. That material falls to the bottom and undergoes respiration. So you've got this recipe for low oxygen. Well, you know, we really didn't see that that much in the California current until about uh, the last decade and a half. And it's really because the balance of the physics and the biology and chemistry is changing. And we really didn't think that that low DO would come right to shore where you could uh, almost hit a hit a baseball out into the waters that are low oxygen. And the communities really care about this. So let's go to the next slide. So as Joe will explain more, uh, we've got a number of um, Native American tribes along the Pacific Northwest coasts, their livelihoods and their culture are oriented around the ocean. They're seeing changes. Uh, they worked with us to think about how we might do a better job measuring those with the tools we had and communicating those. So really the question is that they need to know where, when, how much uh, these events are affecting their uh, coastal waters. Next, please. So I don't need to dwell too much on this. This is just the, the Slocum underwater glider. It's equipped with physics as well as uh, lots of bio-optical uh, and chemical sensors. And uh, I'll just throw something out here right away is uh, what I've learned is that we don't really need ships to do CTDs anymore, right? We've got these gliders, we can uh, measure a 3D or a 4D volume and have ships doing much of the, the experimental work that we really need. But the, the basic background view beneath the, the sea surface, these guys can do it. So next, please. So here's just a random section from uh, almost 20 years ago when we were first getting started. Uh, I've just colored along the track of the glider, up, down, up, down, starting at Newport, Oregon on the right-hand side and going out into the deep ocean with temperature, salinity, chlorophyll, and light backscatter from top to bottom. There's probably 300 profiles across this. And for comparison along the top side, there's uh, looks like about eight or 10 dark ticks that where the traditional ship-based measurements were made. 
But all of a sudden, you've got this amazing view under the ocean, multi-parameter. Uh, you can see the linkages between the, the upwelling front and the subduction of plankton down along it. You can see the difference between the, the live and the dead down in the light backscatter, the, the living material on the top, the, the uh, settled material on the bottom that's undergoing respiration. So let's go one more. So what we've been doing uh, up, up off Washington with the Quinault is flying these gliders in patterns that map the uh, the low oxygen low oxygen zone. You know, I would having been a coastal oceanographer for thirty years now, you'd think that we could say, well, on the seafloor, here's what's happening, and and this is why. But we really still don't have that ability to dive down, get those measurements. Uh, come back and report maps like that. And, you know, we should be farther along on that. So this is just an example from the NANU site, the Northwest Association of Networked Ocean Observing Systems, the Pacific Northwest Integrated Ocean Observing System. Uh, and we just look at a line like that along the, the glider track. So next, please. Oh, and I should I should say, these are amazing things for doing community development for next generation. Uh, we really ought to be doing more with that. Next. Okay, so this is just a, a typical example comes out in near real time, is available on the web and can guide decisions. So on the right hand side is that low oxygen zone right near the bottom. We can see it's nearly half the water column, which is pretty amazing. This is in September at the end of the, the upwelling season. And then the trick is, is uh, how long does it stay there? How close does it get to shore? But what I want to point out from a physical oceanography point of view is uh, we get to see all those structures that uh, my uh, dear colleague, John Allen, and others studied for 30, 40, 50 years, and that is the coastal upwelling fronts, the alongshore propagation of signals. You can even see the internal tide, those waves at the bottom of the uh, the oxycline there that we see in that image. So next one. And this will kind of tee up Joe for some discussion about the interacting with the uh, with the tribes on the coast. But as I said, students love this technology, right? So uh, showing some of the Quinault youth about what we do in the ocean. I mean, it's really cool what we do. And it's not just an entry point for a, for a physical oceanographer like myself. There's the, the technicians and the, and the machinists and the field folks that Craig talked about. So just absolute fascination in this. And we ought to be doing as much as we can to, to pull pe people into that. Next, please. So my takeaways are, you know, physical oceanography shapes the marine ecosystem. We actually have the tools to look at these important ecosystem stressors. And then, of course, every time we look closer, we learn more. The, the submesoscale uh, we've known about in the coastal ocean, but uh, big studies now by NASA and NSF to look at that on the, on the larger scales. The boundary layers, both top, bottom, and sides, continue to be super important. And we can do lots of these things from uh, a single platform. I'm actually doing active multi-frequency acoustics from gliders now, so we can get some sense of up into the food web for fish and zooplankton. I'll just pile on to the uh, subsurface data still lacking, and we do need those data heroes and ambassadors to make the yes, best use of that data. And this Example of co-design co-production is just teeing you up for your session later in the day. And, and then I'll hand off to Joe. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Jack. And thank you for making those connections yourself. So I wouldn't, I didn't, I don't no longer have to do that. Um, Joe Schumacher, um, are you online? I am online. Thanks. Thank Let me see you. if I can get the presentation rocking there. Hold on one moment. And so I can get the share screen up there appropriately. Let's try this one. This one here. See if this flies for us. And then share. 
Are you seeing the presentation? Probably not. In your email. <laughs> you are, aren't you? Hey, is there anything good in there? All right, just a moment here. Hold on just one second. Thank you. Well, just as we uh, start up here, I just want to mention that, uh, you know, you've got this panel of fantastic physical oceanographers, and then you've got me, a fishery scientist here who depends upon these folks. And uh, it's a uh, it's the need needs that I'm going to talk about here today. So we're just going to go ahead and do this. Hold on one moment. Thank you. All righty. There we go. Fun, fun, fun. What happens when I have multiple screens? I know, I know how that goes. Yeah, yeah. By the way, all right. We're having fun here right now. Let's try this over here. Um, by the way, uh, yeah, Jack's uh, pictures did take a few. I'm going to share a few of the same ones with you here whenever we get this shared appropriately. Oh, here we go. Let's try it one more time. We're going to see this one. Try to move this over to here if we can do this. Screen two. All right, that one more time. Just one moment, folks. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Mm -hmm. Yep, we're seeing your slide now, Joe. Thank, thank you. you. My goodness, we got yeah. it to work. Well, thank you very much. First and foremost, in the uh, in the um, um, agenda, you'll note that it has me associated with Nanus, and I have been for twenty plus years with uh, this great team from the uh, the Northwest Oos, as uh, Jack noted earlier, out here. Uh, the Nanus team is extraordinarily um, good for working with the tribes out here, uh, both in Puget Sound and out here on the outer coast of Washington. But in fact, I'm, I'm employed by the Quinault Indian Nation and have been for 24 years out here. So we've, uh, we work uh, on a, in a remote environment that uh, has not gotten a lot of attention over the years until recently. So we really appreciate the fact that uh, we have these folks here today that have helped us in this regard. Um, we live in an isolated coast and in particular, um, you know, this uh, area here north of Grays Harbor on the northwest coast uh, of Washington state is is really, really tough to get to and has a lot of resources, but it has not had the attention paid to it for data gathering that has been um, needed, uh, you know, uh, especially for management of resources here. Uh, in fact, in the past, all of those data um, need the data collection came primarily from personal observations from tribal members that have lived here forever. They've, um, you know, the ocean provides everything that the tribes need out here uh, for their, for them and including the salmon, you know, it's, it's the home for the salmon that return up the rivers that are so important to them. But everything out here right now is in jeopardy and has been for some time. We've seen the changes and uh, it's been noted by everybody that lives out along these coasts. They're on the front line of climate change. So our data needs are more pressing than ever. And that's where folks like Melanie, Jack, Luann, and Craig come in handy. I mean, we really absolutely need the data produced by oceanographers to help us better understanding the physical environment in this ocean that leads to the biological changes and the ecological changes that are so important for us to know so that we can at least monitor for them and potentially mitigate against them. So we're, uh, we're harvesters, the Quinault Nation. Uh, we uh, we uh, manage many, many fisheries out here in the ocean. Quinault is a known manager, a uh, noted manager, I should say. He was recognized in the federal court case that uh, that um, re uh, reestablished their treaty rights out here, the United States versus the state of Washington. And in that court case, the federal judge uh, found that two tribes in the state of Washington had a history of management, and that included the Quinault Indian Nation and the Yakima Nation. And so we are co-managers and full regulators of our fisheries out here. And you can see halibut, dungeness crab, sable fish, uh, various rockfish and other demersal species uh, on the shoreline, the Pacific razor clams, and uh, down in the lower right corner, the iconic blueback sockeye salmon that run up the Quinault River. And these, uh, as you saw earlier from Jack's photos there of some of our events, we had, we had the first time that any of our Quinault members had ever noted 
a fish kill of this magnitude occurring. And we, we went back to the elders within the tribe. We went back to everybody that we could uh, uh, talk to up, not just at Quinault, but with our tribal members to the north as well, from the Ho, the Quileute, and the Macaw tribes. And there were no stories, no long, uh, you know, uh, oral uh, history of, of uh, large fish kills washing ashore on the beaches. So this is an example of where, as Jack noted earlier, in the September uh, glider mission off of uh, the Quinault coast there, you saw that it came in right towards the village of Tahola, where I'm speaking to you from now, uh, that uh, we had a low oxygen zone there um, about taking over about half of the water column at that point. Well, this is an example where it takes over the whole water column. And when this occurs, uh, we have dead fish and we've had this reoccur numerous times since this 2006 massive event that uh, littered the beach for miles with dead fish of all species and types. And then we have this hand-in-hand -hand relationship with OA that's, that frightens us de deeply uh, because of the future uh, of the ocean out here. We know what the, we know about uh, the carbon storage in the ocean. We know that uh, you know, upwelling is bringing this to our shores and we know that it's causing carbonate uh, chemistry problems that are gonna probably affect a lot of our resources. So we need to know more and more about all of these parameters in order to better um, prepare for an uncertain future and to potentially mitigate for events as they occur. Uh, the oceanographic data needs for Quinault are the same as much of this, um, many of the things that have been discussed today, but in, you know, the, uh, in particular, long-term data sets. And I think we've heard that from a couple of folks here today. We need to define these baselines and then the changes we need. I think that it's very important that, um, that uh, NASCM and others, you know, continue to re realize the importance of traditional knowledge where available and appropriate and how they can incorporate this data in to these uh, Western data sets that are available now in these uh, spatially remote areas. So we would look, we're looking for optimized or, or useful data uh, off our coast out here that we can use to better manage, including ocean temperature, just, uh, DO, sea level, currents of waves, carbonate chemist chemistry, long-term biological data, including primary and secondary productivity, and as Jack uh, alluded to, the determination of multi-stressor impacts on organisms out here, which we're getting more and more concerned with for obvious reasons. I'd like to put a plug in too for LTERs as well as LTORs, as um, as Melanie brought up. But uh, LTERs, you know, we have the one off the Newport line that's been in place for some time now off the central coast of Oregon there. Uh, it's extraordinarily valuable, but however, between here and there, we have a thing called the Columbia River, and it's uh, and uh, its usefulness for um, uh, the biological data in particular for our uh, work on salmon up here uh, could be augmented by something north of the Columbia River, maybe off of Westport. Um, with that, uh, I'd just like to note the collaboration of new tools. The NANUS um, collaboration has been extraordinarily useful for Quinault and has led to many collaborative efforts, as well as the great tools that are available on NANUS, including here from the NVS. Uh, this is an aragonite saturation um, model off the live ocean model that uh, shows it at the seafloor bottom out there. Uh, I had it forecast to today, actually, 24th of October. And there we go. And uh, you saw this earlier from Jack's work. When we have Jack uh, uh, take the time as a collaborator with us to set up the missions that occur off our coast out here and to uh, come all the way north to Tahola to work with our students, that is true collaboration that works to not only for helping us with our data needs, but to, um, to uh, help spawn that next generation of scientists that are needed to really get, uh, get in place and continue the work out here off our coast. I love this slide here on the, uh, excuse me, this um, image on the right here. This is from an earlier version of the Sea Glider work with uh, some earlier collaborators from the Coastal uh, Center for Coastal uh, Margin Ocean Prediction. Uh, I just like the uh, the viewpoint. This is looking south, and uh, at the top of that picture is the Columbia River. Uh, then a little bit lower is the uh, Willapa Bay, and then Grays Harbor. And so we're looking uh, north to south there, and just kind of shows that dramatic that coastal shelf and that dramatic drop down there, and some glider drops in there, and obviously some low uh, some low um, oxygen zones in there in, in this hypoxia index image. Um, so this collaboration is essential to filling the gaps both in our knowledge and our coverage, and uh, it, it, that's just an that's that's the way it works. You really have to work with the folks that are out there in those locations to get the best possible information and to plan the best possible research 
that not only gets uh, gets to the basic science needs, gets to the use the user groups that are out here as well. Collaborative oceanographic sciences with with non academic entities is not easy. So I really want to thank all of our partners on the Washington coast for their support. Traditional knowledge should be a part of long term data. That's it's hard again. Work on it. Uh, we have strong recommendations for true collaborative science with underserved communities, including tribal governments, and should be supported by the NASCM and others. And collaboration always requires funding and resource support for all those partners involved. So just a plug out there to make sure that not everybody understands that we can't, we want to participate, but we can't do it without the potential support that every, all of you need. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. And then stop sharing. Thank you very much for this perspective. Um, I love that you brought up traditional ecological knowledge and how that can really help move the science forward if it's put into use an equal footing with the hypothesis-based more Western science. I have a feeling we're gonna talk about that more at the first session after lunch when we talk about co-design and co-development. I, th I think Joe, you and Jack really presented a case where engaged what engaged science can look like to, to really benefit an immediate need. So thank you for that. We do have some time for questions and those of you who are online are also in the room. Um, if there's a particular question you see on Slido that you really like, give it a thumbs up. So it kind of moves up in the ranking here. And Brad, I see that your questions is up there in regarding is in regards to the brain drain that Luann talked about. And Brad, there's also an anonymous question that came in just before you about the brain drain. Maybe you can incorporate that point of view into your question as well. And I think you're gonna get a microphone from Eric oh. so that the online folks can hear you really well. Yeah, Brad, that was, that was me. I didn't know how to put my name in. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Brad Rick. So <laughs> we'll join together and you can correct anything I get wrong. So Rick's, Rick's portion of this, Luan, was, was to ask whether these people had who had shifted had shifted into an activity that may still be focused on oceanography in some sense. Because you can go to the private sector and there's lots of potential kind of oceanographic aspects there. But, but I was thinking of a kind of a, a different question as to you know, on this imbalance, what what do we need to do to make change in this to this issue? And how specific is this to physical oceanography? I mean, it is is it in other areas? Is it broadly in oceanography? So um for the first one, the brain dream, I think the reason that I'm concerned about it is that many of those were involved in the upgrade of the um, community or system model for, for the ocean component. So it's been using an ocean model that's decades old and it was moving, they were trying to move to MOM6, which is a newer model out of GFDL. And many of those people who left are either people who developed parameterizations or who were helping with the effort to modernize that model. So it's more than just them leaving. Um, uh, you know, they're not, they, many of them did go to CDR, but we're losing their modeling knowledge at the institution that builds the community model in the US. Okay, and then the second question, can you remind me now that I got so passionate about that? Well, about the second question has two parts in a sense. Is this specific to physical oceanography yeah, but... broadly? But then more importantly, I think the real issue maybe for all of us is how do you change this? How do you how do you correct gender imbalance? Because you pointed to that in a number of different areas. And how do we engage or bring more people in or sustain those who are presently active? Yeah, I think that par part of I think what's happening is this sort of coding focus and machine learning that is sort of moving towards computer science, which has tended to be less friendly to women. And it's quite different on the theory modeling sort of computational side, the gender distribution than it is in the observational side. There are actually more women. I mean, I don't know what the, but just sort of anecdotally in my experience is there are more women um, proportionally in the observational world than there are in the computational analysis world. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so there are some follow-ups to that, um, I see. Uh, let's go to Shannon here, because my microphone is nearby, and then Marsha. 
No, mine was more of a comment just to add to that a little bit. And Luann's anecdotal evidence. I think that has been proven um, through NSF studies that women are less likely to be found in physical oceanography or marine technology fields. And to that point, NSF does fund a program for retaining women in physical oceanography. It's called the Empower Program. Um, and I think that's been pretty successful in keeping women in the field of physical oceanography. But I just wanted to point out that has been a, a issue that has been recognized by NSF. Yeah, I've been involved in Empower since its inception. Marsha. Uh, uh, Luann, can you elaborate on why you think AI ML and data science is unfriendly to women that might not be what you intended to say that it's unfriendly or but why women aren't fitting into that field maybe yeah I don't I don't know if I have a good answer to it it's mostly an observation and if you look in at least at University of Washington computer science department it's heavily dominated by men so I'm not really sure why. There's probably papers on this out there that I could explore, but um, I'm not an expert in that. It's more of an observation that I've seen the evolution over time of what physical oceanography has looked like. I mean, it yes. was when I first started, there were very few women physical oceanographers, and then there were more and more, and now it seems to be changing. Very anecdotal, I realize, but something to watch. Thank you, Luann. Clearly, this is a topic that resonates with this group, and maybe Melanie wants to add to that, and then I want to move us to a different topic. Okay, thanks. I I just wanted to quickly say um, there's the article, a recent article by Ranganathan et al. that looks at different geosciences disciplines and uh, to my shock as a physical oceanographer, physical oceanography actually has the lowest proportion of women out of any geoscience disciplines. Um, second, I, I totally agree that Empower program has helped a lot to retain women who are in physical oceanography already. In fact, Luann has been my mentor for 15 years. We have talked on the phone every month for 15 years. We're Empower peer group one, still going strong. And the third thing is we have been talking a lot about trying to increase the numbers of women, um, which is great. But I also want to mention that there are other underrepresented groups who are so underrepresented that we don't even have statistics to talk about. And so we could maybe broaden the conversation a bit there. Yeah. But I'm glad that you brought this up, Luann. Very good points. Thank you, Melanie. Um, so I want to move us on to a little bit of a different discussion. Lahini, I see that you have a question here about LTRs and LTORs. Do you want to go ahead and ask that? No, I have to find my question. <laughs> well, it was, I think, a well, two-part question or two-part observation. Um, I was thinking, as you were especially, Melanie, talking about um, long-term observations like multi-decadal scale as we think about marine heat waves or decadal scale um, changes in the Pacific that are natural that, you know, I think there are more and more data sets, geochemical data sets coming out now, whether it's from corals down in Rivia Hejedos or sediment um, data sets that are high resolution enough. What about interfacing with some of those data sets to really try to, you know, and we've done this for, you know, for time immemorial, I guess in this uh, discipline, but I think these higher resolution data sets um, and um, also, you know, now with the geochemical advances where you can make these geochemical measurements on smaller and smaller sample sizes, which means you can increase the temporal resolution. I think, you know, thinking about how to um, combine those is valuable. Melanie, do you want to address that? Oh, thank you. Yes, I totally agree. Uh, I guess my my immediate thought is that um, it involves working, often working across disciplinary boundaries. And what, so I'd like to connect it back to the issue Tuba has raised about, and others about the way that our evaluation systems work right now. Um, and that, uh, you know, we there's still a lot of, uh, they're not even to the point of being only vestiges, right, of the lone hero scientist being the most valued. And um, and so I think 
in order to join together these observing efforts on different time scales and in different fields, we really need to learn better how to value that kind of team work, the interdisciplinary work. It just takes longer as you well, I'm sure know, because you're always having to explain what do your words mean that don't mean the same thing in the other field and vice versa. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's hard to know how to convey or, or to assess that effort. Thank you for that. Um, there's one more topic that seems to be coming up in the Slido uh, questions, um, and maybe we have just enough time to cover that or by going a few minutes late, if that's okay, Jim. Uh, Ajit, you have a question about um, commercialization. Um, it, it, let's go there and see what Craig or Jack or others think. Uh, Craig, just um, following up on your point, which I think is really valid, it's something that I've been sort of beating my head against for a while now. Curious to hear if you have any thoughts on how alternate modes of making new instruments available within the community work would work, you think, or because the idea that industry will pick up something and there'll be a market for it really doesn't seem to be there. Yeah, thanks. We're, we're actually struggling through a part of that right now. Um, your, our experience of, of just give a really quick summary of our experience with Seabuyer, right? It was designed and, and built at the University of Washington, provided to the community through a, a service center at the University of Washington, a fabrication center for a number of years, uh, commercialized through a license originally to our robot, maker of the Rumba vacuum cleaner, military robots. Um, that lasted a while. Uh, they let go of the license when they failed to obtain a, a large Navy contract. Kongsberg picked that license up. I think again, with these aspirations for a big Navy contract, um, they sold it to uh, Huntington Ingalls, maker of Nimitz class aircraft carriers. You can imagine how that went. And we have recently taken it back and started a in-house service center with a slightly different bent on how to provide uh, service and support to the community. And you know, a part of this is that you know, as you alluded to, the the commercial market is is small relative to the aspirations of most companies that that would like to pick it up. Our our relentless focus on growth isn't well suited to uh, to these kinds of things, right? It, it would be good living for a few people, you know, over a sustained period of time, but it's not a good living for a continued growing number of people with aspirations that fell ever more every year. Um, you know, the models we think about are trying to empower the community to support itself by providing support and training. We've talked about doing open source kinds of things for these instruments, um, seeking small ways to to commercialize, if you will, um, you know, not big aspirational companies, but, but smaller groups. Um, yeah, it, it's it's a tough problem. I, I don't really know where to go from there. Thank you. Thank you for that perspective, Craig. Um, any other thoughts from the panel about that topic, Jack? Well, Craig's absolutely right about these these high end, complicated robots. But there's a another end of the of the challenge, and that is getting many sensors out for low cost into the hands of folks. And we've been making a fair bit of progress on that end with um, robust, inexpensive dissolved oxygen sensors. Of course, we've been able to do temperature forever. Um, th things are coming along in the biogeochemistry. Lots of potential there to get, you know, order thousand dollar instruments out there by the by the uh, thousands rather than the, you know, the few two hundred thousand dollar instruments. So I'm pretty hopeful about that end of things. Great perspective. Thank you, Jack. This has been a really informative panel, you all. I really appreciate everybody's time. Luann, Craig, Melanie, Jack, and Joe. Thank you very much. Start a session on um, artificial intelligence and machine learning and the future of ocean science. And we have three people, I think they're online, Patrick, um, Einbach, uh, Prasanna, 
I don't have my glasses on, so I'm having trouble reading these. Yeah, Patrick, Persona, and Kana. Uh, is everyone on all three online? I think. Uh, you see? Yes, this is Kana here. Okay, I think uh, the list has Patrick going first. Is that correct? Is that how we're going to do it? Patrick, are you going to go ready to go first? Yes, that's correct. Uh, hi, okay. everyone. Um, let me share my screen here. Okay, so you're not seeing, right now you're seeing the presenter mode, is that right? You're not seeing the... Right. Yeah, we can see, yeah, now we see it, the full screen. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about this uh, broad subject that was actually even posed a bit broader. Uh, the name Digital Twins also appeared in, in, the, uh, in the request. And so what I'm trying to do here in just 10 minutes to cover some aspects of and weaving together this concept of uh, digital twins and then the notion of how we use uh, scientific machine learning in uh, in ocean sciences. And um, first, the question here is what actually are digital twins? And this brings to mind, the, the, some of you have seen this, the parable of the blind man and the elephant, uh, depending on where and from how you look at this, you might get quite some different answers. Let me start here with the perspective uh, of this uh, UN uh, Ocean Decades effort called DITO, the Digital Twins of the Ocean. And the quote here from Martin Visbeck, uh, digital twins of the ocean will bring together ocean data models and digital information with those who are planning and regulating human ocean interactions. They will become indispensable elements of sustainable development of the ocean space. So you see how a lot of different building blocks actually weave together. So it's not just one component of it, but it's basically how do we generate sort of a, a workflow uh, or building blocks that actually seamlessly go between the ocean observing system that is indispensable and that's still too sparse at the present day, a data space on where we can uh, seamlessly share and discover and use information. Then um, the data analytics, uh, sort of modern and evolving tools, for example, machine learning on how we actually uh, rapidly and comprehensively analyze the data. Prediction engines, which we can think of the physics models that we that we are uh, that we've actually talked about today, but also uh, surrogate models or emulators, then all the way to visualization uh, tools and the decision making tools that allow uh, users to actually really take advantage of all of the different data spaces. And so, if you want to know more about this, uh, the the digital the digital uh, website actually provides some information. But I wanted to do I wanted to switch gear a little bit and actually take a slightly um, well, sort of somewhat uh, complementary perspective uh, from an engineering perspective because doing so will actually bring us a little bit towards what is actually under the hood needed to realize sort of these the concept of these digital twins and all of their different renditions. And so from engineering perspective where the concept of digital twin actually started in aerospace engineering up to uh, 50 years ago. Uh, so the idea is that uh, the digital twin is an uh, in silico replica of a system that has a number of requirements. So first it must uh, continuously improve as it integrates new data and then um, provides a dynamical digital history of the assets that we're, we're studying. Uh, it must be able to issue predictions. So it must be um, 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 uh, uh, go beyond sort of what it's basically the seen data into unseen conditions and it must do so reliably. And ideally we wanted to be able to do that with quantified uncertainty. We want to be able to use such little twins to um, support assessments of what if scenarios, like we can think of these scenarios, like of course that we're used to in the climate modeling community, but um, these scenarios there are actually still the way how we can do them and how we can afford to doing them computationally are quite limited. We want to be much broader, again, quantifying uncertainties. And then um, we want to uh, incorporate sort of a synergistic two-way coupling between the physical system, the data collection, and then the user and the social system at the other end. And again, here, sort of what the building blocks here, what they look like on the one hand, we have, of course, high fidelity uh, models, um, the physical models. Uh, we have advanced systems for uh, doing data assimilation on how we integrate and merge, fuse the data with these observations. We have advanced tools of reduced order uh, modeling, so surrogate modeling, machine learning tools, 
that we can either use to uh, fast, fast, vastly accelerate simulations or calibrate those models much better. Uh, we need sort of advanced tools of uncertainty quantification, which will present major challenges. And again, the question of the uh, data uh, cyber infrastructure uh, that provides us with the means of uh, you know, analyzing this vast uh, out output that can go into the, the petabytes, for example, from the CMIP-6 suit or some very, very high resolution model uh, simulations at one kilometer resolution also take up petabytes um, and soon will basically also go into the petabyte range with um, satellite data such as the surface water ocean topography um, um, mission that NASA has uh, just launched a, a, year, about a year ago. And um, so trying to move here from how can machine learning support digital twins? Uh, machine learning, again, so it has a number of ways on how we can, how, what machine learning actually can do uh, for us. And uh, it's, uh, for, for example, classification, anomaly detection, or it is regression, which can be in the form of parameter calibration or state estimation. We can think of uh, space uh, or time-dependent state prediction. Uh, we can think of uh, autonomous systems and active sampling techniques and how we can optimize our sampling strategy given sort of the very expensive and harsh environment that oftentimes we operate uh, in the ocean. And then emulation, for example, for uncertainty quantification. Here, large really number of, of topics that we could talk about. And what I was going to focus here is on point, point two on a regression and model calibration. And Luan Thompson earlier today showed how climate models still um, are uh, endowed with sort of major uh, model biases. That's uh, true for the atmosphere. It's also as Luan showed for the ocean. And here, can we leverage uh, machine learning tools, for example, to improve such model parameter calibration, uh, model uh, parameterization calibrations? This is uh, from a review article by Laura Zana and Bolton in 2021. Uh, where they show on how we can use um, uh, equation discovery or uh, surrogate modeling to calibrate uh, ocean models better, subgrid scale parameterization, eddy parameterization in ocean models using uh, uh, simulated data, for example, from large eddy simulation to actually be able to still run coarse resolution models, uh, which we will not get away with for the foreseeable future, even 10 kilometer resolution in some ways this course resolution, if we think at the high latitudes, we're still barely resolving the baroclinic Rossby rays of deformation. And so we're not going to get away from the need to parameterize these models and machine learning may give us a way to, uh, to improve such parameterizations. We can go uh, much broader and actually think about how we can seamlessly integrate scientific machine learning. So what's just been shown on the previous slide, but also inverse um, method approaches that have been around for a while to also incorporate not just big data that we get from very high resolution model simulations like LES simulations, but also from the sparse observational and eclectic obser global ocean observing system that we have to do something that's called a posterior or full model or online end-to-end -end learning of the models. And so where we actually use state of the model itself um, that we calibrate and not just the parameterization schemes on their own. And sort of the, the recent sort of buzzword in this uh, context has been, it's called the differentiable programming. So where we're basically bringing together neural networks that follow this concept of differentiable programming again, but then uh, extend it to the full model that we have. Um, so for example, to the, to the physical model, biogeochemical model uh, and other types of models that we wish to uh, calibrate and confront to the data and learn from, from these data through the lens of those models. And to do so, um, it's really, and this is really just one example, and I'm wanting to use this to show how um, in order to make this happen, make this work, uh, really requires the intense and long-term collaboration between the computational scientists computer scientists, and then the domain scientists to really leverage some of the emerging uh, tools, hardware architecture in, uh, that we have in high performance computing that enable us to run sort of GPU enabled ocean models, but then also computational tools uh, such as differentiable programming, where we can actually use these model and, inter and seamlessly combine machine learning tools with these uh, PDE constrained models to actually achieve something uh, like end-to-end -end model learning. And here, this is an example from a Julia approach that basically is being applied to a Julia based ocean model that's been recently run at very, very high resolution on 
a large number of, uh, of GPUs. Um, finally, I want to go very briefly um, um, uh, talk about the, um, the issue of um, making the scientific data more usable um, and um, so that we can really full, fully explore the, the vast amounts of data that we actually have. And here, the, the, the point here, uh, courtesy Ryan Abernathy uh, that he has been making is that with, if we talk about the science community, which is the right column, and the business community, which is the left common, column, they're really disparate tools that have been used at, at many of the levels, right? So the data lakes or warehouses, the, the storage formats, the analysis APIs, there have basically been a complete disconnect between those two communities, which is unfortunate. I think we, Ryan um, thinks uh, that there is huge gains to be made by actually really bringing some of these capabilities in the, in the, in the private sector where there's huge amounts of investments have gone into developing these tools, bring this into the scientific community and basically merging this and think about sort of a scientific data commons that serve on the one inside the data providers that, that basically produce um, data, either simulated data or observational data, then data enrichers, which are um, tech companies that work in the data science, uh, data analytics space, and then all the way to the data consumers, which could be increasingly um, the uh, insurance companies, um, financial services, all kinds of ocean services for the blue economy, all the way to the defense. And so I'd like to finish here with just basically pointing sort of, this brings the, the notion of digital twins, which really tries to integrate a number of these workflow into this uh, seamless interaction between end-to-end -end sort of data production and data, data, data use. Um, there is a current uh, National Academy studies going on on the foundational research gaps and future directions for digital twins. And um, uh, there, which has also had a session on um, its users for weather and climate simulation, and certainly the ocean is uh, as an integral part of this. And uh, there's a lot to be uh, done here. And the notion here of really interdisciplinary work here with the computational and computer science, I think is indispensable to really make progress in that space. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Patrick. And uh, we'll now hear from uh, Prasanna. Yep, thank you, let me share my screen. Uh, you see the correct view, right? Uh, yes, we can see the screen. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, yeah. thanks everyone. And uh, I'm Prasanna Satyari, I'm a principal research scientist at Iron uh, Research. And I'll be talking about uh, trustworthy AI and it, its role in AI assisted decision making. Um, yeah, I think we, we uh, I think I don't have to say too much about uh, the possibilities that AI can bring to different environmental science and ocean sciences. Um, I think the previous presentation touched upon a little bit on this. Uh, just to make the point, I think we can use AI in a lot of different applications, right? And it holds, holds a lot of promise. Um, uh, for example, like we did some work around super resolution, so going from low spatial uh, grids to uh, more uh, high resolution. Uh, uh, enhancement using different machine learning tools. That's one possibility. And we can also think of other um, applications where we are doing automatic classification, right? And uh, there are a lot of applications which are boiled down to classification. Um, so I think my focus on uh, my focus in this talk would be like how and when can we trust such automated uh, systems and what are the risks associated with such systems, right? And these are some examples. Uh, they are from different domains, uh, but you can see that uh, these models, when we train with some limited amount of data, they can uh, have some sort of shortcuts, which could be harmful, right? When you deploy it in real applications. So if you take, for example, these test X-rays, uh, we see that they learn a shortcut based on some artifacts that are there in the images, right? And the problem with uh, such shortcuts is that when you go slightly away from the domain that you have trained your data, it kind of fails, right? Because it's, it's relying on these shortcuts when it's making prediction. And similarly, it can sort of uh, take some feature which is not at all important and then latch onto it and make a prediction. And again, when these uh, uh, co correlations which are there in the data, 
which are not representative of the real uh, sort of mechanisms of how we come upon some outcomes, it can have like bad uh, outcomes, right? So I think these are some of the things that we need to sort of think about and uh, to sort of more um, uh, build a framework around these risks, we can think about is the model uh, fair? And fairness could be to different, many different dimensions, right? It could be based on uh, geographical regions. It could be based on a uh, lot of different aspects, right? So essential aspect there is, is it robust to some sort of distribution shifts or when the population underlying population changes, right? Um, so, and why is that important, right? And uh, I think the reason I'm bringing up these risk is if we identify the risk, then we can uh, uh, enable this AI as a decision maker in a much more powerful manner, right? So the key thing is uh, we use these automated systems and the model makes a prediction and um, we uh, sort of want to identify if this prediction is correct or incorrect, right? And uh, so what are the things we can do to enable an expert to look at models prediction and make a judgment, do I trust this prediction or not? And uh, we like to think of this decision-making framework using, AI, uh, using the assistance of AI in sort of two ways, right? So one is where the AI is uh, just communicating its predictions to the expert, and maybe they, it will communicate uh, slightly more things. And the other uh, more richer way of communication is where the AI and the expert are co uh, coordinating with each other, they're communicating with each other. And then you come up uh, with a decision which is uh, taking into account their uh, strengths and weaknesses together, right? So, um, so one way to sort of enable this uh, uh, AI human uh, collaborator system is through uncertainty, right? Which the previous presentation also touched upon. So, so if the AI system uh, gives us um, a prediction uh, saying uh, it's, let's say in this case, right? So um, if there is a contamination or not, right? So it's not enough for an expert to act on it. It should provide some meaningful uncertainties associated with that, right? And let's say it gives you con uh, some confidence scores. It says uh, I have 0.55 uh, confidence in one uh, contaminated class, and then I have only 0.45 in the other class. Then the expert can obviously uh, determine that this is not a very confident prediction. I should probably uh, not accept the model prediction and take some other corrective measures. So this paradigm has been studied under selective predictions in the literature, right? And I think the key thing here is uncertainty quantification, right? And there are a lot of different algorithms in the literature through which we can get uncertainty scores. Uh, we like to think in terms of intrinsic or extrinsic. So intrinsic is where the, the model that we're using for prediction itself is able to capture different sources of uncertainty. And the common source of uncertainty are either data or model, right? So data is something like, for example, if I have noisy uh, input and so on. Uh, whereas model uncertainty is something that's because of the gaps in the model's knowledge. So again, going back to the previous example, I trained my model on only some subpopulation and uh, there is gaps in the model's knowledge because it has never seen data from other subpopulation, right? Um, but in this era of foundation models, right? And we are seeing more and more domains uh, where foundation models are being applied, where we train big models on lots of different data and then we use it for different downstream applications. It becomes quite important to use extrinsic methods as well, where, where what we call extrinsic methods are essentially things like recalibration or conformal prediction or other methods which are essentially taking uh, the model predictions and if it comes up with uncertainty estimates, recalibrate them so that it has some guarantees. Or in some cases, if we are using point estimates, which where the model doesn't provide any uncertainty, we sort of add a layer of uncertainty wrapper on top of that. Right? Um, so, so one uh, sort of line of work along this direction is what we call as meta models. So you can think of this as taking a point estimate. So when I mean point estimate, I have a model, it just gives me a prediction, right? So it just gives me a label, let's say it's safe or unsafe. And then we can take some held out uh, data and then get the model's predictions on those data and go ahead and collect the actual ground truth, right? So now we have this uh, validation set where I know the ground truth uh, values. I can, cons I can construct a data set where the label now is did the model succeed or not, right? So with that uh, data set now, I can train a simple model whose job is to predict model success or failure. And we can use things like uh, linear classifiers or logistic regression and so on 
And now we get these probability estimates where we can interpret those probabilities as the model success or failure rate, right? And we have some extension around it, but the key thing here is that uh, we can we need such techniques when we work with much larger models where we cannot apply standard techniques like Bayesian methods or ensembles and so on. Uh, so other key thing to note here is how do we evaluate these uncertainty measures, right? So um, we typically look at calibration, which usually is an aggregate measure. So we look at the whole population and then we measure calibration, which essentially means that if the model is predicting uh, uh, confidence P on certain instances, does the accuracy of the model is also around P, right? So that's the expectation when we say a model is well calibrated. But if you slice these calibration metrics uh, by different subpopulations in the data, we might see that the model is not that well calibrated, right? So I'm showing this plot here. Uh, uh, so what's happening here is I'm using this model in a selective prediction framework. So I'm increasing my threshold on confidence uh, on this x-axis. And the expectation is as I accept more and more um, highly confident instances, as in my threshold on the co confidence is increasing, my error on the accepted instances should go down, right? That's the expectation. And we can see that that is happening on an aggregate here. But if I look at this curve, when I slice them by different groups, I can see that for one of the groups, the opposite behavior is happening, right? As I increase my confidence threshold, that is as I look at instances where the model is really confident, it is making more mistakes. I mean, this could be a sign of underrepresentation, right? So maybe from this pocket of uh, data, I, I don't have enough instances. So it gives us some indication that probably I need to add more data from these points and so on. So it's really important to look at um, uh, all these subpopulations that we care about and try to compute these metrics along uh, these dimensions. Uh, so, so far we looked at one-way communication, right? So the model makes a prediction, it gives additional information apart from the model prediction, then the, the human makes a decision, right? And often we, if we are seeing in some cases with these larger and larger models, powerful models, uh, the models um, can have complementary strength to a particular human expert, right? So, so it's also important uh, and we are investigating how we can learn joint human AI systems such that uh, we can uh, take into account the human strength, right? So, so if we, the idea is when we train such a system, we will have a rejector, which can take any instance and determine, should I give this to an automated classifier or should I, hum uh, or should I send it to humans, right? And the goal here is also to reduce the, the workload of the human, right? So there's a balance between how much we send to humans and what is our error tolerance. Right? And uh, I think so far we've relied on uncertainty, right? But I think go, uh, one of our research direction is to look at much richer forms of communications. So can we uh, use different explainability methods to sort of facilitate this human AI collaboration, right? So what sort of explanations will be useful? And, and we have studied a lot of different methods and we think like each explainability method should be uh, should should be mapped to the right persona, right user, and the right model. And beyond this, I think one of the really interesting uh, directions that I think is how do we use these explainability methods to onboard users, right? Such that they can understand the behavior, they can catch uh, errors and so on. And each human might have different strengths. So can we tailor these explanations such that the human can effectively use the AI system? So, um, so let me stop here by saying that we, uh, we're doing uh, quite a bit of work around different dimensions. I touched upon uncertainty and explainability, but there are a lot of other risks as well, right? So which may or may not apply to so things like adversarial robustness, fairness, and uh, looking at it from causal lens and so on. So the things that are listed here are all uh, some demos that, that are powered by the open source toolkits that we have released in the last few years. Um, yeah, let me stop here. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, next speaker is uh, Kana. Thank you for having me. Um, I am going to take a slightly different tack. And even though my name says Zoe Alexander, I am not Zoe Alexander. 
Um, and I also want to show you a different way of thinking or attention to a uh, part of what we have been calling AI. This is just a gratuitous uh, way to tell you that we've been operating embedded AI systems which actually make decisions on board AUVs for quite some time. So that's just a way to uh, sort of set this tone. And a lot of the work that uh, we have been doing as a way to understand how to sample in the ocean is driven by what what the monk uh, said some time ago, some some time ago, memorably, and what we are really hoping to do is that we can use intelligent robotic sampling methods coupled with decision making. The decision making part is critical. What you've heard from Prasanna and Patrick is essentially the notion of using data. We are not talking about data here. We're talking about decisions and the notion of cognitive decision making in ways that can facilitate sampling the big ocean. And in particular, uh, the idea is to use cost-effective methods, leveraging advances in artificial intelligence. And the artificial intelligence that I've been trained on is the classical forms of methods of reasoning about the world, reasoning about how machines, software, hardware should perform, but driven by the notion that you sense the environment, uh, you assimilate the data, you have a model of some sort, and there are different kinds of model, that's an over, over, overloaded expression. You plan or you project what you want to do, and then you actually act in the real world or in your synthetic world and so forth. So this cyclical pattern is really at the heart of a lot of the work that I've done, and I'm hoping to convince you that AI is not just data. In fact, AI is much more than data. And AI has a lot more to offer than just methods and statistics or, or, or neural networks. And the reason is that there's a whole host of issues associated with being at sea, dealing with the uncertainty, um, the fact that there's a huge amount of uh, cognitive overload, uh, models or synthetic ocean models, the skill levels is still something that we uh, desire a lot more. Um, and the big issue for people like me has been how do we maintain the sustained presence in the ocean to observe across space and time at large spatial and temporal scales. So a lot of that has to deal with this fundamental notion in ocean science of sampling, where, when you should sample, uh, given finite time, energy, resources, and the uncertainty of what you're we're dealing with. So the flavor of this talk is more about, hey, look, there's a lot more to AI. Let me just give you a few examples. Um, and I'm just not going to go into, uh, I'm impressed with Prasanna's uh, set of equations. There are no equations here. This is simply to gi give you um, uh, an insight into uh, the classical forms of what artificial intelligence is really all about. Um, a lot of my work was uh, is driven by having flown the first AI system in space. And this is, again, not data, it's decision-making. Uh, this was 1999 in deep space, 65 million miles away, followed by command and control of the two Mars rovers in the 2003 mission. And then on moving to Embari, where I was a PI, on building something called the Telio Reactive Executive, which is an onboard decision-making system, uh, the AUVs, could essentially follow signals, not straight lines, uh, in the ocean and, and collect samples in this case using statistical methods and machine learning. And where this is going is really uh, what I wanted to show you about. So this is just a quick slide to say that there's an entire cognitive architecture. This is the notion that we want to build machines in software that leverage existing hardware to make decisions on board like human beings. So we deal with uncertainty, we deal with uh, latency, we deal with um, uh, yeah, faults, uh, irregular phenomena, we as human beings. We want our software to be able to do this kinda, and we want that software I, to be embedded. Yes. Can I interrupt just for a second? Your, your, your screen is not sharing right oh. now. We see you, uh, but not uh, not the screen. Okay, were you not able to see my screen at all, or no, no? Okay, I'm sorry. Pick up on that until uh, just okay. now. 
Let me let me try this again. Sounds good. <laughs> okay, hang on just a second. Uh, let me just see if. Uh, okay. Okay, hang on just a second because my Mac is giving me all kinds of messages. So I'm sorry if you're not able to see the screen and let me see if I can try to fix that right now. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Kind of this is too bad. I will say that I, you've been. I mean, it's been really easy to follow, even without slides. You're thinking. Well, so. ma maybe that's that's the way to do it. <laughs> uh, let's see. Maybe I should send you the slides. Um, because I don't know why this is not working. Hang on just a second. Let me try again. Um, you want to send it to Zoe or Leanne? Um, yeah. Do you have a Mac or do you have a... Um, I think we are all PC. PC is what I'm seeing. Okay. Okay. Hang on just a second. It's a... But even if we can't get it up on the screen, we can certainly share it with the committee later. And I, for one, yeah. have not found it hard to follow your thinking, even though without slides. Uh, that's good to know. Uh, let's see. I think it's a... Uh, Anna, this is Kakani. It's... If you want to just send yeah. me your file, I can, I can, I have a Mac. I can probably play it. You have Keynote? Yep. Okay. Keynote, the thing is that this is pretty large. It's 70 meg. So um, um, I hadn't prepared for sending it via email, but let me just put in a Dropbox and see if you can try to get it. Perfect. Um, okay, so how about if I keep doing the slide thing and then you can see the slides later on in the interest of time? How's that? Yes. Yeah, that sounds good. Because okay. everyone okay. was so, following it well. All right. So. Um, all right. So I wanted to sort of give you the trajectory uh, of where things, where I've been coming from, but it's about decision making on 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 machines, hardware. But the decision making actually happens in software. So this is all about software, not hardware. So this is not uh, the notion of building machines per se. It's building machines where the core component is manipulating the hardware in ways that you can. And what I was showing you, or I thought I was showing you, was an architecture for doing it, which was built at Embari, uh, but it's moved on um, in other ways to sample, for instance, one application was looking at the sub subsurface chlorophyll max and building, doing field reconstruction, which is essentially trying to understand beneath uh, the upper surface, where is the subsurface chlorophyll max by sampling with sensors in situ, not in straight lines, but following trajectories driven by some form of statistical machine learning. And the picture in front of me is essentially showing you uh, this 3D reconstruction based on the measurements that we took in an AUV in a Norwegian fjord um, with my collaborators in Norway when I was a faculty there. Uh, this was published in Science Robotics uh, some time ago. I don't even remember when. Um, the next slide that I'm sort of putting up again is an Embari perspective, which is having a way to understand the spatiotemporal aspect of what the water column was looking like as you have a Lagrangian drifter moving in the water column and essentially um, uh, trying to have an AUV chase that um, uh, Lagrangian drifter. Let me send uh, the, my apologies with all of this, but let me just send, uh, Kukani, let me just send you the link, Dropbox link. 
Um, so the idea here is uh, I'm on slide eight, just so you know. Uh, uh, the idea here was to understand uh, with the drifter, the drifter had, uh, I think about 14 meters below had the ESP, that old version of the ESP, which uh, I'm sure ESP is the environmental sensing processor, which many of you are familiar with, uh, was essentially taking samples and, and trying to understand uh, what is in the water column, what's the uh, community structure, uh, what are the uh, uh, kinds of critters that they're able to see, while the idea of the AUV was to surround it as it's moving in, Lagrangian, in a Lagrangian manner uh, to be able to see it in space and time as to what, what's the environment. And you can't script these, so you're having the AUV make decisions in situ, no human being in the loop, uh, it based on the fact that we are tracking a target and the tra target is moving in some um, um, Lagrangian manner. So all of this again is to sort of give you the notion of decision-making by specific examples rather than having something very abstract. Uh, the next slide, I don't know, uh, Kakani, are you able to get the slides? I'm working on it. I, I think you okay. shared the keynote and I have to turn it into a zip. Okay. Um, the next slide is essentially um, an application that was um, that involves again robotics and AI, and the AI again is not machine learning, which is to track sunfish mola mola in space and time. So these are all very diverse applications where decisions have to be taken by machines. And what I have is uh, on this slide is a is an animation of what we actually did at sea in southern Portugal. And this involves aerial surface and underwater platforms, including a wave glider, which is acting like a communication hotspot. Um, and this has led to something that my old boss, Marsha McNutt, whom many of you know, she had this notion that we need to think about having machines become like sniffer dogs. Tell the machine at a very abstract level what taxa you're looking at, and the machine has to go off and, and swim and figure it out. This was in a project that I did when I was at uh, in Norway, um, and we built an AUV which does in situ imaging, uh, image processing, machine learning, supervised machine learning uh, using some data from Heidi Sosik and also from other sources to understand the different notions of different kinds of, of plankton. And then followed by a hydrodynamic, a small portable hydrodynamic model, which would measure current structure and, and understand which way the currents are moving, coupled with the decision-making system that I brought to the table that I showed you, that I was talking about earlier. I'm sorry, I can't show it to you. So this is also published in Oceanography 2020, as I'm seeing the notion here is, as a scientist is sitting on his or her desk remotely anywhere, and basically somebody's deployed this AUV and the machine is going off and looking for things in, in some um, a pattern. Um, where all of this is going is where I would like to and hope to sort of connect the dots between what Patrick mentioned and what Prasanna was talking about. And that has to put together a cohort or an ensemble of assets, physical assets, but driven by synthetic ocean models, which can assimilate. It's, you sense with the vehicles and platforms in the ocean, you quality control, and then you assimilate, and you predict. And the prediction in this case happens on shore with synthetic ocean models of a chunk of the ocean, a mesoscale. And then that prediction drag with some sense of uncertainty or, or um, um, entropy, which is reflective of what the model does not know, drives where the marine robots can actually be targeted to go and sample. So think of this like a massive machine learning experiment in the sense that your end goal is to have what uh, Patrick talked about as a digital twin, 
to, to refine the digital twin over time and space, what you need is a systematic approach that integrates uh, ensemble of vehicles, um, um, different methods of control of the vehicles, um, data assimilated from multiple sources, including remote sensing, and having a model that over time, essentially you turn the crank, the model makes a prediction, which is invariably not highly skilled, but that whole point is to reduce the error, increase the skill of the model by having this big, huge system in place. And I don't know where we are, Kakani, are you? Just tell me where, what slide you want. Okay, slide 12. Uh, let's go to slide 13. I'm sort of wrapping up at this stage. Okay. I think that's next. Yeah. Okay. So slide 13 is essentially, that's the next one, I think, okay. or the one of two after. Nope. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, I don't see the slide number, so you just have to okay, tell me. So, uh, two more. Okay, so this is what I was talking about, what we call as meteor, which is the sense of, um, uh, being able to assemble, uh, assimilate, uh, predict, and, and act. And where we think this should be going is a way in which you have, again, you're looking at hardware, but the, the real focus is the software. And it's the software that's actually driving decision-making so that you sample and you sample smartly and you sample in ways that actually make sense. So uh, final slide, if you don't mind. So, the ocean doesn't have straight lines, so why the hell are we sampling along those? And so adaptation methods in control with coupled with statistical methods and sampling are really important. We should be paying attention to it. Um, sensing and robotic uh, uh, methods and hardware have improved, yet we're still doing the same Charles Darwin approach to sampling with ships and so forth. I think we need to start thinking beyond ships. I'm not saying you remove the ships, but to augment ship-based sampling and to be able to explore more effectively across space and time with robots. Decision-making is important because you really want to be able to chase to understand processes in fine scale across the mesoscale. You want not just one ship, you want multiple robots. How to do that? Some of that technique is available and we've been using it for the last 15, uh, 15 years, uh, certainly in Portugal. Um, and uh, and we really want to be able to in, increase investment, not just in, in data science or analytics or machine learning, but also to provide new tools uh, in hardware and software. A lot of it is about software. It's not buying new toys out uh, for us to, to, to put on the table. Um, and I think we should have NSF uh, have incentives for computer scientists to actually you know get get them on ships because they don't understand the average i am in the computer science community i can say close to about maybe one percent are doing anything that's field driven and zero percent in terms of actually going out to sea if you don't know how to go to sea and don't understand what what scientists are actually working on. You have zero incentive, zero ideas, zero notion of what it takes. And, and that's unfortunately is, is where we are in, in computer science and specifically in artificial intelligence. More isn't uh, necessarily better, smarter is. Decision theoretic methods like the ones that I was hoping to show you at least in slides is, is, is what I believe we should be doing. And AI is not ML. ML has a place, it's very important, no doubt about it, but it's coupled with how you sense and sample the oceans. And so I think we need to have that broader perspective. And this is just a small little vignette, the, the set of slides in this presentation that I wanted to bring uh, across. So I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Kana. And uh, we've, we've got to move along now. Uh, we have actually one more speaker in this session, which is Kakani. And so if you could go ahead and start Kakani with your talk. Sure. Um, and thank you, Kakani. No worries, Kana, I tried. Um, all right, so 
uh, first off, thank you for the opportunity to, to talk. I know I didn't make it to the agenda, but um, I'm excited to be a part of this group and also the discussion. Um, and then, you know, the I think the other speakers really highlighted a, a number of things, and I'm going to come back to them as I present some of these slides. Um, and I'm also going to, though, focus really heavily on like the state of biological observations in the ocean, because uh, I think it's pretty clear that's a that's a, a gappy area um, in ocean science. Um, and also delve more deeply into imaging specifically. Um, and, and the methods or approaches that I'm going to talk about uh, can equally apply to uh, you know, the fields of eDNA or acoustics. Um, and, and so maybe keep that in mind as I uh, present some of these ideas or these slides. Um, and a lot of this is, is you know, collaborative work, work that we've done uh, with a number of individuals. Um, and, you know, thank you to the NSF Convergence Accelerator for supporting some of this work. Um, and I don't think I need to spend too much time convincing members of uh, the audience that um, biological observations, at least the state of them in the ocean, is it needs to be better. Um, this is a, a paper that was published by uh, Aaron Satterthwaite and a number of others in 2021 that showed at least the spatial extent near the ocean surface of our long-term biological observations. Um, and so these are data that are pulled from OBIS and GBIF repositories. Uh, and what this particular paper found was that about 7% of the ocean um, surface area is covered by long-term biological observations. Um, and then, of course, I think this audience knows the ocean is a, a vast majority of the habitable ecosystem on our planet. Um, and there's also additional challenges, right? We know that um, at least estimates that NOAA has provided about less than 20% of this region, full region has been explored. And we expect to see that those numbers uh, drop pretty significantly when we're talking about visual observations, either by direct human eyes or uh, by image imaging sensors. Um, and so if we want to fill you know, observational gaps in this sense. And Kana, I think you made a really important point. You know, it's it's not just data that we're interested in 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 uh, processing, but we're also trying to right process this information to provide decision making, or at least the necessary information to make really good decisions. And that could be from the robotics perspective, the management perspective, etc. Uh, but the point is, is at least you know. Of the biological observational tools available to us, um, imaging appears to be one of the most direct methods uh, and, you know, ways in which that data are, are collected is it's just it's just so many different options and opportunities. Uh, the video I'm showing you right now is is visual data collected from remotely operated vehicle platforms. You can see explosions of different types of deployment techniques using drip, drop cameras. AUVs, et cetera. And, and so what that means is, you know, when you're collecting this visual data, you have to um, get meaningful information out of it, right? Convert pixel information into actual data points that can be used to, you know, inform decision-making, be it on a robot or um, with other individuals. And so the, the main action or activity uh, individuals uh, do when they look at this kind of visual data is, right, they do categorization. Um, and that would be categorization of the animals, categorization of the substrate, uh, categorization of also, you know, the, the, the physical and chemical states of the, the particular region as well. But um, that task of categorization is really, really important, uh, but it's also really, really challenging. Um, so, for example... Uh, if you collect about an hour of, of visual data, uh, it could take a visual taxonomy expert anywhere from three to five hours to process that information. Um, never mind that, you know, when I talk about visual taxonomy experts, uh, they tend to specialize in particular, you know, animal groups or substrate types. And so, as you can see with this visual data, there's a lot of information, um, but there's not that many people out there who can convert all of this information right into something meaningful and useful. Um, and so there's no surprise here, but I, I think something that we've learned as a team or as a group is kind of the astonishing state of data already been collected in the community. And I'm gonna go back and see if that, that statistic can be shown. 
Um, but what we know when we queried uh, US-based exploration institutions and uh, what we found is that more than 300,000 hours of video has been collected uh, and less than 15% of that visual data has actually been processed. Um, and if we want to fill these observational gaps, right, uh, especially when we're talking about biological observations, we would anticipate or expect the use of imaging to increase, the use of uh, vehicles to increase, uh, and take your pick what kind of vehicles, but I imagine autonomy is going to be extremely important uh, to help us fill those gaps. Um, so it's not a surprise, and it's not independent of visual data. This is true of all biological observation data. We are just facing a deluge. And I want to talk about this um, also really focusing in on, on visual categorization, because there's an entire field in, in computer vision called fine-grained visual categorization, where one might be able to take an image and convert that image into a particular category, either down to a dog or cat or a stop sign. Uh, but, but what we, at least in the, the, the imaging community is trying to do is to sometimes get categorization down to a genus or species level, because that is at least scientifically what a lot of researchers are looking, looking for. But there's some very, very real challenges for accomplishing that. Um, and I'm only highlighting three. But the reason why I also want to highlight these is this, these aren't just challenges specific to the ocean science community, but these are also challenges that the computer vision community is actively working on from a research perspective. Um, and so the first is distribution shifts. And I think Prasanna talked about this a little bit. It's also known as domain shifts. So the idea that when you, you know, train a, a model and you apply it you train a model on some domain data, you know, that could be data, let's say, collected on the benthos, and you want to apply that same model to data collected uh, in the ocean's midwaters. What that is, is that represents a distribution shift. The performance of your model will most likely uh, deteriorate. Um, and so, and this is true for, you know, different locations, different imaging systems, different days. Uh, and so we see this in 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 both and you know our deployments of these neural networks to try and, and solve this visual categorization problem is distribution shifts is is not a solved problem for the community. Uh, the other thing is the visual appearance of complex structures. We know that at least life in the ocean looks extremely different to life in terrestrial spaces, uh, gelatinous materials, mucus materials. Uh, really big changes in, in their visual uh, character and poses. And so that's really difficult to, to manage as well. Uh, and then also the, the other thing is, you know, biodiversity surveys often require classification to uh, species or genus level. Uh, and so that's really diff difficult for a number of reasons, um, particularly since, right, in the ocean space, uh, researchers are estimating anywhere from 30 to 60 percent of life has yet to be described or unknown to science. And so being able to identify a novel class or a novel type when an AI system, you know, views it is really incredibly important. Um, and so these are not easy challenges. Uh, these are things that uh, I know the computer vision community is working on and things that we need to consider or, or take into um, keep in mind we're trying to build systems that work in the ocean. Um, the other thing I wanted to add too is that, you know, thanks to the NSF funding that we've received, we've done a lot of user-centered design uh, interviews and practices to understand not just what these challenges are for using AI, but also the challenges for the community for implementing it. Uh, I think, um, you know, Patrick showed a really awesome uh, slide that showed these different types of tools, maybe in the research space versus in the um, the consumer uh, slash business space, and you know those types of slides, very useful, can overwhelm a, a user who just really needs to uh, implement an approach. Uh, and so, one of the things that at least our group has started to look more closely at is is trying to figure out ways to kind of create data pipelines, but also keep in mind that humans are the, the one of the most important pieces uh, in order to make stuff like this work. Um, you know, and, and I'm gonna talk, you know, like um, Kana said, there's a lot more to AI than just neural networks. I'm gonna talk about neural networks though. 
Uh, and so, you know, if you want to train a model, you might need to have labeled data. You can train that algorithm. You can generate predictions. But, you know, as Prasanna was saying, you know, uncertainty, sometimes you need humans in the loop, either one way or two way communication. So how do you effectively bring people into these uh, data pipelines? Um, and and so what we've decided to focus on is really thinking about the human AI interface. So how do you get these groups or individuals working really closely together while also considering the fact that, you know, there's not a lot of experts in the world that have the capacity or have the knowledge uh, to identify things from, you know, to species level. Uh, but there's also a lot of people out there in the world who could distinguish between a coral and, and maybe a jellyfish and could at least help kickstart the annotation uh, process. Um, and then uh, again, from the user-centered design, we've recognized that you can't just come up with one, one software solution that solves all the, the widespread uh, needs of a vast user community. Uh, and so what we did, decided to do is chunk this up into uh, bite, more bite-sized pieces that target these particular communities. Um, FathomNet, which uh, I think uh, was this idea of, of data sets and, and making them available. Uh, this is absolutely true. Um, and, and FathomNet is one approach that we can uh, we can take. This is modeled after, after like the COCO and uh, image net approaches and the computer vision community where they aggregate big, big quantities of data uh, that can then be publicly available and used to, to rapidly um, train and iterate on new algorithms. Um, I'm gonna skip this slide because I don't have time. Uh, the second approach is, is thinking about you know, data pipelines, how you lower the, the barriers to utilize machine learning for individuals who have data, have, don't have the time to learn data science uh, you know, uh, um, skill sets, and then also apply uh, models that the community are, is developing on the particular data sets and improve them over time. Um, and last but not least, uh, thinking really creatively about how do you bring more people into this, this problem or this challenge uh, and recognizing that you know, there's expertise in all these different levels. Uh, and so one of the approaches that we've taken, and I know we're not the only ones, there's a group in Ifermer that also has this approach where you're building video games to try and attract really, really broad audiences uh, to you know, be involved in, in community science activities. And so the idea here is that you know, over time, this, this multi-platform approach, you might be able to accumulate the human verification that you need when you need it to then um, export your data. Uh, and so with that, I, I want us to have a bunch of time for a discussion and thank you for the opportunity to share. Uh, thank you, Connie. And thanks to all the speakers. We have a few minutes before lunch for some questions. Um, Let's see. I think the first one has got a uh, number of people uh, uh, support it. Is are there, oh, Rick, go ahead and ask your uh, question. Yeah, hi, this is Rick Murray from uh, Woods Hall. You want to wait for the microphone? Oh, there. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Rick Murray from uh, Woods Hall. Uh, my question is Are there barriers inhibiting applied mathematicians? and data scientists who are not trained in ocean science, but from partnering with ocean scientists. Uh, the biomedical field tends to do this quite well, um, but ocean scientists uh, do not. We have no problem hiring physicists to become physical oceanographers or chemists to become chemical oceanographers, but there's been real hesitation or barriers in terms of bringing in um, data scientists, classically trained, modern trained into that ocean science as well. So I'm just wondering what's going on and are there any, uh, you know, inhibiting barriers? Thank you. Uh, well, maybe I'm, the, the question maybe was for me. Uh, it's, I mean, I, I like to compare this a little bit to um, sort of the different languages. Uh, the previous speaker in the previous session has talked about you know, talking to local communities and bringing everybody on board, you know, talking, maybe talking about similar things and meaning. 
different things. The computer science, of course, community has um, it's there, it takes some patience to you know to talk you know through between the domain scientists about the specific applications and then the the solutions in the computer science space. Um, my, my, Myself, you know, I'm talking to people who develop, um, you know, compilers for for running models on supercomputers. So that's very, it's a really big gap that you have to be patient and be willing to actually, you know, to um, to, to talk together. Um, there may be one issue of incentives also. I'm not sure. Maybe in the um, in the biomedical sector, there's some maybe clear um, clear ideas of um, you know of the of the outcome of the system and and which is maybe not so clear to to explain to computer scientists the role that they could play in you know solving some of the big challenges in ocean sciences and maybe someone else on in our panel has some other ideas but um yeah i think it's really the patience and the willingness to to explain um what we what we need and um and what the other people what the other group can provide to us as a card-carrying computer scientist, if I may, I think part of the problem is exactly what Patrick mentioned, incentives don't exist. And computer scientists are very happy uh, to do their own thing, publish uh, papers. And I know, Pete, you asked that question. I was I couldn't figure out how Slider works, so I'm sorry about that. But this is that response. Um, I, I think computer scientists have a, have a bad habit of, you know, doing things within confined spaces they like. Uh, I'm making a broad brush statement, but I, I, knowing the people I know who are very prominent in computer science, they understand that their incentive scheme is to produce graduate students, papers, and that's it. Yeah. And and I was I am serious that there has to be some incentive to be provided for them to go out and smell the ocean. If they don't, they don't understand what the issue is. 95% of the time when I give a talk to my colleagues in computer science, and I'm here in Europe, I just gave a talk in, in probably the most prestigious uh, AI robotics lab in, in, the, in Europe called LAS. Um, they were asking fundamental questions. They're sort of interested. Uh, they get it that you know climate change and the fact that this has an impact on the ocean, that's really important, but they, their incentives are limited. So I, I I get what Rick is saying that, oh, this was done there. The thing with computer scientists, so pardon my being a little blunt, I've always thought that NSF should add a C, it's National Computer Science Foundation because they give tons of money to computer scientists. I think they should reverse that and make it into an ocean science. So there should be an O instead of a C, N O S F. So it, it really is, there, there's too much money going into computer science. And I get it that, you know, you can monetize it. You can, you, the, the politicians are happy. You, economy is doing great, but they're not really looking at fundamental questions in, in, in that's important for civilization. And, and I'm, I'm blunt about it. And I'm blunt about it, not just because I'm with ocean scientists here, but also with Peter smiling because he knows I'm blunt. So, um, and, and that Connie, is the case. The only one. You're not the only one who said that. In fact, I was at CVPR last year and one of their keynote speakers said the same thing. Yeah. Um, so exactly. Um, I, I did want to add to that too. I mean, the incentives are different because uh, at least when, you know, it's a pu very, pu pu we're all publish or perish, right? But in their case, it's published every six months, you know, a big important conference paper and either the, you know, CVPRs or NeurIPS of the world. And that often doesn't align with, you know, the time it takes for us to, to accomplish projects. Um, and the other thing too, is the medical community, they actually, despite the sensitivity of data, uh, they've, at least that community has made that data available for computer vision experimentation. Um, if you go to the computer vision conferences, it's almost like every other talk is focused on some new data, data set. Uh, that people can use and play with and apply, you know, their their, their algorithms to. Um, and so being sure that we're making our data accessible to that community specifically is 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 also a, a challenge, um, which is, again, a reason why we focus so much on, on building FathomNet, because we want to entice that community to, you know, use our data to answer really important questions that we can then apply the state of the art algorithms to in the ocean. And if I could add a little bit more following that um, to respond to Rick is, 
I think we have a generational issue also. The younger people who are coming in are much more clued in, much more interested, much more focused on doing something about the environment, the ocean included. So I think we have an opportunity, or rather NSF does have an opportunity to attract them into, into the ocean sciences. So it's not all gloom and doom. I think they're, they're, our generation was a little bit different because our motives and incentives are different. Okay, you know, unfortunately, you're beyond. No, yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm sorry, we have to cut this off. We've got a really packed agenda, but I wanted to thank all four speakers. It was very interesting, and I'm sure. Uh, it's given us a lot of things to think about uh, on how to get AI better used in uh, ocean science. So our next panel is one that I am very excited about because we're going to talk about ocean solutions and in particular, what it looks like to co-design and co-develop those. Um, uh, those of you who are on the committee, uh, there is a, a tab eight in your briefing book um, that gives you a little bit of background and um, maybe you've had a chance to have a look at those materials, but, but thank you for um, the folks who organized the session for making those available. Um, and we have four panelists for this particular panel. All four of them are going to be virtual. And I'm going to wait just a little bit more for the committee members to pilot, uh, to, to shuffle their way back. There we go. I'm gonna just look if there is more. I'm just doing a play-by-play -play for those of you who are on Zoom. Time to come back to all. All right, I found the rest of the committee. Okay, um, and so we have uh, Rosie Allegato, Kristen Olson, Katie Arkema, and Charlie Pybon on this particular panel. And I see some of those names already on the Zoom. Do I see Rosie? Rosie, are you online with us? There you are, yes. I am, I'm here. So great to have you, Rosie. Uh, Rosie from the University of Hawaii. It looks like you're the first one on our panel discussion and just about everyone is back here in the room. So we are ready for you when you are. Great, I have some slides to share. I have shared them with um, the staff and um, just out of an awareness of time, the slides that I shared with my staff, there's actually more than I, I'm, I'm gonna just be much briefer if I can. So I'm gonna share screen. <clears throat> And hopefully this all works. We'll see. No. Okay. Can you guys see what kind of looks like a ladder? Yep, we can. Okay, great. Um, so let's see. Um, I titled this little presentation, co-production and co-design. I'm particularly going to be focusing on indigenous communities, but I wanted to start off with some general terms that I think my co-panelists will expand upon. So the idea, the really underlying idea behind why we kind of might want to do um, co-production is to engage with um, communities or different entities. And this is um, Sherry Arnstein's Ladder of Partic Citizen Participation, which was developed in 1969. And it really shows the spectrum and what we might actually call it from non-participation of citizens to varying degrees of tokenism to really giving communities agency and power. And I would say that our goal, or at least the goal of the research that I've been working on in my expertise is to really hit around level seven, that partnership. But I encourage you to um, read this article. It's very enlightening. Um, and the idea is when you have this, the participation is partnership, that really occurs when you have public institutions, officials, researchers allowing citizens and communities to negotiate, to have power sharing, to share funding, put forward requests. 
again, this is very general. Um, I just want to kind of set up the mindset if you're going to go into doing co production and co design is it's important, but it's not always the answer. It's not a checkbox, it's a means to an end, and it will require significant commitment of time, energy, and resources, no matter who you're doing your co-production with, whether or not it's industry or indigenous communities. Um, and priority should be given to the process of how it's gonna take place, no matter what that means. Uh, it should be specific. It should be done in the context of a particular decision-making or research question. You wanna establish what your standards are, and recognize that it's going to be really specific to whatever the whoever the parties are the entities that are involved it should support adaptive learning through both formal procedures and evaluate that and um, in this last column i have rights holders i use that word specifically in in the case of indigenous people because the word stakeholders can have negative connotations but the idea is that there should be some focus on building meaningful connections and collaborations that harkens back to not wanting to be in the bottom part of this ladder. And um, decision making should be shared. It should include respect and values at all of all perspectives. And there should be an understanding of reciprocity. Um, again, this is also very general. Um, and I'm happy to share these slides. And, and I believe the staff has these flat slides. Um, when you do kind of like a bets hits literature review, there are a lot of common um, important elements that are hallmarks of what makes a successful co-production process. This looks like word salad or word bingo, um, but I encourage you later to go through it, but it is a wide variety. There are many elements is the bottom line from critical reflection, flexibility to leadership, ongoing dialogue and innovation. Okay. I wanted to, before switching into more specifically about um, the academics and, and working with indigenous communities, I wanted to acknowledge, however, this is a big challenge for many academics to involve in. And these are what I consider um, some of the major challenges to having effective academic involvement with anybody, with community, anything, anybody outside of the academy. Um, the first is, Let's recognize that we do not have a formalized training mechanism um, for facilitating co-production. A lot of academics don't feel prepared to engage. Um, particularly when we look at career, young researchers will see riskiness um, in being engaged in transdisciplinary research, particularly those who want to stay in academia. And often it's because this transdisciplinarity is seen as an add-on. Um, and what they're meant to be doing is hardcore research. It's hard to measure the success of co-production if you don't have a lot of specific uh, measures. It can be hard to publish um, co-production research, and these publications can often be seen or viewed by the mainstream as subpar, which is not always the case. Um, there is often on the institutional level a disconnect between what institutions say they want, like they say they want engaged faculty, and practices that reward fa faculty who engage in co-production. Um, it is also viewed not always as cutting edge in the conventional sense in terms of technologies, because it is very people oriented, which is very, very old school, um, um, but can be innovated in other ways. And then conventional measures might not indicate that the co-produced science is legitimate or credible. So I wanted to spend some time on this before launching into adding yet another layer of complexity, which is research with indigenous communities. And I'm going to spend the rest of my um, time, I'm going to try and speak quickly so that my panelists, my co-panelists have time to, to really have good discussion on the specific process that I have had a role in co-producing, which is called Kula Nanoi. And, um, this work I have not done by myself. This work is indeed co-produced and co-developed between myself, Katie Hinson, Brenda Asuncion from Kua Aina Ulu Awamo, which is a nonprofit, Miwa Tamanaha, as well as Sarah Kahanamoku. And this is the um, watershed of Heeya, which is where uh, this was really developed. And I want to provide some specific examples for you. The reason why we developed this process for engaging with indigenous Hawaiian communities um, is because this in Hawaii and writ large in other kind of communities, oftentimes where marine research takes place and ocean science can take place, is that these can be sites of parachute science and scientific colonialism. So we know there are several studies that have come out beginning to look at this, also known as parachute science. 
This is the practice of obtaining data or resources from other countries while not returning research outputs. And it's beginning to lead in recognizing a scientific colonialism. And this is something that we need to be really careful of, particularly in ocean sciences, as we have so many observational systems that are remotely located. And recent studies on parachute science, particularly, for example, in the Coral Triangle, shows the extent of externally driven research across Oceania. And we saw this happening also in Hawaii, and we wanted to understand, is it happening here? And how can we you know, change the tide of that? We we'll also want to recognize that people and places matter a lot in research. It's particularly noticeable among Indigenous communities. Um, I am an Indigenous person, and many of us have strong connections to the land as a central tenant of our culture and um, our cultural and spiritual practices. And um, basically, to put it simply, the land is the basis for Indigenous knowledge in Hawaii and relationships help us to grow and apply that knowledge to contemporary issues. I just wanted to cite this federal guidance, the OSTPCQ guidance on Indigenous knowledge, that further recognizes centrality of place and relationships in research with Indigenous people. So this really brings the need to do co-produced research, which is situated in place to the fore. Um, and it's really calling for practices that allow both tribes and indigenous peoples, as well as the scientific community to benefit from the research. And to do that, we have to take a place based people centric approach. So again, why the community researcher relationships? It's because we one of the questions we asked ourselves in developing the process I'm going to share with you is how do we as re university researchers build equitable relationships with Hawaiian and local communities in Hawaii? And what expectations do communities have for these collaborations? And how do we hold ourselves accountable and responsible for the work we do in communities in place? It's just simply a matter of you know, ethical practice. Again, I can't underemphasize that all of the things that I'm going to talk about today were developed and co-developed um, with the purpose of establishing really wonderful relationships in this place um, called Heia. This is the setting from which Kulana Nui'i grew. It's a very active community. There's a strong presence of nonprofits and Native Hawaiian stewards, and it's a place of overlapping government and academic spheres of interest. The University of Hawaii Marine Biology, uh, National Sentinel Site, the National Estuarine Research Reserve, Resilient Lands and Waters. It's a, con it's a confluence of academia, community, and government. And there are many potential opportunities, but there were many challenges and potential for miscommunication and when all of these entities interact. And so it was a really amazing case study and also a place that we were really connected to. And we were approached by the stewards of Heia Fish Pond, which is in the foreground from Paipayo Heia, with a request to develop a set of protocols to encourage more reciprocal research practices. Um, so this is a longstanding kind of project that began in 2014 with our nonprofit partner, Kua Aina Uluawamo, that they facilitated community meetings in partnership with Sea Grant. We have held several workshops with stewards, the community and researchers. Um, we gathered all of that information, their desires for what good researcher relationship looked like. We also did, of course, a broader body of academic literature search because this has been done in the medical field and in the social science field, but has not really been applied towards the geosciences. And um, this was our end goal, was to understand that we have actually different cultures, right? We have an academic researcher culture that has its individual interests, needs, and issues, and there's community issues, needs. We run on grant cycles. They run on intergenerational cycles, often within um, indigenous communities. But what we're looking to do is to leverage these to create that equitable sweet spot. I just wanted to uh, do one more little side note parenthetical explanation because I don't like to use Hawaiian words without explaining what they mean. Um, kulana, which is the first word you saw, means what is your station, what is your stance, what is your attitude? In other words, how do you, how are you, what's your, how are you walking around in the community? Are you kind of like ashamed of how you're acting? You just want to get in and out, or are you proud of how you act? And noi'i means to investigate, to do research or examine. So those together really mean what are our research standards? And so 
based on the intake that we had from the facilitated com um, committees, from the stewardship meetings we had, from the broader research, we distilled that down because again, we wanted to apply that from social science and biomedical community-based participatory research to geoscience. We distilled that down to eight kulana. And with that came best practices. And I think what really makes our process interesting is it comes with guiding questions for both communities and researchers. And because it's not a checklist and it's, an, it's a question process that requires dialogue, it's flexible enough for broad application. Again, I want to emphasize um, the process that we came up with is not a compliance standard. It's not like your IRB, it's not a checklist for achieving reciprocal community partnership. It's a set of ideas and values. So you can kind of see that um, it, it, there are many elements that we just kind of organically developed that have um, that have similar um, the elements for successful co-production. It's a set of ideas, values, and behaviors that when applied alongside hard work builds more just and generative relationship. Again, we organized those four, those eight into four, two groups of four. One is called Building and Nurturing Pilina. Pilina means relationship. And those four, which are really the beginning relationships are, they're gonna seem really obvious, but in practice, they're quite hard. Respect, reciprocity, self-awareness um, and capacity are, what is our self-awareness and capacity and communication. I could give like a whole training on this and I have, but the second, part is once you've established that relationship, what is the iterative process for maintaining that? And we call that a'o aku or a'o mai, which means teach and learn, or aloha aku, aloha mai, which means affection given and affection received. And you can see we use a lot of our cultural language because it's important for us to articulate these in the cultural values of Hawaii. It's maintaining a long-term focus on what the community needs. It's creating community engagement and co-review processes. Um, it's having agreements around knowledge, stewardship, and government, and it's actually putting in a process for accountability. Um, so there are many several models for indigenous data sharing. I'm not going to go over all of them, but that is, I think, an area that um, if we're going to engage in that as an ocean sciences community and for NSF, we really need to begin to adopt and operationalize um, indigenous data sharing into our data management plans. And I know that a lot of our data management involves adhering to the care principle, the FAIR principles, which is findable, accessible, interoperable, and replicable. But um, the Global Indigenous Data Alliance has also developed CARES principles, which are um, complementary to FAIR and can be used together. And CARE stands for Collective Benefit, Authority to Control, Responsibility, and Ethics. And I would really strongly encourage um, that we begin to adopt and think about how to operationalize care. In my role on the Ocean Studies Board, this is one of my key issues that I always bring up. Um, we have done this in Sea Grant. Um, we have recognized that we have a responsibility to ensure that the programs and projects that we support, because Hawaii Sea Grant is a grant making entity, they need to engage in collaboratively mutual benefit partnership with communities. And so we have made training of this Kulana Nui process mandatory for PIs as well as grad students. Um, this is actually an old slide. It says that more than 600 community members have been trained. We are now approaching 900 and it says 35 workshops and we're now approaching almost 50 workshops. So we have been acting as a capacity and network builder. But I do want to say, just want to end with this, that funders are a key player in ensuring accountability. Um, that is one of the key places where we can build in um, how well and how the metrics of um, how successful co-production is. They have a responsibility to invest in reciprocal research practices and avoid an investment in extractive research. What I've shared with you today is just one example of a strategy for encouraging this. And um, we're hoping that in the future, funders such as NSF can support place-based and indigenous-led research. And we want to say that um, there is more here than just for the funders. Um, there are institutional mechanisms for accountability, and this is not a new conversation. It's definitely been ramping up, and I wanted to give acknowledgement that in December um, 2022, the White House released the first of its kind guidance on Indigenous knowledge, which is meant to help federal agencies incorporate Indigenous knowledge into their work. 
from research to environmental rulemaking to co-management of lands and waters. And it has to be implemented, of course, at national, state, and local levels um, and to the unique context in which these um, really exist. And I also wanted to share that um, we really need to refront, reframe how we can um, implement these strategies. Okay, so just want to leave you with my contact information as well as the contact of the other members of my Sea Grant Center, which I am really privileged to be a director of, and references, and I'm happy again to share um, all of these with the committee. Mahalo. Excellent. Mahalo to you, Rosie. Thank you very much for this great presentation. I love that you included the references as well. I really appreciate some of those are papers that I have not read yet, so we will definitely get to work on that. Um, next is Kristen Olson uh, from Pacific Risa. Kristen, are you online? Okay, yes, I am here. Okay, um, let's see if I can share my screen. I assume, can you see? Yes, we can see okay. your slide. Terrific. So hello, um, my name is Kirsten Olson, and for the past eight years, I've been part of the PI team for the Pacific RESA program. Um, Pacific RESA is one of 11 um, funded, hold on a second, got to make advance the slide, is one of the uh, funded by NOAA CAP RESA program. It's one of 11 national programs. CAP programs are competitive five-year multi-institutional transdisciplinary research collaborations that work with regional and local decision makers, natural resource managers, and communities to generate, transform, and translate climate information into practical adaptation tools and plans. Our coverage um, of the Pacific RESA is Hawaii and the US affiliated Pacific Islands, and we've been fully funded by NOAA for 13 years. Our core team includes two co-directors, the lead PIs, two project specialists, a program coordinator, a communications guru, and a sustained assessment specialist, all of whom work full-time on projects under the program umbrella, as well as seven academic PIs and their students. CAP um, programs co-develop research with partners. So research supported under the current PAPRISA includes projects on a variety of topics, water resources and policy, climate health migration, ecosystems and biodiversity. We create the regional climate assessments of use to our Pacific Island neighbors, um, focus on compound extremes and vulnerability, coastal hazard assessments, my field, which is natural capital and nature-based solutions and integrated vulnerability and exposure. But what binds this research um, we do to social change are engaged scientists who have built stable relationships with decision makers to develop meaningful policy outcomes that prepare society for climate change. Without these elements, we don't get to science-informed policy change. In all cases, we strive to involve project partners who are the ultimate users of information in all aspects of the project design, development, and outputs. What co-development co looked like, what co-production looked like in each case has differed, of course. Um, it's included things like writing the research proposals together, co-authoring peer-reviewed publications or white papers and reports. Um, it always has a, an element of sustained communication and iterative development of objectives, outputs, methods, and um, informing policies and plans um, or serving as a critical voice. All of those are kind of the different ways that co-production can look. And it's co-production is not straightforward and it doesn't always look the same, It's but it is always more than a full-time job for uh, the staff members. So we end up focusing on um, where co-production is most effective and meaningful and um, being really careful of not overburdening smaller agencies and communities um, in asking them to be partners in co-production. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my current experience with co-production. So I spent the last weekend on Kauai um, with my master's students. We joined over a thousand people in a human chain to rebuild the stone wall of the Alakoko um, fish pond, a traditional Hawaiian fish pond. Fish ponds have been used by Native Hawaiians for centuries to grow food, but most fell into disrepair after colonization. They used to play a key role in food security 
and their restoration could be vital to community resilience in a changing climate. So we were there to build a wall, um, but really to build our relationship with the community-based organization restoring the fish pond. Being present, hearing stories from the families working alongside us, observing the water, the fish, the birds, listening to the staff and the volunteers talk about their questions and hopes, we began to build a common understanding of what questions they wanted answered and locally appropriate ways we can go about answering them as scientists. My team and the County of Kauai Planning Department are interested in understanding how different approaches to nature-based adaptation are conferring resilience as defined by the communities themselves. What's working, where, and why? And how can policies support these efforts? But we're only gonna get to that broader lesson through partnerships, and we will only gain partnerships through building trust and rock walls. <laughs> um, so the, I wanted to like zoom out to the broader program, the PACRISA program, and talk a little bit about how using the formula of um, engaged scientists building genuine relationships um, uh, have, been, have led to meaningful policy outcomes. So for example, we've been engaged with the County of Kauai for years, working on coastal retreat. So my colleagues organized a peer-to-peer -peer learning exchange between the County of Kauai and Boston, which helped accelerate Kauai's setback zoning legislation. What took Boston many, many years took Kauai less than a year to accomplish, thanks to this peer-to-peer -peer learning. The program also developed a groundwater recharge model that was used by Maui's Department of Water Supply um, to justify limiting extraction permits in, in actually in the area that was recently devastated by the wildfire. The model was then transferred to Guam where it catalyzed legislative action to protect the Northern Aquifer from military exploitation. In all these cases, it's important to note the critical role of legal scholars in the team to achieve policy impacts. So co-production and engagement is like tending a garden. It takes patience, persistence, and presence. You have to build genuine relationships, not just throw money at communities. And it speaks to the need to have uh, dedicated engagement staff. Researchers in the team um, are, are, that are champions of, of multiple issues can persistently advocate when they perceive a gap and be ready to step in when the policy window opens. And rather than focus on all the barriers to co-production and engagement that drive my team crazy, um, no mention of university fiscal processes, for instance, I'll focus instead on some of the attributes that have led to impacts under the PACRISA. Um, first and foremost are sustained interactions. These are non-extractive in nature, no parachute science, but a genuine commitment and shared values. Um, transdisciplinary co-development uh, co and collaboration where natural and social scientists team up with legal scholars, agency partners, and community members throughout the process of the project. And moreover, the team needs to be really sensitive to the external political, geographic, cultural context. Secondly, a really important point is the flexibility um, of the grant. It needs to be nimble. It has to be able to catalyze creative thinking, be open to unconventional partnerships, methods, and implementation approaches, and responsive to opportunities as they arise. And finally, uh, we need to reward applied science and non-peer-reviewed outputs. If we want to um, leverage social change, we need to have partnerships with agency, industry, and communities to accelerate uptake and value things like testimony um, and other impactful engagement activities. Oops, my mouse is going crazy, of course. Um, okay, so coming, um, kind of zooming out to what we're talking about today of ocean solutions, um, the, you know, these reflections from the PACRISA experience uh, will need, need to, take, um, you know, we need to kind of think deeply about them because the co-production and engagement in the ocean space is going to require extensive levels of collaboration that are very different um, to what NSF is used to. Um, ocean issues like fishing, deep sea mining, um, large-scale marine protected areas are international in nature. 
They may also involve deeply ethical and legal issues, for instance, related to human and indigenous people's rights. Um, we're gonna need to, uh, as well, if we're, if we're moving towards solutions, um, support's gonna need to extend into the long term, not just doing the science, not even just doing the science to policy, but then through the morass of policy implementation. So I'll conclude with kind of five ideas. If NSF, if NSF really wants its research to lead to policy and so, um, societal change, you know, if they want ocean solutions, not just science, co-production will be key. This will mean that we um, need meaningful and sustained engagement to build credibility and trust, um, non-extractive co-development of projects, engagement has to be embedded in the project plan with dedicated personnel and budget. And um, we need to re recognize that it's gonna require time and resources to build and sustain relationships. Secondly is this point about flexibility and um, nimbleness of the grants. We wanna be able to jump onto opportunities when they present themselves and try new things. Um, and the community partners have to be paid and engagement activities have to be funded. Third, um, we need to expand the grants to increase attention to um, potential for societal uptake. Allow non-academic PIs, include legal scholars, fund those community partners, um, partner with the applied agencies to, uh, to accelerate uptake and reward um, these methods of uh, um, amplifying research outside of peer-reviewed publications. The fourth point is that um, we need detailed pathways to broader impacts. I've done a lot of broader impact statements in, in my life and, and reviewed many more, um, but we really need fleshed out uh, program theories of change that include co-production and engagement to reach societal impacts, not just the scientific output. And they should go beyond the generic um, to be really specific to the community so that activities connect to locally and culturally specific solutions. And finally, the evaluation plans for projects. Projects should include um, broad evaluation plans that are based on the well-articulated theory of change and include locally and culturally meaningful impact metrics. And the outcomes of co-production and engagement acti activities should be part of the evaluation. Um, thank you very much. Those are uh, my thoughts uh, and I look forward to the discussion. Excellent. Thank you very much, Kirsten. Thank you. Um, next, we have Katie Arkema from the Pacific Northwest Nat National Lab. There you are, Katie. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. OK, I'm going to share my slide. Are you able to see them? Yes, we can. Great. All right. So I just titled this talk um, the same as the, the name of the session today. And I like to start um, talking about my research by putting forward this um, graphic of Pasteur's quadrant, which um, I'm sure is familiar to many of you um, in this um, working group today. Um, it is a good sort of example of what is often called transdisciplinary research. And a key element of transdisciplinary research is the co-production of knowledge, which is um, a central theme of our session. Transdisciplinary research includes solutions-oriented science. Um, it's most often interdisciplinary, and it also includes um, uh, research and policy outputs. Uh, and this is exemplified uh, well in Donald Stokes' book that came out in the late um, 1990s, where he talks about Louis Pasteur's work on bacteria microbiology um, and links to vaccination as a, as a good example of research that really is at both, both the cutting edge and, um, and very solution oriented. He doesn't talk very much about, however, the process for going through co-producing that knowledge and how we can work um, as groups of scientists, practitioners, community members, and different kinds of decision makers to do this work. And so I wanted to offer today two examples of co-design and co-developed research that 
I've been engaged in. Um, the first is around nature-based solutions to climate mitigation and adaptation. And this is work that um, I was involved in uh, and am still involved in in the Caribbean, especially in Belize and the Bahamas, um, with many collaborators of mine at the Natural Capital Project based at Stanford University, where I used to um, uh, where I used to work prior to joining the Pacific Northwest National Lab. And I'll also talk a bit about uh, some work I'm doing now with renewable energy transitions in remote coastal and islanded communities. Um, and for the first topic, I'll focus really on the work in Belize, but you'll probably see some, some graphics filtered in from the Bahamas. And in the second um, section, I'll talk primarily about our work with the city of Bainbridge Island. So this, this first topic around nature-based solutions, um, there these are a sort of potentially powerful approaches that involve blue carbon ecosystems and strategies. And they're powerful for climate resilience overall because protection, restoration, and management of coastal ecosystems like salt marsh, seagrass, mangroves can both store and sequester carbon and also help to provide climate adaptation co-benefits such as nursery um, and adult habitat for fisheries, tourism and recreation um, opportunities, coastal risk reduction, water quality, and so forth. So we're able to, um, to sort of incorporate multiple goals and, out and outcomes when we are um, exploring the potential of nature-based solutions for climate resilience. However, um, in the context of the work I'm gonna be talking about today, uh, putting forward targets for those nature-based solutions, especially in the context of the nationally determined contributions that countries are putting forward under the, um, in order to meet the goals under the Paris Climate Accord, is very difficult to do. Actually having quantitative targets that not only uh, tackle the carbon storage and climate mitigation portion of this, but also answer questions around um, sort of actual implementation to achieve uh, climate adaptation co-benefits um, is not something that is kind of universally done in those uh, existing NDCs. And so we um, uh, sort of aim to tackle this problem um, working with our colleagues in, the Bel in Belize. And Belize is a leading country in coastal and ocean management. It's located on the Caribbean coast um, of Central America. And it is particularly progressive in, in planning for the sustainability of natural resources. And I've worked closely with my colleagues in the Belize Coastal Zone Management Authority and Institute um, in the central government uh, for about the last 15 years. And a lot of the work that we've done involves um, developing and applying models for quantifying benefits of coastal ecosystems for coastal community uh, resilience. And so our colleagues in Belize came to us and said, we wanna build on this past work that we've done together to tackle this issue around developing targets for nature-based solutions. Um, and this truly was a transdisciplinary research team that involved um, members from uh, local and international NGOs, the, the government of Belize, funders, and a whole suite of um, scientists from a variety of different disciplines. And one of the first um, sort of key aspects of co-developed and co-designed research is really figuring out, well, what are those research questions that are both interesting from a science perspective and actually tackle the challenges that people on the ground are facing? And so these are the two that we, we um, kind of iterated on and, and came to together. And those are, what are the carbon mitigation and adaptation co-benefits produced by a range of potential blue carbon targets? And where should policies and actions be prioritized to provide a rich combination of, of co-benefits? Um, and so that, that first bullet is really around like, what does Belize want in terms of its ambition um, in, its, uh, in its NDCs towards, towards meeting those, those Paris global goals? And then um, the second question is really aware. So where do we actually implement these actions? Uh, and our approach was to use um, uh, sort of an iteration of both engagement, and I like to think about this sort of onion when I think about engagement, 
where there's a core group um, that are, you know, many of whom are on the, the previous slide that I showed that are, they're meeting and, you know, maybe remotely weekly and in touch quite um, continuously. And then there's sort of like engagement with uh, the broader um, community of leaders and, and coastal planners and um, sort of private sector. So what we, we sort of um, pursued uh, in terms of our, our collaboration uh, between scientists and decision makers in Belize was to iterate between that larger engagement with a broader community and um, using, uh, in this case, a set of um, uh, social ecological models called INVEST that allow us to quantify the benefits that coastal ecosystems can provide to, to communities in Belize and beyond. And one of the things I wanted to mention here is not only in this work um, and my other work in the Caribbean and Latin America and here in the US, um, one of the things that comes up over and over again is this idea of in situ engagement. So it's about not necessarily having new events where you're bringing people in, but instead really going and meeting people where they're at. So showing up at cafes, showing up at community centers, um, having just open houses in, in churches, for example, and, and having the materials where people can come in and, um, and engage with the material, but not where you're having them um, sort of take time out of their normal day to do that. Also, um, conducting different kinds of exercises. We've done a lot of participatory mapping um, where community members are, are sort of drawing how they see the situation now and what they want for the future um, of the places where they live and they work. Um, and then one of the things that's very important is being really clear and communicating back how community inputs were integrated into the process. So not just assuming that because you've done that, um, that's sufficient, but that you actually need to also be communicating how you've done that and bringing it back to people. And so I'm not going to dig into the sort of uh, research results, but I did just want to show that uh, one of the things that we found that's particularly helpful is when co-design and co-produced research in incorporates multiple different potential outcomes that, that cross different um, sectors and cross different disciplines and are measured with different kinds of metrics, and that's because that brings more diverse audiences to the decision-making table. Um, We've also found that like having results that um, show uh, where certain actions can be taken and not just the sort of amount of an action that should be taken is where this becomes useful from an implementation perspective. So Belize is now um, working on developing their mangrove restoration and conservation plans based on a lot of this research. That's the follow-up to the update to their nationally determined contribution. So having maps showing where things can be um, sort of most effectively done is, uh, is helpful. Um, and as I mentioned initially, we have one of the things that I like to do in my work is think about both the science outputs for the scientists and the researchers. So getting this work published and validated through the peer review process, and also ensuring that it's um, designed, that it's actually gonna be useful from a policy perspective. And so this work helped to inform Belize's most recent update to their nationally um, determined contributions submitted to the UNFCCC. Um, and that includes two time bound targets for blue carbon, um, strategies. The first is protection of 12,000 hectares of mangroves beyond the existing protected areas by 2030. And the second is restoration of at least 4,000 hectares of mangroves by 2030. One of the other things I wanted to mention, and this, this map is actually from our work on, on coastal risk reduction in the Bahamas, um, but one of the things that we found is that going ahead and developing simple interactive web-based tools for um, our partners in, um, in the region to use how they would like to use it for communicating to a wider audience of their colleagues and for capacity building um, can be really effective. So it's sort of a way for people to engage with the, the data and with the analysis and really also get under the hood so that the work that's being done is less of a black box and more something that is um, informed and, and then can be iterated on and improved based on, on people's feedback. 
Okay, so I'm just gonna, I have just a couple of slides um, on the, the renewable energy transitions in remote coastal and islanded communities. Um, I wanted to talk just a little bit about some work we're doing with Bainbridge Island um, in Washington state. Um, City of Bainbridge Island has two key goals for its renewable energy transition. One is that they want to be 100% renewable by 2040, which is ahead of the Washington state goal, and also increased energy resilience for emergencies and climate change. And Bainbridge um, sort of exemplifies challenges that coastal communities are facing all across the country and all across the world. And that's that um, places that are already sort of at risk for loss of power are becoming more at risk for that as we're seeing increases in, in coastal natural disasters. Um, and a lot of these, um, in the case of Bainbridge, it's an island. In the case of the Macaw tribe, um, where I'm working in Nia Bay, it's more remote. Um, and so these conditions, uh, are sort of leading them to think, I think in some ways much more on the cutting edge than, than say many cities are doing about um, sort of local gener generation of energy using new renewable energy technologies. And it's because getting that in a lot of places sort of have to import um, uh, power and it could be, sorry, import fuel and it can be very costly. Um, and in the case of other places, they're at the end of really sort of fragile transmission lines. And so if they can locally generate renewable um, energy, it's a way to tackle both the sort of decarbonization goals and the local resilience um, goals. And so this is some work that I'm I'm working on, it's funded by the Department of Energy. Um, it's with not only the Pacific Northwest National Lab, but also the Renewable Energy La National Lab. Uh, and other sort of community-based energy uh, uh, partners. And one of the things that's unique about this program, um, it's Bainbridge is just one of it, many communities that's involved in it, is that it's technology agnostic. And so what that means is that we're not going in and saying, hey, community, we wanna test out this like, um, you know, solar uh, option. We're not going in and saying, hey, we want to test out this distributed wind option. We're hearing from the communities, what kinds of technologies are you interested in and how do these interact with your coastal and ocean environment and the values of, of, of your community that you want to uphold. The other thing is that um, communities apply into this program so again, it's not the Department of Energy seeking out communities um, or places to test technologies, it's communities raising their hand and saying, we wanna work with scientists to figure out um, sort of potential pathways for meeting our energy goals. Um, and the latest kind of aspect of this is beginning to incorporate other non-energy considerations. So in development of new renewable energy, how do we also consider um, outcomes in terms of um, uh, sort of impacts on other benefits that people want from coastal and ocean systems, like the ones that I showed for the Belize example. So recreation, tourism opportunities, fisheries related outcomes, coastal risk reduction related, related outcomes. Um, and I'm not gonna go through this, but this is just to say that um, one of the key parts of any many of the co-produced and, and, and co-designed work that I've been involved in is this kind of development of pathways or development of scenarios. And it's where I find that the science, science and, the, and the sort of practice um, elements or applied elements of the work really kind of collide. And that's, that, is that's in this sort of like quantitative and qualitative scenario space where we're, sort of um, for me as a scientist, uh, listening to community members say, these are the things that I wanna explore. These are the potential solutions that we're interested in. And then figuring out, okay, how do we now bring some, some analysis, some interdisciplinary research to help answer which one of these pathways or scenarios might be most useful um, to move forward on. Um, I think, Maybe it was Rosie that that mentioned this. I can't remember, but I um, one of the things that that I've often um, uh, sort of or groups that I've worked with and I have often thought about and struggled with is sort of understanding what the impact is of co-designed and co-developed 
um, research. And this is a graphic um, from some paper from colleagues of mine at the Natural Capital Project at Stanford. And this is one way of thinking about potential increases in impact. And this first pathway here on the left is the conduct research pathway. So results are produced, they're published, they're disseminated. This is almost often thought of as kind of the end goal of a traditional research or academic research, but really in, in I, you know, in sort of co-designed, co-developed research, this is often the first step. And then how can that analysis be used to change perspectives in a place? So for example, in our work in the Bahamas, people there really weren't thinking a whole lot about nature-based solutions um, about 10 years ago when we first started working there. And then a number of hurricanes and a number of collaborations and, and ma major efforts by all kinds of you know, local and international NGOs and scientists had really kind of changed the conversation in the Bahamas um, and, and highlighted the importance of nature-based solutions. In this pathway three, when is research, when is analysis, when is sort of the um, solutions-oriented perspective of, of the sort of community part of this work, when does that all come together to generate action? Um, and so maybe that's it's informed plans or policies um, maybe it's led to new financing mechanisms. And then ultimately where we really want to get, which is this sort of outcomes. So have we even improved the way that, um, in this case, biodiversity and ecosystem services is considered or the health of, of nature-based, um, uh, the health of ecosystems that are providing nature-based solutions and improved outcomes for human well-being. And so I just want to end with this sort of challenges, successes, um, and the future of, of, of co-produced research um, with a few things that I find in particularly important. One is the importance of investing in iteration and long-term relationships. And we've all we've all really emphasized this, but but I sort of I want to add to that by saying it happens on all different scales. So often within just a single project over the course of the year you're constantly scoping and rescoping and sort of reminding each other why you're working together. And so that, that needs like process and investment um, in that iteration. And then there's iteration over years and decades where we've developed these long-term relationships and then community leaders come and say, we wanna build on this last thing that we did and now we wanna do this new thing, um, like I talked about in Belize. Um, I think this sort of like scenario development space is where really like the rubber meets the road for scientists and, and practitioners and communities working together. And that needs to include both qualitative and quantitative approaches. Um, there's a lot to sort of dig into here, but I think this is an area that, that um, really is fruitful for um, advancing our research space for co-produced co research. Um, the importance of exploring multiple interdisciplinary outcomes that resonate with diverse audiences is really key. Um, and then supporting capacity building for community scientists and decision makers. Um, and that's community so they can best in engage in this work um, so that resources are, 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 are made available for, for communities to build capacity to actually fund um, positions for people to specifically engage in, in co-produced research to advance some of the goals that they have. Um, the fact that scientists aren't, often aren't trained is something that, that we talked about here. Um, I teach a class at the University of Washington through my joint appointment there. It's specifically with professional master's students um, working through like on the ground examples of how science, science can be brought to inform some of these sort of major decision challenges. Um, and those professional um, master's level students will be the ones that are in agencies, NGOs, um, other kinds of community-based organizations that can actually use this work going forward in their professional careers. And then of course, decision makers, they need capacity building to understand how do we actually help to foster these kinds of teams. So that's my last slide and I'll end there. Excellent, thank you, Katie. You covered a lot, thank you very much. And last but not least, we have Charlie Pybon from the Surfrider Foundation. Hey, thanks for having me. And I will try to share my screen. 
uh, when I realized everybody was doing PowerPoints, I didn't. Well, you don't have to. You can be special. Well, I uh, prefer not to look at myself. It just messes with my <laughs> head while I try and present. So I'm just going to give you guys a slide that has a picture of me. Um, so I don't have to look at myself talk while I talk to you guys. Um, thanks for having me. My name is Charlie Plyben. I'm the Oregon Policy Manager for Surfrider Foundation. Um, I, a uh, little disclaimer, I am not an academic. I, I don't consider myself a scientist. Um, and um, I don't have a lot of letters behind my name or have not spent a lot of time uh, in the ivory tower. I do um, a bit of science and rub up against science a lot and um, have been involved in a lot of co-design, co-developed projects here in Oregon. And so I think that's why I was invited here and I'll share a little bit more on that. Um, for folks that don't know, Surfrider Foundation is a nonprofit environmental organization dedicated to the protection and enjoyment of our oceans, waves, and beaches. And we represent recreational users. Uh, we work on clean water, uh, coast and climate issues like protecting beaches, adapting to climate change, sea level rise, um, you know, and protecting special places, both ecological places that are important to our members, um, but also recreational uh, spots that are really important to our members. And while it sounds like we're a bunch of surfers, the name does sort of imply that, uh, we do sort of represent a pretty broad constituency of ocean users, people that love the beach, people that like to go to the beach, um, and then, of course, ocean recreation is really expanding and changing rapidly. Um, so there's a lot of people that participate in ocean recreation and beach, rec beach recreation other than just surfers. Um, so our name is a little uh, above a misnomer. Um, again, I think one of the reasons why I was invited here was that our organization and our advocacy um, uses a lot of science. And we work with a lot of scientists and depend on science. Um, ultimately to advocate for solutions, both ocean solutions, coastal solutions, um, and, and everyday issues like plastic pollution, I would say, is we've been involved in a lot of co-design work uh, in, in that space as well. Um, and I think another reason why I was invited here is that for the past 10 years in my experience in advocating and working for Surfrider in Oregon, um, I've had the pleasure of serving on the Oregon Sea Grant Advisory Council. Uh, so we review a lot of grants, we see a lot of grants come in, and um, I'm on an advisory council of a lot of different types of members from the community, not just scientists, but farmers and fishermen and otherwise that actually review these grants. Um, and a lot of that's because Sea Grant sort of demands a high level of community engagement in Oregon, and they have some high expectations for that in their science and in their granting. Um, and so that, that's reflected in their review process. And I review things um, under a rubric specifically for um, the level of um, community and societal relevance. Um, so again, like Sea Grant, uh, sort of an opposite problem maybe than NSF in, in that they have a high demand for community engagement and a high demand for co-design and co-development in Oregon, but they don't have a lot of money. Um, and so this presents an interesting predicament for scientists and one that we watched in years and in, in, in them being challenged with applying for funding. And so I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about how Sea Grant sort of met the, the needs of scientists in trying to be better co-designers and be better community engagers and um, work better in, in a transdisciplinary way. Um, and the way, that, the way that sort of came about was what we heard from scientists was largely like, this is a small amount of money that Oregon Sea Grant is funding each year. Your expectations are really high. We need more time and we need more money if you want us to do this type of transdisciplinary work. We need time to pivot, build relationships and trust in our community um, and, and actually test and pilot out the questions that we're asking right now and see if these are the right questions. Um, so a lot of these things that we've heard reiterated over and over again from our previous presenters, I found was sort of built into the process that Sea Grant reflected on and created in response called seed to leaf funding um, in, in Oregon. And, and the way that works is that seed to leaf proposals um, are required to approach research from at least two different disciplines. Um, they require an engaged component and it's designed to integrate potential information users and stakeholders um, into the research process itself. And it requires an outreach plan to ensure that the research process and results are useful and usable um, to those constituencies and communities. And so the seed to leaf uh, granting works where the first 
seed proposal is funded for 12 months and it's an exploration of that idea. It's an opportunity to build those relationships, to understand whether or not the research questions are correct, um, to build your community of knowledge that's going to inform, hopefully, a LEAF project. After that 12 months of initial investment, um, that gives scientists time to do all of that work, um, sort of build, and maybe that's we, they realize halfway through that or, or through that 12 month period that this isn't the right project. Um, but hopefully what, the, what that leads to is a LEAF project was a second round of funding. And in the second round of funding, that's a more longer term uh, engaged project. Um, again, building time and relationships and trust into a two phase process that sort of allows for co-design and co-development. Again, researchers were kept telling the, 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 folks at Sea Grant that this was just like too too big of an ask for such a small pot of money and such a limited amount of time. And so this is sort of how they re reflected and, and um, uh, changed their funding opportunities for that. So I think it's been a really powerful um, um, way of funding projects and, and culturing transdisciplinary research and co-design and co-development. One project that I've been involved with is um, called the Cascadia Copez or uh, it's the Coastline and People's Hazards uh, Project. Um, and this has been funded now at an NS NSF level. Um, I think uh, somewhere along 14 or $19 million, um, three different states. And again, this is addressing sort of communities and people's hazards along the coast, um, particularly, re particularly responding to hazard events like the big one, the big earthquake and the Cascadia subduction zone that we may be exposed to. Um, chronic hazards from sea level rise, um, as well as the acute hazards from things like earthquakes and tsunamis. And uh, to do that, it's built across five different teams, uh, trans transdisciplinary teams that are engaging with communities and exploring how um, to fill the best knowledge gaps to help them adapt to these coastal hazards in the future. And as a participant uh, in that advisory council, um, I've learned a lot about co-design and co-development. Um, I come in to that um, advisory council of that project uh, as a recreational user, as a recreational interest. Um, and so a lot of my advocacy to the science team is to try and steer things that so steer the science and the knowledge building around things that support recreation. So where a lot of that scientist in the past had been engaging local planners and maybe engaged homeowners around hazards for everything behind the shoreline, um, engaging recreational re users really, uh, you know, identified new beach safety and beach hazards um, that the that a much, much larger portion of the public um, would be exposed to, and, and, and less so just governments and homeowners. And, and you can see how slowly this starts to peel back the layers of economy and housing and behaviors and how we act and how we buy and sell houses on the coast. And a whole new line of science, other than just sort of the geophysical science of the coast, starts to open up. Uh, a lot of socioeconomic, um, a lot of decision making and how people act and behave um, isn't based on how much sand is moving around and how we can predict that over the future. It's really based on how people act and behave. Um, it's based on emotions and responses. And so um, this project sort of builds into that space the opportunity for us to ask those questions. And so now we have a beach safety metric that's built into some of the exploration of runup and exploration of erosion that we classically looked at as backshore hazards, as protecting the backshore, but looking at it from protecting the beach as a recreational user has been a high interest of ours. Other users um, like tribes have looked at this from a cultural perspective. The entire coast that's eroding away underneath of our feet isn't just a hazard, but it's also exposing a lot of archeological things, very important cultural, cultural information. So there's um, a whole line of other science that goes with that and informing that and actually protecting that information, which is really sensitive information. Um, and so you can imagine that this, this, this is really about peeling back the layers of the questions around the hazards on the coast. Um, and as you peel back those layers, they're not as, there's many, many more questions and a lot more science and knowledge that needs to be built into that space to help communities adapt to program uh, to to sea level rise and other types of coastal hazards. Um, so again, I, I I hope I can add more maybe to the discussion uh, as we move forward here. I don't have a whole lot to share other than my experience in this space 
um, as, as I guess what would be classically, uh, I'd be called a stakeholder or a constituent. Um, and I represent a lot of folks in that space probably, um, but I'm a quite engaged one. And so I've been involved with many projects in the co-design and co-development space, um, as well as the funding of those projects um, through my participation in the Oregon Sea Grant Advisory Council and their Seed to Leaf granting project program. Um, so that's all I have. And uh, thanks for uh, the opportunity to speak with you guys today. Excellent. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you for offering your perspective. Uh, it's really great to hear from somebody who's really been hands-on in all of these projects. So we do have uh, plenty of time for discussion. There's already some questions on Slido. Those of you who are online or in the room, as your questions arise, do put them into Slido. Um, Mona, I see you have two questions here, and I don't know what order you want to cover them, um, but maybe we'll start with you. Thank you all for the great presentations. I'm delighted to see Sea Grant highlighted. Obviously, I'm biased. I work for Georgia Sea Grant. Um, I wanted to ask um, all of you: Are there the idea of aligning the academic incentives, uh, hiring, promotion, tenure, um, to recognize co co production comes up very often? And yet, I I do I'm not aware of colleges, programs, uh, departments that are using innovative methods, uh, innovative frameworks to to reward faculty, students, uh, professionals who do this kind of work. Are you aware of any successful programs um, that any departments or schools that have done that? And my second question is related to co-benefits of uh, you know, co-producing knowledge. Um, are the communities engaged in evaluating those co-benefits? And I think this question is probably for Kristen. Thanks. I mean, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I, I can jump in to um, um, start with the um, the second aspect. I mean, in the Pacific Risa, um, it's a large program, you know, many millions of dollars. And one of the things we've had since the beginning is an external evaluator um, and a really detailed uh, theory of change that's driven um, that evaluation. And so, yes, the um, the the stakeholders and the rights holders um, are included in in her evaluation, um, and uh, you know, I think it takes a, a genuine interest in in the parts of the um, PIs to want to know that information and use that information in adapting their science. Um, so it's but it's it's a non trivial task. Um, for sure, and and it's uh, expertise um, that uh, is is not necessarily you know true evaluation program evaluation is is not something that many academics are trained in either. Um, so I guess that would that would be my summary there. Yeah. Any thoughts about the question about the evaluation P and T? Yes, I'll take a shot at that. So um, NACFI and the, you know, through the Keck Institute Future Initiatives, um, they, I, I was lucky enough to participate in an entire um, multi-year workshop on interdisciplinarity is what it was called and how to um, appropriately, this was led by Tamara Tickton at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, as well as Bonnie Keeler at the University of Minnesota, and they brought together a number of folks who are working in in this space um, to develop really a working report. And I believe I sent that to some of um, when we had our pre committee meeting when we had our pre panelist meeting. Um, but there were a number of suggestions of how um, how in the administration and it, it really has to be in the tenure and promotion guidelines um, to really redefine what meets the criteria for expectations of tenure around scholarship, we found in our analysis that that is really where the rubber meets the road is in the tenure and promotion guidelines. And so um, that's really where it starts. Um, for people who are interdisciplinary, you can see I have a joint appointment, Kirsten has a joint appointment. It is important, um, potentially in a unionized environment to also set up memoranda of agreements that the union um, or bargaining unit can help to have the faculty member um, to protect them and to kind of balance out. I don't wanna get down into the nuts and bolts, but it can include things like 
evaluations can come from community members or can come from people who are able to judge the full range of that uh, individual scholarship. And so that can be encapsulated in a memoranda of agreement for their evaluation for tenure and promotion. Great ideas, Rosie. Do you want to talk a little bit about you all's advanced program too that you all started out? Um, sure. I happen to be on the advisory board of uh, the NSF advanced program that is here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, we are in the phase of moving from our data collection. We did a huge survey on, um, in this case, it's, it's gender, um, not so much community engagement, but um, so I, I actually can't speak to that yet because we have our first advisory meeting next week. Um, but we are looking at ways to directly interact and interface with the tenure and promotion pro um, process um, in order to better recognize the kinds of scholarship that particularly women and minoritized faculty engage in, which happen to also be a lot of transdisciplinary high risk um, work. Hey, thank you, Rosie. As you can see, I'm impatient to see the results of that work. Mm -hmm. Really exciting stuff. Um, uh, the next question, Shimi, do you want to ask yours? Yeah, thank you to all the speakers. Hi, Kirsten. Hi, Rosie. Um, so we've been talking about this actually at lunch break. Um, are there any suggestions? I guess, Kirsten, I, I you borrowed your words um, on how NSF can facilitate, quote unquote, flexible and nimble grants. Um, to match community interests um, and their timelines, especially with Congress timelines on funding cycles and, and whatnot. Just some ideas. Well, yeah, I mean, I think Charlie brought up, you know, a, a great model, right? Where there's seed funding, um, where the expectation is uh, that you develop those partnerships and develop full proposals. Um, and I mean, NSF has some things that are akin to this, like in you know, the workshops that you can fund a workshop then and, and within a program or, um, but maybe the, you know, the, the intent of those workshops is, is um, about building the partnerships and coming up with the full proposal ideas. Um, you know, I, I like that seed to plant to, um, idea. Um, the seed to leave model does is, is a good, I think, example of kind of staging the funding in a way that allows for flexibility, um, reflection, uh, you know, building the trust, the relationships, but also, you know, science doesn't happen on a schedule all the time, right? Like if you're doing ocean science, um, it might not, you might not get a weather window in a 12 month period that presents um, the right at sea time to conduct the research that you want to do, right? That's, that's flexibility um, that on the Oregon coast, you know, we have to have. Um, and so I think it's important to recognize that it's, not just co-development and co-design that demands time and flexibility, but sometimes science, um, physical science itself and the, the physical constraints of the environment uh, demand that as well. And so we heard that, you know, over and over again at Sea Grant when we were reviewing and, and hearing from scientists and I would engage with scientists a lot in that space. Um, so flexibility was important. I think staging things out is also a way to take some risks and find out whether or not you do have a good community to co-develop knowledge and co-develop a project. Um, I'm sure people have been engaged in a project where you got some funding and about halfway through that project, you realize it, it really wasn't going to work. Now, we always make it work, right? But there's times when you need to be, reflect and maybe shift. And, and I think that's what's great about staging and thinking about staging funding in that, that way. Yeah. And connecting the dots, I mean, earlier this morning, we talked about the long-term ecological research model. That, too, is sort of a long-term investment that can assure that the relationships are sustained and, you know, remain healthy. Um, so maybe there's some that's sort of the other extreme, perhaps. Um, there's a question on Slido by Peter Gerges. Peter, do you want to um, unmute yourself and just ask it yourself? Sure. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay, too? Excellent. Thank you. Well, first, thanks for the fantastic presentation, folks. I really appreciate it. It means a lot. And um, my question was about building trust. And, you know, the, so many of the points you all raised are, are I've heard from my colleagues um, 
I have uh, a couple of my colleagues happen to be leaders of minority in aquaculture and minorities in aquaculture and uh, black and marine science. And they have, among others, have submitted proposals to NSF. Uh, they've been rejected. And, you know, it immediately it shatters trust in that they they just they they feel like it's gatekeeping and they're being kind of left out. So I, I, I would love to hear from your points of view and experience. What are the things that NSF as an agency can do to really start building trust uh, with with, you know, our our you know, our diverse colleagues, right, our, our colleagues and scholars from from a variety of backgrounds and institutions. Thank you. Great question, Peter. Well, so, um, you know, Charlie put it in the chat, diversify the review team. Um, I think that we also have to do a better job at disaggregating data. I'll share a manuscript that I was a co-author on uh, last year where we exposed over 20 years of um, funding inequities with the National Science Foundation. Um, and we were able to um, definitely see that it is a pervasive issue, not just in the geo directorate or the bio directorate, but pervasive across all the directorates. Um, and there are really strong biases. Um, we identified the scores that, um, at least for the disaggregated ethnic and racial data that we have, um, to be one of the major factors. And so I do think diversifying the review team is a critical component. Um, we just have to start getting better data because I think a lot of folks don't still, and I can say this with confidence because we've had meetings with NSF, our, 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 our author team, that they are looking for more evidence, but that is evidence that only NSF can do because they need to actively disaggregate their data for us to be able to understand what is the true nature of the magnitude of this um, disparity. So I would say before we can even implement interventions, we need to measure the disparity um, in order to build trust that NSF is willing to accept um, that there is a disparity in place. So, I mean, I think to me, that's a very strong first step, but um, maybe my co-panelists also have other ideas. Maybe I'll interject here to take the co-chair's prerogative. I agree with you, Rosie, that we need to measure because if we don't measure, we won't see any improvement. But what I want to really just, let's just not deny that there is a problem. I mean, let's just accept we have a problem. We don't need any more data to accept that there is a problem. Um, we need more data to see whether or not the interventions that we might think of are actually improving the issue. Um, but I think we should really be past the stage of still needing to prove that there is a problem. Um, and if there's anything this committee can do to help, um, that would be great. But anyway, coming back to the question, I'll step off my soapbox. Mm -hmm. Any other ideas? Charlie, it's great that you put some thoughts into the chat. Um, any other ideas from any of you, Charlie? I, I mean, I, d I don't know anything about NSF's review process. And so I, I am, you know, would go out on a limb to make recommendations to, to you on that. Um, but I, I guess my, 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 my thought, and I hate to keep going back to what I know, which is the C grant process and what I've been engaged in over the past decade is that, you know, when I got involved with C grant, I, and I was on this review team and I looked around who was reviewing these science grants that were coming in high level research work too. Um, not easy to understand and comprehend, but they were farmers and fishermen and people with all ranges of education and backgrounds. And I kept asking myself, why are farmers from Eastern Oregon on Sea Grants Advisory Council? You know, well, well, they're part of society and they, they, they are re reviewing this for societal relevance. They don't have to know how the science works to understand whether or not it's relevant to them. And so I, I think that in the process of review, there's a lot of discussion um, from that societal relevance group. Um, and, and we may not think that we influence projects a lot, um, but I actually think we do. Um, and I've, I've watched that in real time happen, um, particularly through that, through that seed to leaf kind of process. And so I think it demands that we take a hard look at who's using the science, who's applying um, for funding, um, and we represent those communities of interest in the review process in some way, shape, or form. 
And that mean that might mean you have many, many types of review teams, as does Sea Grant and Oregon. They have technical review teams, they have societal relevance review teams, they have community engagement and outreach review teams um, who all have expertise in those areas. But um, I'll stop. That's that's what I have to share. Great thoughts. Thank you. Um, we do have a question from an anonymous person on Slido, and uh, since I don't know who they are, I'll just go ahead and read it out loud. Um, and this may be specifically to Rosie, but others might have some thoughts too. Um, and what are common challenges in bringing the care principles into data collection management sharing that could be addressed with revised DMP guidelines? Okay, so... Um... There are different ways to operationalize the CARES principles, but I would say one of the biggest issues um, centers around the A, which is authority to control. And that is because the Western model of data is that is an ownership model, that we own the data, that we as researchers who collect that information own the data. It, 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 at the same time, it's quite actually um, at odds with the idea around fair, right? Like that it should be freely accessible and et cetera. Um, but we do that the implicit within Western society is this idea that we own the data and knowledge. But a lot of indigenous peoples, and I don't want to be monolithic in scope, um, feel that information is collective. Um, that that it not only is it collective, but also people have to earn the right to have that data. So not everybody should necessarily have the right to know where. The, the fishing area where the you know should have GPS coordinates to the fishing areas where fish aggregation sites are right because that could open it, your community up to um, to being poached by outside commercial fishing and so it's it's this idea so those I think there's some really foundational fundamental epistemological I would say um, differences that are at, at odds between different indigenous peoples cultures and viewpoints and the Western way of thinking about data ownership um, and accessibility. So I'm not saying that data shouldn't be accessible, but we should we really need to think hard about what are the potential harms that might come from making data completely open. Um, I have a lot of thoughts of this with regard to microbiome data, um, but <clears throat> and, and eDNA and other kinds of things. But I think that is the number one big picture thing is that there is a fundamental conflict or variance between notions of data ownership. And that's why I think about it as knowledge stewardship and data governance and not ownership. Um, so that's what I would say is the number one sticking point. Thank you, Rosie. Um, Melanie Fewings has a question here in the room. Yeah, turn it on, I think. Thank you. Um, yeah, so my, the, a little bit of context for, well, the question first is, what are alternatives or possible alternatives to participant support, which is a category within NSF proposal budgets, um, for by which non-academic partners in co-production of knowledge could receive NSF funds without adding a large administrative burden for them? And the context here is, um, I'm a PI on a NOAA project, and uh, Joe Schumacher, who was on an earlier panel, is actually a collaborator, um, and there are quite a few other collaborators from Washington Coastal Treaty Tribes, but they're all unfunded collaborators, partly because of the short timeline um, of NOAA um, calls, but also because um, the research coordinator at Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary we worked with was helping educate me and my team and how to respectfully work with the tribal partners who we wanted to partner with for the first time. And one thing they said was, because I said, can we have subcontracts to tribal partners who are interested in that? And, and they said, probably they won't be interested because there'll be a huge administrative paperwork um, burden. Like they're not set up with Dunn's numbers and all their reporting and all that. So participant support will be probably their preference. And I'm just wondering your opinions on that. And, and those are the only two mechanisms I know. So are there others? Could there be others? What, what have you pursued? Um, I'll, I'll take a sort of quick crack at that. So um, this is a huge problem. Um, the communities that need the support the most 
are the ones that have the least capability of like taking that support because of that added burden. Um, and so one of the things that that I'm hearing from some of our in particular tribal partners who are repeatedly being um, approached to engage on a whole variety of issues along the West Coast is that they actually want to have funded um, a FTE for people within their um, within their staff to then engage with scientists, with representatives from a whole variety of different agencies, um, and to do it in some of the like newer sectors. So, for example, in this like renewable energy space, a lot of them have some some ocean policy staff already. In, um, on board, especially with the focus on fishery science. But now when you're wanting people to be able to respond related to um, new technologies, it's like, it's exceedingly challenging. And so I think really respecting the fact that we shouldn't just be giving honorariums, we shouldn't just be giving subcontracts, we should actually be funding positions. Yeah, see, I saw a lot of nodding around the um, the Zoom screen here as you were talking, Katie. Thank you. Um, we still have a few minutes left, and I guess um, I want to ask you all a question. As I was listening to all four of you talk about your work, I can see how there is a, a thread in there that all of you are really co-producing means you're, you're bringing the knowledge of the communities of place or communities of practice you're bringing that knowledge that they bring to the table um, and sort of an equal footing with the um, more hypothesis-driven science that we've been trained in. Um, but can you all, maybe some of you, speak a little bit more explicitly to what it looks like to bring traditional ecological knowledge or local ecological knowledge into this work? Um, can you all speak a little bit more to that? Yeah, I can. Um... So um, so in my work, I've noticed that there's key steps in this iterative process. There's that scoping step, which we talked earlier about funding sort of in and of itself in order to, to work with communities and understand what the challenging questions are that they're, they're facing. Then there's sort of a data collection step. Um, an analysis often or a scenario development step where you're sort of trying to understand different options that communities are thinking about and then sort of bringing the, the science to bear on that. Um, and then sort of, uh, now how do we synthesize what we've learned and make sure that it's in a way that there can actually be uptake on the policy or the decision-making side. Um, and I think it's really important to recognize that the, the community knowledge like comes in at each one of those phases. So, so the, the scoping often includes like framing of the research questions, but those aren't just research questions, they're, they're management or they're, they're investment related questions. And so um, really ensuring that, 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 that it's sort of like the on the ground knowledge that's helping to frame those out. Um, that data collection step, it might be bringing sort of globally data, available data or, or sort of locally generated empirical information. It's also going to be um, bringing in that local knowledge where that local, where those local knowledge holders want to share it. So as, as Rosie was saying, um, there's, there's a really important need to recognize that um, that we need to be careful about how we're 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 incorporating that knowledge into this this process, um, and then and some of the ways that we've done that I mentioned it briefly in my talk are through sort of um, in the case of of the work that I'm thinking of we we did a whole bunch of participatory mapping we probably came up with like close to 500 maps from community members talk at, sort of where we asked them two explicit questions what's happening now in the places where you live and what do you want to see happen in the future and can you help us understand where those different things could occur and how they could influence the aspects of the social ecological system that you care about and then we took those maps and based on our conversations with community members synthesized those together into some distinct kind of alternatives that represented alternative viewpoints 
um, and then returned those back to the communities. So we, we digitized them and then said, does this reflect what you were telling us? So we kind of like integrated that, that drawing into then something that you can think of maybe as a more Western science, science approach that there are these the digitized reflection of their ideas and then changed those things where we'd gotten them wrong and then used some interdisciplinary models to sort of analyze the outcomes they told us they cared about underneath those, those, different, um, those different alternative sort of options. Um, and then in that synthesis phase, it's all about how do you want to quantify these outcomes that you told us that you care about? What metrics do we use? How do we visualize that? Which visualizations are most important? So I think really just um, understanding that that it's not just in that data collection phase that, that traditional ecological knowledge might come in, but it's framing the whole process. Great, great, Katie. That's very thoughtful and useful. Thank you. Um, I want to be respectful of you all's time. Thank you very much to the four of you. Okay, we're, we're going to talk about uh, research priorities for related to ocean acidification and deoxygenation and HABs. And the first speaker is Alexis. Is uh, Alexis, are you ready to, to go? Yes, I am here. I'm, I'm uh, ready. I wasn't sure, Maria, were you going to go first or was it me first? Um, I would be fine. Okay, I can go first. Okay. Um, let me get ready to share my screen then. Um, let's see. It looks like I just have the option to share my desktop, so I will do that. Um, and let me know when you're able to see it. Yeah. And we can see okay, it. and I apologize. It only gave me the option to share my desktop, not the um, the PowerPoint. So I'm trying to hide the Zoom controls, so you can see hopefully just my slides more or less. We can see fine. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. My name is Alexis Valari Orton, and I am a program officer at the Ocean Foundation, where I run our Ocean Science Equity Initiative. And um, as requested, I'm here to talk about ocean acidification research priorities. And, and from my perspective at the Ocean Foundation, really on technology research and capacity development needs. So to, to frame, when I was thinking about, okay, how would I approach this discussion topic, um, you know, in proposing priorities for, for 10 years, I thought of these two discussion questions, and so I wanted to kind of put these at the front of my presentation, and I'll also kind of pose them at the end as well, and kind of put them as context for um, the presentation I'm giving as these two fundamental questions. Are the tools that we currently have to measure OA, deoxygenation, and have sufficient for the scientific questions we need to answer today? And what role can the US and NSF play in testing and defining new methodologies for assessments of sufficient quality to answer emerging questions? And when I say measure OA and HABs, I don't just mean measure, are they happening, but really the full assessment of, are they happening? Where, where is it happening? Why, what are the effects? Um, so these are just some discussion questions that came to my mind um, as I was preparing these slides and I thought, um, we could keep in mind as I as I speak. So I come from probably a different background from most of the people you've heard from today, and that I work at a nonprofit foundation. So uh, I run our Ocean Science Equity Initiative. Well, what is that? Um, we believe that as our blue planet changes, a community's ability to monitor and understand the ocean is inextricably linked to their well-being. But we also recognize that the physical, human, and financial infrastructure to conduct ocean science is inequitably distributed across the world and within the United States. And so we work to ensure that all countries and communities can monitor and respond to changing ocean conditions, not just those with the most resources. And most of our work is international, but we do do work within the United States, particularly in Puerto Rico. Um, so a lot of our work has focused on ocean acidification um, and trying to support uh, increased research capacity. And we often find ourselves at this crossroads where we sort of have two sides of the coin. 
uh, where we have either ineffective or inaccessible technology at our fingertips for addressing OA research questions. And I imagine this is likely the case for HABs and deoxygenation and other um, ocean parameters of interest, where you might have something like on the left where you have a, a handheld instrument that's great for taking out into the field. It might be rugged and robust. You can purchase it from someone. There's a company that will pick up the phone and answer questions if there is an issue. Um, you can have it serviced. But the information that it gives you might not be of sufficient quality to actually answer a scientific question that you have. Whereas you have something on the right, which is the Berkelator, um, which is this custom built, amazing system that has actually made huge differences for the shellfish industry on the West Coast and um, gets climate quality data, carbonate chemistry data, but it's custom built, it's $50,000. It takes possibly two years of training to learn how to run. It is um, you know, difficult, expensive, you can call Burke and he'll tell you how to fix it, but there's no company, right, that you can purchase one of these from. And so you're sort of in this um, gray area of how do you uh, address the scientific questions that you have with the technologies available when you either have ineffective or inaccessible. So some of the work that we have done to try and address this is to find that middle ground or either by compiling existing um, equipment into a suite of materials or designing new systems. Um, and I think this is something that, you know, NSF already supports quite a bit with SBIR grants and things. And we've worked with some recipients of those grants, um, including Sunburst on their fighter to try and get those into the hands of more users, but um, doesn't always require starting from scratch. The Go On in a Box Kit is an example of something that we developed with Go On, the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network, where it's all off the shelf components that when compiled, so it's 90 pieces of equipment that you can purchase from Fisher and other um, suppliers. But when you put them all together, you get weather quality carbonate chemistry data and all you need is seawater and electricity to start. So we've shipped 20 of these kits around the world and people are publishing data. And what's nice about it is that it's modular. You can I diagnose problems easily. Um, there's training materials that we've built around them, videos, um, you know, best practice guides, data templates, all sorts of things. And so kind of recognizing there's a lot of different approaches towards filling that gap between ineffective and inaccessible. On the right-hand side is something we're building with Burke as sort of that answer to the Burke later of, is there sort of a weather quality or another type of quality of data that we can collect that's scientifically useful, but doesn't require the same cost or level of expertise to operate. Um, and then I wanted to share something that may not feel quite as relevant immediately, but I think there's relevance from a science diplomacy standpoint and as a model for regional um, capacity uh, in some of the more remote areas of the US is something we've done with US support. So this is funded by the State Department and in partnership with NOAA, we've supported the development of the Pacific Islands Ocean Acidification Center, which is run in Suva, Fiji by um, the Pacific community and the University of the South Pacific with the Ocean Foundation support. And it serves as a regional training hub, but also a repair center and an inventory of spare parts to help ensure that ocean acidification monitoring programs can be sustained over time so that there's a place where locally people can go for support with equipment maintenance, with research challenges, with if there's new personnel that they can get training. And I think that there's a model this can pose for science diplomacy and working internationally, but also um, for more remote regions tackling some of these um, problems to have that in-region capacity to manage the scientific process from start to finish. And it, th one thing I emphasize is that this isn't citizen science, this is professional level science um, that can be kind of managed in a more remote place more easily. Okay, so, so where does that leave us today? I think that, again, when I was thinking about from our perspective, trying to help people establish research programs on ocean acidification, carbonate chemistry. Um, obviously there's a lot of movement right now in this space around, and you're gonna hear um, after myself and Maria from people working in the marine CDR space, but 
there's a lot of new um, initiatives and public and private investment in new technologies. And the reality is we simply, not only do we not have the tools, I would say, to understand ocean acidification and the carbonate system you know, as it is, but with interventions, we certainly don't have the tools we need to monitor and verify proposed technologies and interventions at scales. And I think that's true within the United States, but also internationally. And there may be examples where actors may focus their work outside of the US where ocean science capacity and regulatory frameworks are weaker, or perhaps in the more remote regions of uh, the US where there's less of that capacity, um, perhaps. Um, and then, you know, so there's also new legal frameworks like the BB&J, which require environmental impact assessments at larger scales than I think we've had to do before for potentially things like MCDR, where we're going to need new um, scientific tools to assess these things. So one possible thing that NSF could do is sponsor or lead the development of some best practices related to these things. And there are processes and projects underway. The Aspen Institute is working on a code of conduct for MCDR. You know, um, Ocean Visions, who you'll hear from in a moment, has done some work on this. I do think, though, there's a benefit to it being led by um, a bit more of an authoritative and unbiased actor, perhaps, um, on these very fast-moving, time-sensitive issues. Um, and so, you know, kind of summarizing a little bit of what I would see as some research investments that the U.S. could make. Um, I didn't talk too much about co-design, but I think with these highly complex issues where we don't necessarily have all the tools we need to understand them and um, the, science, the, the reality is changing so fast, co-design, yes, it's hard, yes, it's slow, but it's actually faster to do it from the beginning than to do a whole research project that has no value um, and then go back and learn that. So encouraging co-design across academic disciplines and between academic and non-academic sectors um, from the very inception, from the project development and funding development stage. I think strengthening international collaboration is something that could be done um, because these are global processes that need to be studied globally. And there's, I think, models of that being done that could be replicated, again, for science diplomacy reasons or for just pure science reasons. And then the rigorous testing of new methods. I think we have the infrastructure required to test emerging tools against um, the best in class methods for, especially for carbonate chemistry. And I think that NSF and other agencies are, like I said, well positioned to provide that authoritative and unbiased uh, perspective on best practices and, and codes of conduct. So again, circling back to the discussion questions that I posed at the beginning, are the tools that we have sufficient for the scientific questions we need to answer today? I think that the answer is probably no, but there's a lot of work that could be done to say, how can we bundle the various tools that we have available, these combinations of high-tech, low-tech, you know, in-situ satellite to rapidly assess the ways that we can use tools in new ways and create um, training guides for that. Um, and then what role, again, can the U.S. play in testing and defining new methodologies? Because um, things are moving very quickly around us when it comes to OA and some of these other issues. And so we're gonna need to move very quickly to keep up with it. Um, so with that, I think I will stop sharing my screen and say thank you and hand it back to the moderator in case there's time for questions. Thank you, Alexis. I, th I believe we'll wait till after the second uh, talk and then and then have questions for both, uh, both speakers. So. Um... Next on the agenda is uh, Maria. And so Maria, why don't you go ahead and start? And okay, let's see, unmute myself. Sorry, I'm working remotely and everything is everywhere all at once. <laughs> Can everyone see? Yeah, looks good. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and hide the meeting controls. Okay. Let's go ahead and go back to the beginning of this presentation because it loaded it back. Let's go. All 
All right, here we are at the beginning and I'm gonna go ahead and hide everybody too. Um, so I'm Maria Kavanaugh and I'm an assistant professor at Oregon State University. And I've collected some thoughts from a number of co colleagues kind of near and far. And so on behalf of all of us, thank you very much for, um, uh, for having us here. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, OA and HABs and primarily coastal ecosystems and with a focus on the Northern California current, just simply because that's where I'm currently working. However, I'll try to generalize a little bit. Um, and so over the next 12 minutes, you'll be hearing um, from us. Okay, so um, just kind of going over a state of the science, um, we know that multiple climate stressors are and will affect ocean ecosystems. And these stressors will and do overlap and they interact. Um, organisms respond to these stressors at multiple scales. So looking at the center figure there, <clears throat> But the baselines are lacking, and unfortunately, we rarely co-measure organismal responses and their stressors, um, either at multiple scales in time and space or across multiple levels of biological complexity. And in the coastal regions, this is especially challenging due to the increased dynamics um, and the increased heterogeneity and poor performance of um, remote sensing and model alg algorithms. However, it's here where humans um, have both the most impact, but also the capacity to positively affect conservation and management uh, outcomes. So uh, starting kind of in the open ocean, we know that um, roughly a quarter of, of the annual CO2 emissions um, absorbed uh, from the atmosphere um, is absorbed uh, by the ocean. This CO2 undergoes, you know, a series of chemical reactions that makes the seawater more acidic, reducing pH and causing other changes in chemistry, including the reduction in carbonate ions. And several trends um, across many open ocean time series have shown that um, as CO2 in the atmosphere rises, pH declines and CO2 um, increases in the ocean um, in pretty much lockstep. However, coastal physics um, add to these trends and patterns, um, and these include seasonal wind-driven upwelling, such as what we have on our coast, um, which brings up water that's rich in nutrients, but also rich in dissolved um, inorganic carbon. It also includes river and glacial inputs, which tend to be uh, low in alkalinity, but can um, also absorb more CO2, especially if they're cold. Um, and so for different reasons, local physics can result in patchiness of calcite and aragonite um, saturation and other components of the carbonate system. Local biology, including respiratory responses to eutrophication or nutrient loading can also exacerbate regional carbonates chemistry trends. And so many marine organisms are sensitive to these changes. And we've learned um, over the past 15 or so years that uh, particularly coral, shellfish, and other uh, marine life that make their skeletons and shells from calcium carbonate are sensitive. However, the OA research community is moving beyond the single species, the single responses, and has begun to look at the extended effects through communities and food webs. And so this can include investigating the role that calcifying organisms have as a foundation or habitat spe uh, forming species, such as that um, this coralline algae shown on the bottom left, or modeling more complex responses. For example, diatoms are predicted to benefit from increased CO2. However, this study based in off of Antarctica found that with natural enrichment, diatoms were indeed enhanced. However, the composition and size of the phytoplankton, um, the diatoms um, uh, shifted, and this resulted in changes in nutrient um, use efficiency and reduced export efficiency. So there's sometimes some unintended um, outcomes or not unintended, but rather unexpected outcomes. So other studies have focused on complex meta-analyses to look at some of these outcomes to determine whether the type of response to CO2, whether it's consumption, growth, metabolic rate, movement, or survival, and whether it's to CO2 warming and low oxygen, whether that's, sort of, that's predictable across responses and across a broad array of species. And so we are learning much, but we also have much to learn. So we talk a lot about non-stationary uh, responses and non-stationary relationships indicate that the effects of environmental conditions such as temperature and OA on organismal patterns and processes can vary over time in intensity and or direction. 
they suggest sometimes that there is some sort of physiological threshold or tipping point that has been reached. This makes predictions and projections really tricky, but it is really important to understand these for mitigating OA or in understanding how OA signals are communicated to higher trophic levels. While best practices documents provide guidance on how to disentangle components of the carbonate system, it's also important to quantify OA in a multiple stressor context, as OA may exacerbate or induce additional stressors, including halves, which I'll talk about in a minute. Multiple stressors can interact and be different in their dominance over time and over different life history stages, as is shown in this work by Berger, who mapped out present and future stressors for Dungeness crab, which occupy a benthic or pelagic habitat at different life stages. And even if concurrent stressors do not have interactive effects at a given life stage, multiple stressor effects could emerge across development. Such carryover effects have not been studied much in the context of OA and could be a fruitful avenue of research. And finally, while regional biogeochemical bio bio chemical models embedded in Earth system models are ideal for forecasting, projection, and attribution of drivers to assess for mitigation and adaptation pathways, this will require um, access to high performance com um, computing and potentially co coordinated nested approaches across many institutions. All right, so to phytoplankton, phytoplankton community composition is also changing in response to multiple stressors. Harmful algal blooms um, occur when species rapidly grow and accumulate, and these species can be noxious, resulting in um, hypoxia when the blooms subsequently decay, or they can produce toxins that directly or indirectly through bioaccumulation can affect human health. There's much attention on the role of OA in promoting HAB blooms and hypoxia. Um, HAB blooms, sorry, HAB blooms and toxicity. Um, and this is in terms of CO2 fertilization effects, changing the availability of dissolved nutrients and changing the behavior of grazers. This is especially true for the case of Pseudonychia, which can form large blooms off of our coast of um, North America and the West Coast, such as what happened in response to a persistent marine heat wave in 2015. Some species, but not all, of Pseudonychia produce domoic acid, which is a neurotoxin that can bioaccumulate in shellfish and making them unsafe to eat. In 2015, toxin levels were um, incredibly high and they made their way through the food web to impact a number of fisheries and marine mammals. This led to long delays in the Dungeness crab fisheries and a complete shutdown of the razor clam harvest and resulting in financing, financial and cultural devastation throughout the West Coast fishing and tribal communities. Newspapers described a surge in food bank usage in their local communities, suggesting a lack of revenue was leading to food insecurity. Now, current management relies heavily on monitoring with some coarse predictive capacity based on circulation-based modeling, but little ecosystem modeling. And there's still huge uncertainty in the science. So this um, case study and general uncertainties have resulted in a suite of HAB research priorities that have been set through a couple of recent syntheses by the HAB community across four broad themes. Bloom ecology and toxin production is one. A second one is toxic pathways and effects. A third is food webs, um, understanding the effects of HABs on food webs and ecosystems. And this include, includes novel interactions, such as what is ha um, currently happening um, and uh, being investigated off the coast of Oregon and, and as a potential cause for recent muscle die-offs. Finally, um, we um, uh, one priority is understanding the public health and socioeconomic impacts. Now, while management, current management, mitigates um, most of the acute health issues, as climate continues, it will be important to understand the cumulative effects of low levels of toxins through time. So, and also an additional priority, or perhaps even an umbrella, would be to um, integrate this social understanding um, into HABs within a multi-stressor framework. 
So continued um, development of both high-tech um, tools such as imaging um, systems and environmental DNA and training um, the next generation to use them will be incredibly critical. So in terms of science support, there are no easy solutions to the issues of context dependency and non-stationary ecosystems. So I would, I would encourage us to think about our strategies for addressing these and whether we invest in a means to conduct more experiments, develop flexible and, and modular yet mechanistic model frameworks and or bolster our observational capacity. And I would encourage us to think about how we do that in a way that promotes access, equity, and inclusion. I would also encourage us to think about what infrastructure and history exists and support activities that add capacity to the science and to the community that address ecological complexity and promote intercalibration activities with similar programs in other regions. So one example that I'm showing you here is the Newport line, whose observations of ocean conditions and lower trophic level patterns have provided a platform for collaborative science instrument testing and fisheries management and indicator development for the last 26 plus years. I would suggest that we strengthen partnerships between networks. For example, um, NSF's long-term ecological research sites can exchange mechanistic insights um, for the observations and technology associated with the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network the HAB and Global Ocean Acidification Observation Networks, and OOI. This could illuminate um, things such as um, how the composition, the magnitude, and location and fate of blooms changes with changing circulation, chemistry, and temperature that contribute to HAB and fisheries research, but also basic science on the carbon cycle and climate feedback. So one path for interagency co cooperation is through the National Ocean Partnership Program, which is highlighted um, as a means to accomplish broad transdisciplinary goals in the Ocean Climate Action Plan. And last, to, um, to end, um, um, I'd like to state that the understanding the effect of multiple climate stressors on marine um, ecosystems will require a long-term transdisciplinary vision that may require um, reframing our traditional structures of teaching, research, and collaboration. We'll need to build a climate-ready workforce to address HABOA issues going into the future. And one great example of this is the Next Gen program from NEPA, which provides student scholarship support, meaningful paid internships, fellowships, and job opportunity matchups, including in the federal sector. Um, we'll need to train and practice transdisciplinary research. Um, and one example I'm showing you here is from OSU's NSF research traineeship in risk and uncertainty. And here students teamed up on problems under, um, to, um, and to, including to understand the multiple stressor effects on Pacific cod. They brought together machine learning, geovisual methods, bioenergetic modeling, and vulnerability assessments all together in a collaborative framework. And then finally, I'd like to encourage us all um, to, as, as we're going forward over the next de decade, to form meaningful and sustainable community collaborations. And one such pathway is something um, uh, such as collaborative fisheries research, such as the pilot um, harmful algal bloom observatory shown below. And here, commercial fishermen partnered with scientists off the Oregon coast to contribute to observations and modeling to promote um, and to create um, a hab early warning system. And with that, I'll go ahead and close and say thank you. And um, I guess we'll start to collect questions. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, got some questions already and um, there'll be some more coming along. Let's see, the first one I have is, um, is uh, from Tuba and it's endorsed by several others. It says, you give I think it was probably for Alexis. You gave examples of technology to measure and assess OA HABs. Is there technology being developed to mitigate? Um, I think that yes and. Um, so te technology, what is technology? I think is a little bit of a thing. So mitigating uh, OA and HABs, I think for OA, the first thing is carbon emissions. So obviously um, reducing carbon emissions. HABs have multiple I think 
things that cause them. So there's uh, definitely agricultural policies that are being looked at that also are contributing to ocean acidification and halves. From technology standpoint, I think it's very, very early. There's some low tech, um, like multi-trophic culture and things like that has that has been studied. And then things that you're going to hear about that I'd say are still very experimental on the marine carbon dioxide removal, some of which are focused more on r removing atmospheric carbon and aren't focused on reducing ocean acidification. Some are more focused on reducing ocean acidification, but I will caution that they're very in the early phases. Um, and I think we do not yet understand those. I, I personally think that the number one thing to emphasize is carbon emission reduction and then local land management um, and agricultural and local sources of carbon. Um, and so I don't know if that would be technology so much as policy, but I do think that the technology role is helping with those decisions, right? And those trade-offs of understanding what's the attribution of local sources of carbon or other things to the coastal system and where can local policy interventions make a difference. So the technology for the mitigation is understanding the attribution to inform when a po local policy intervention will make a difference versus when it's a global process. Um, Maria, you probably can weigh in on that as well. I'm I'm less familiar I'm familiar with the um, mitigation side of things. It's more of the adaptation, um, and it's I'm, and particularly with with HABs. Part of that has to do with um, uh, understanding early um, whether a bloom is in development and where it might um, actually um, end up in a couple of weeks, and so that's where some of the circulation modeling comes in. However, what doesn't happen um, concurrently, and there's a little less organization on um, in terms of the states, is actually looking in the shellfish, um, I mean, having sufficient monitoring in the shellfish to see if they're actually consuming those those hats. Um, and that's that's kind of where they want to go because they don't want to shut down. Um, and um, shutting down means the loss of revenue. It means the loss of uh, um, cultural activities. And quite often they're not, accumulating at that at that time even if it's it's hot right above them so i think thinking about multi-scaled um observational um systems that are are somewhat nimble um would be helpful but um I, I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm not entirely sure how the the policy and the management framework that you know that that goes from a, perhaps a tribe or a, a municipality to the state to a to a region to say NOAA, um, how that might um, maintain uh, being nimble. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's more adaptation that is really has been the focus. Like even on the OA side, the adaptation in the oyster hatchery has been on monitoring and then making adjustments mm -hmm. to the tanks or the intake water. That's not mitigation of the problem. Whereas reducing the influx of carbon into the system, that would be a mitigation uh, um, process, which I think there have been some efforts in Washington state to look at that um, and look at attributes of the agricultural runoff versus atmospheric signal versus upwelling signal of OA to understand how, um, but there's other people who can answer that better than me. <laughs> so. Okay, I think uh, Allison has a question. Oh, here you go. Wasn't expecting to read it. Uh, thanks, ladies. Um, my question is a little bit related to tubas, but do you believe that NSF is uh, investing enough in terms of um, funding for innovative tools and defining new methodologies for assessing OA and HAPS? I think that there can be more. I think that there's some great examples of investments um, in concrete, like individual pieces of technology. What I'm really interested in is how do we match the different existing pieces of technology in new ways to answer questions? Because I think that that's not necessarily something that I'm seeing a lot of people working, or at least it's not maybe talked about as much. Um, maybe maybe because it's not funded and it's not something people get excited about to uh, apply to. So saying, okay, how can you utilize existing platforms or new new platforms 
to answer some of these really tricky questions. So the multimodal, the bringing in satellite and low cost, low tech and high tech and all these things, um, and really incentivizing people to do the hard work of integrating across platforms and creating methodologies for that, because these questions are coming really fast and we don't have time necessarily to design new technologies, um, but there's a lot of good technology out there that possibly could be adapted. And then that will help us better understand where are the gaps we really do need something new, like a new sensor or a whole new system. Maria, what do you think? Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. And I think um, while um, high tech sensors are always going to be um, uh, useful and useful in, in, and uh, in terms of, you know, cutting edge science, I think sometimes we need that um, some funding to go to the kind of cross calibration activities um, in where you're um, taking the, you know, well, a $2 million sensor and you're comparing it to the $10,000 sensor that the community is going to have in their hand. Because sometimes it's it's a matter of not necessarily the, the precision of the instruments, but being able to see the processes where the process is happening. And so, and also to empower and make those relationships with those local communities who will be your eyes, your, your eyes on the water. I mean, we, we've, um, with co cooperative fisheries research, for example, we have to make um, concessions about the quality of um, a given single measurement, but we're getting 300 um, instead of none um, during, you know, um, things being shut down. We're also having to kind of think a little more creatively about how we frame scientific questions because um, we may not be able to, I mean, we can't create a perfectly, um, a perfect sample grid. They're going to go where the fish are. And so, but at the same time, we can, act, we can use that, for example, to help inform, uh, to validate satellites that will fill in those gaps or to validate instruments or um, novel instruments. So I think having those kind of partnerships um, with, as you're doing those high-tech, low-tech um uh, inter calibrations, it's going to, um, I think it'll be fruitful. I completely agree. And I think it's not really being done at large scales. I think it's being done in small scales on people's volunteer time mm -hmm. um, or by groups like mine that are kind of nonprofits kind of trying to do these things with the pieces of funding that we get, but doing it at a large scale with a group of experts that has the expertise to do those, those assessments and to say, okay, it looks like you know, if you get a hundred samples of this quality, you're nearing the ability to make an, a, a judgment on this mm -hmm. um, and to be able to write those sort of decision trees of, okay, you could use this type of data to answer this type of question if you have this type of calibration process. I think that would be very useful. Okay, uh, Jason, you have a question. Yeah, thank you uh, both for the talk. This is Jason Link. Um, a, you partly touched on it in the answer to the first question, but a lot of the HABs community, OA community, focus on observations and measurements and uh, fancy sensors and all this stuff that I couldn't even begin to name that, that you all showed, so thank you. What I'm wondering is, what about predictions? What about forecasts? And you alluded to mechanistic understanding and that's great, but are we there yet? Or if not, what do we need to get to HABs forecast and not just in Lake Erie or Western Florida around the country? Thank, thank you. Right, um, and and I think in the near, near term, I think like the, the short term for, forecasts are where I think some of the rapid machine learning um, methods, even though we may lose some of that topology, some of those like physical mechanisms and we can look at, you know, where we can actually investigate the shapes of, uh, of the data. Um, we may lose some of that, but we get we get an answer. And then I think what needs to happen is that there needs to be some sort of retrospective analysis to look at how those rapid models and those rapid machine learning models, how they may spatially or temporally um, um, actually reproduce faithfully some of the biophysical interactions that we, we may be expecting. And they may also, 
depending on the type of model, they may actually produce new hypotheses and illuminate new interactions or that we that may have been obscured in the in, in the past. So, um, so I, I'm not sure if that if that um, answers are we there yet? I I think certainly in the West Coast, I I don't think we're there in terms of the, something mechanistic. Um, but uh, I mean, and in part because we may be able to tell when um, a, you know, as, as when pseudonychia is dividing or when it, even maybe when it's toxic, um, but we won't be able to necessarily um, couple, um, couple that with um, when the razor clam are feeding or, or, and because that might be up to local, you know, something very, very local and constrained. And so I, I think, there's still always going to be a need for observations, um, but I think there are ways that we can be much more savvy with our model intercomparisons than we maybe have been. Yeah, on the OA front, I'm definitely not the right person to answer that. I think like Sam Tiblethi, who's one of the people that Maria had on her, would be the, the right person to answer that. I do think that having heard Sam give a lot of talks and is that, the only places where I think we're approaching that modeling and predictive capacity is where there's a lot of data. I think that gives you an, a little bit of information about the importance of the monitoring. We are only able to produce any sort of reliable predictions in the places where we have the best, honestly, the best OA data in the world, which is in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and I think we have to recognize that. Now, are there other ways to collect that OA data that might be cheaper? Maybe, right? And so we don't necessarily have to do it the same way that it's been done here, um, but that's just the reality of, I think, being able to produce those types of models. But I think Sam Sedlecki is the best person to answer that question. I agree. Okay, uh, uh, Peter, you have a question, I think. Could, could you unmute and ask a question? Gladly, thank you all, that was fantastic. Um, so I'm going to sort of stumble through this. So bear with me if, if it's not very clear. But um, so often our approach to uh, <clears throat> um, understanding or meeting a, a kind of community needs is uh, is for NSF to reach out to academics and try and make informed decisions. But but sometimes I I um, I, I feel like we in the academy often. Uh, you know, fail to inverse, invert that model. Um, and what I'm getting at is, do you have suggestions for us and for the NSF on, or for all of us on how um, communities uh, might best represent uh, their their local needs? You know, in some cases, uh, they uh, some communities may be more financially replete than others, but they have a particular different set of concerns than others. And there's a lot of granularity that I think we lose. And I'm not, I'm not sure how to how to collate and present that information. I'm curious if you two have any ideas. Thank you. Um, so in terms of information transfer, um, at least with the fishing community. Um, our local Sea Grant and um, uh, Oregon Department of Fisheries and Wildlife, they've set up um, uh, a science and fisher, well, it used to be called a science and fisherman exchange or SAFE. And so it was kind of a closed door situation where the scientists and fishermen would um, have, a, um, have a dialogue. And that's a space I think where um, people felt safe enough to articulate their needs without necessarily having a shared vocabulary. Because that I think is a that's a, that's a stumbling point in in terms of what we would call like spatial variability, what that means, and all yeah. And so, um, and I think that's that's really useful. Um, it does require someone embedded in the community, um, at, who maybe is that part of a boundary organization or something that that can talk both talks and can. Um, get the people in the room who need to be in the room and because the flip side is is that it's part of our job right to go to conferences and go and, and listen and, and and dialogue it's part of um it's not part of a fisherman's money making right it's it's detracting them from from their work and so getting them is is really really a service and so part of this i mean and 
part of the things we've discussed is like how how do we compensate people for their participation, for their time, and for their honest feedback? And so, I, I mean, that that might be one. One I completely agree on the boundary organization. I was just going to say finding the boundary organizations, which is like kind of a, a buzzword, but like basically the people who are already in those spaces who already have the trust, it can take 10, 20 years to build that level of trust. C Grant, we already have that amazing institution in all of our states. So I think that's an obvious one and investing in them, but working with them um, to identify some of those needs um, because I think they're in the best position to answer some of those questions because it's really hard. And yeah, it, I think a lot of people are getting hit there as there's more emphasis on co-design and equity, a lot of these communities are getting more and more requests for their time, which is like the opposite of what I think is useful to then figuring out how to do that in a, a good way. And then again, I think the boundary organizations are the key, um, but also they need staff time because they're also getting overwhelmed. And so, if, you know, if it's the kind of thing where um, the academies and NSF want more of that engagement than figuring out if there's a strategy for that, for a national strategy for boundary organizations to get this type of feedback, you know, working with C-Grant, seeing how they're thinking about this from a national level, working in the interagency working groups to figure out how they're considering that because more and more agencies are putting co-design um, requirements in their funding proposals. Um, so you know, oftentimes that includes partnering with the C grant office in order to deliver on it, for example. Thank I, think you. Kersey, I think Kersey has a question and um, maybe if you pass the mic over. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so let me turn my camera on for the people that are on the call. So as part of the Infrastructure Act, that was passed, that Trillion Dollar Act that was passed back in 2021. There was an amendment to the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act where they empowered BOEM and BESI to have oversight over carbon sequestration in the ocean. And what's transpired from that is a number of terrestrial carbon sequestration companies pursuing and exploring the concept of deep sea carbon sequestration. And so, I recognize that the research on impacts is not there yet in terms of like having a well having that well fleshed out. But if you could speak to the concerns around that and how we balance that with the concerns for addressing climate change, especially with respect to what I've recognized from engaging with some of these groups, is that there's still a misperception about the interconnection of the ocean. And so there's a kind of view that, oh, we dump it in the deep sea and it's kind of gone goodbye. Thanks. You, you may have uh, spelled it out there, right? We don't understand. And that's the problem. Um, I think from the Ocean Foundation's perspective, we are very vocal that we think it's irresponsible to move forward without understanding the risks. And we think that there need to be uh, precautions in place to particularly protect communities that might be taken advantage of as far as experimentation of methods in their backyards, but also recognizing that the ocean is connected. And so any effects are effects for everybody. Um, we don't understand it. And there's a lack of understanding where a lot of these decisions are being made in policy spaces that are not ocean science spaces, in financial spaces that are not ocean science spaces. And so I think there's a need for the ocean science community to be vocal about what we don't understand and about what we know and what we don't know, because no one else is gonna be vocal about it if we're not vocal about it. Um, and so, yeah, what are the implications um, for you know, sinking biomass in the deep sea? Well, what does it mean to not know? What are the risks associated with not knowing? You know, does there need to be a statement about that? Who needs to make that statement? These conversations are happening. You're, again, you're gonna hear from a few people I think next, um, though I think it's important to note kind of where they're coming from in terms of industry or advocating for certain solutions. Not, you know, there's a lot of science driven work that's happening that's very good. I think there's also a lot of financially driven work that's happening right now. Um, and I think that there's a need for more rigorous statements from the scientific community, in my opinion, and I think in the Ocean Foundation's opinion. Um, okay, because well, we just uh... don't know. 
That's a great transition to the next speakers. And so I wanted to thank both of you for your contributions. Very interesting. Uh, research priorities for uh, uh, OCE Marine CDR. And we have two speakers. Uh, my agenda shows Julie first or David second, but whatever. Whoever wants to go first, go for it. Hi, everyone. This is Dave Koek here. Um, I think Julie and I talked about it and decided that I would go first. Um, so I'll get my screen share set up. Thanks, David. Okay. No Hi. problem. Can I actually preface um, do co-chair co yeah. prerogative um, with the thought about this next session? Because I think what Alexis said was really important. Um, you know, these conversations around marine carbon dioxide removal are happening. Companies are being formed. And so my personal thinking is that we need to be at the table. The science needs to be at the table when these conversations are being had, because it is important, like Alexis said, that the development of any of kind of mitigation technologies ha happen with the understanding of the science right there from the get go, right? And so I feel strongly that 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 you know just we we can't just um, we can't detach ourselves from that. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I'm super excited about this next panel because I think. Yeah, I'm hoping you all will give us ideas as to how we engage in a productive way with this work. So with that, I'll I'll hand it over to you, David, and, and back to back to you. Great. Well, um, thank you very much. I just want to check really quickly to see that my slides are projecting. Can somebody give me a thumbs up if that's the case? Yeah, we see. Okay, it. okay great. Great. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity, everyone. My name is Dave Koek. I'm the Chief Scientist of Ocean Visions. Um, and if you don't know, Ocean Visions is a US-based field building organization. We work to scale durable and equitable climate solutions. And we've done a lot of work around accelerating ocean-based carbon dioxide removal. We work as a network organization, which means that we're a relatively small nonprofit, but we work with a whole host of institutions that have excuse me, formal partnerships with Ocean Visions, they're shown on this graphic. And together we work to um, develop this agenda around uh, identifying, testing, evaluating, and ultimately scaling viable, equitable, durable climate solutions. So this is a really science-based effort. And I actually wanna speak to the comment about, um, I wanna speak to the comment from the, from the last speaker. Ocean Visions organized a, um, an open letter from the scientific community that now has over 400 signatories. These are PhDs in um, earth, ocean and climate science from around the world that is calling for responsible research for marine CDR technologies. And so if you're concerned about the environmental impacts of MCDR, you should want the science done. And if you think it's a good idea, you should want the science done. And if you're agnostic, you should want the science done because it's the science that will provide the evidence-based perspectives that can really help cool the temperature on the conversation around MCDR and help us drive towards uh, the most viable solutions the most quickly. So we're really at this place around CDR because of um, our relatively slow rate of decarbonization. And so I wanna take a step back here, just for those of you who don't know, and and give you just a very bit of brief history, which is that in 2018 or 2019, the IPCC released a special report on one and a half degree of warming. And this is what really set the stage and set the scientific basis for understanding and motivating the need for gigaton scale carbon dioxide removal. There's a very powerful statement in this that in order to limit warming to one and a half degrees uh, with limited or no overshoot, we need something like a hundred to a thousand gigatons of carbon dioxide removal this century. That partly depends on our rate of decarbonization and how well we can abate the hard to abate sectors. It also, um, uh, yeah, so every year that we continue to not decrease our emissions means that we're going to push ourselves further and further up this, up this ladder. So the question amongst the scientific community, the question is, not do we need carbon dioxide removal, it is where does that carbon dioxide removal come, come from? And if you wanna think about carbon dioxide removal 
as a means to rebalance the global carbon cycle, you have to understand the various reservoirs of the global carbon cycle. So this diagram is showing the various parts of the global um, of, of the global carbon cycle. The size of the dot here is proportional to the size of the reservoir. And then the yellow is showing the amount of anthropogenic carbon that has been emitted and where that uh, carbon has ended up. And what I wanna drive home to you on this plot here is that the deep ocean is by far and away the largest reservoir of carbon on the planet. It's so large that if you took all of the anthropogenic carbon that's ended up in our atmosphere and somehow magically put it in the ocean, it would increase ocean or deep ocean dissolved inorganic carbon levels by less than 1%. And so when we think about the global carbon cycle, it's really impossible to escape the idea that we could reach gigaton scale carbon dioxide removal without the oceans playing sub some substantial role. Now there's a whole host of technologies that um, can contribute to providing ocean-based carbon dioxide removal. They're put together on this infographic um, or this schematic here. And they basically span biological and chemical pathways. And fundamentally, all of them are about either speeding up um, photosynthesis in the ocean so that the oceans can capture more carbon via photosynthesis and then sequester that carbon in the deep ocean, or they are chemical approaches that enhance the alkalinity of the ocean in order to allow the oceans to store more carbon in the form of dissolved inorganic carbon or more specifically bicarbonate. There's uh, lots of um, minor details and nuances here, but for the principles of this talk, I think that's what's most relevant. Ocean Visions has been doing a lot of work for the last three or four years to try to accelerate the research and development. And notice I'm not saying the word deployment, but the research and development of marine CDR technologies. We've built this suite of online living digital roadmaps. Uh, you can find them on our website, oceanvisions.org. And they are broken down by specific technologies for ocean-based carbon dioxide removal, as well as some of the cross-cutting social and governance challenges and opportunities that are needed to uh, create the enabling environment for responsible research and development. Each of those maps are broken down into three domains, the state of the technology, the, which goes into the scalability that what we know about the state of the technology currently, the environmental risks, the environmental co-benefits, the social risks and the social co-benefits. Once we know the state of the technology, it helps inform the development gaps and needs, which are the second domain. This is what we don't know. And then the first order priorities, which are tractable actions that can be taken to address those knowledge gaps and therefore improve the state of the technology. So like I said, these have existed um, on our website for some time now. And one of the things that we have been working on very recently is bringing these into a cohesive narrative framework. And so this is a white paper that we've just produced. Um, it is in press and, and should be coming out very shortly, like in the next week or two. And the basic idea here behind this white paper is to ask the question, what needs to be done between now and 2030 in order to do all of the science and engineering that's necessary to figure out whether or not these are viable climate solutions. And so by viable, I mean, are these effective at drawing down carbon dioxide removal or drawing down carbon dioxide with acceptable environmental and social impacts? And I think we shouldn't kid ourselves that if we're going to have gigaton scale carbon removal, that we would be able to do that in a way that has no environmental impacts or no social impacts. So it's really a question about um, characterizing those and, and society coming together and trying to determine what are acceptable. And that, of course, all of that needs to be done on a comparative risk assessment um, for other mitigation technologies, as well as the substantial risks of doing nothing. Okay, so this um, white paper basically has three pillars. They're all interconnected. There's science and engineering, there's policy, and then there's scalability. And for the purposes of um, this briefing for the committee and thinking about NSF's agenda for the next 10 years, I really want to focus on this science and engineering pillar. And the science and engineering pillar has a number of needs. 
Principally, I think the number one area that must be supported by governments around the world, the US as well as others, are um, a series of controlled field trials for the various MCDR technologies that allow you to make data-driven statements about efficacy and impacts. There's a number of precursors that need to happen in order to support those controlled field trials. I think we need collaborative design processes to bring people together to agree on how those field trials should be designed and executed. And we also need the spaces in order to do them. So one concept that's been advanced are pre-permitted test beds. These are sites in the ocean that have one central regulatory authority. And so everybody applies and comes in under a sub permit. And it basically allows you to accelerate the pace of responsible research. There are still outstanding um, laboratory and mesocosm science questions. I think a really good model here was NSF's um, OAP or Ocean Acidification Program. Uh, I think that there could be, um, uh, there's just very, very strong analogies. And so seeing a very similar program set up for addressing laboratory and mesoscience, meso mesocosm science questions is really key. There are a number of needs around um, monitoring, reporting, and verification related technologies. We need uh, advanced capabilities and sensors. We need even higher resolution models and the uh, associated advances in compute that allow those models to become feasible. And then we need advances in um, data assimilation capabilities that allow us to integrate models and data to produce the most accurate forecasts and estimates. And finally, I think we need a really coordinated social science research program. I think NSF should get involved in this. OCE should be involved in this. And they sh one possibility would be to co collaborate with the Directorate for Social, Behavioral, and Economic Sciences. I think as much as possible, the social science research should be coordinated with field trials so that we're assessing, um, we're assessing uh, key social science hypotheses in the context of R&D that is actually happening. And it should be coordinated with other governments around the world because um, social contexts can differ and uh, different communities, different cultures will have very different risk perceptions. So with that, I'd just like to say thank you very much um, for the opportunity to speak. And I'm really looking forward to hearing Julie speak and I'd be happy to answer any other questions that I can. Thanks. Okay, I think we'll um, hold the questions until the second speaker goes. And so, Julie, uh, you're on. Uh, Julie, are, are you ready for your presentation? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm trying to share my screen. Let me see. I think I'm really close. We see it. Just need to Is start. Is it working? It. Yep. It's, it is. Okay, super. Thanks. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, some of you all know me from my past life um, as an academic. Um, I left that five years ago to help lead um, a startup in the climate risk space, and now I'm on the investing side. And Tuba, I just wanted to um, say appreciation for your comments about John Allen. As you know, I was one of his um, few students that he trained. I did my PhD at OSU. And I'm so sorry to have missed um, the tribute. I My flight got delayed and I was flying back from Iceland um, at the time of the tribute, but um, sending sending my thoughts to you all in, in the community on, on such a, a big loss. Um, on my flight, I did get to see the OOI um, Erminder uh, installation, flew right off the tip of Greenland and um, really happy to see that terrific work spotlighted. Um, Propeller uh, is a venture capital fund uh, that was set up in order to accelerate ocean climate solutions. We have um, a founding core partnership with Woods Hole Oceanographic. So we look at technologies um, within Woods Hole and ocean science more generally to help solve um, the climate crisis that we find ourselves in. Um, the uh, the other activities in our fund relate to investing out in the market. We're very, very early, so pre-seed and seed stage. And we really want to catalyze um, the acceleration of climate solutions. And one of the motivations for setting up the fund was actually the recognition of the transformations happening in the new blue economy. So these are along the different dimensions you see over on the right. Um, 
Rick Spenrad, who is, who's known to many of us, has articulated so clearly um, what is entailed in the new blue economy. And there's a range of different estimates on the scale of, of the new blue economy, but it's on the order of um, several hundred billion dollar market value in the transformations that need to happen in the not in in the very very near term those um those areas show up in our themes for our investments you can see in the turquoise um, highlighted under ocean carbon ocean organics and ocean industrials are the areas that overlap with the new blue economy there are other areas that fall um, somewhat outside of the new blue economy and that includes um, ocean CDR and the associated monitoring, reporting, and verification that would underpin ocean CDR as well as the blue carbon areas uh, seen above in the turquoise. The um, as David mentioned, the the a recent IPCC report really um, emphasizes the role that negative emissions will play in meeting uh, the net, net zero goals. And those different approaches, um, when you look across what it, what it will take to do those negative emissions represent waste management on a really massive scale. So by some estimates, um, you can see low and high estimates there by 2030, these just in and of themselves are hundreds of billions of dollars market growing to potentially over a trillion dollars by 2050. So this is why you know, growing markets, large markets um, are accelerating interest, not just from the investing side, um, but, but from startups uh, as well. So some of the, the areas that David mentioned um, are listed in a slightly different way here in this diagram that shows on the y-axis, the technological readiness for deployment at scale for ocean-based CDR. And on the x-axis is the advancement potential for um, via new research development and demonstration. So um, you can see that the a lot of those approaches that David mentioned are captured here and, and, and they, re they require, as, an, as the prior National Academy of Sciences report mentioned, um, a significant investment in order to um, research them and understand their potential uh, to scale and to, to progress along a TRL um, and an, a, a research and development um, framework. I, I, I didn't want to leave this topic before pointing out that the uh, current cost of carbon dioxide removal um, is quite high. Um, and this is a report from CDR.FYI which um, shows some of the, the companies and approaches that are now being um, offered um, through advanced market commitments. There's a, a fund called Frontier Fund, that fund that's over a billion dollars from some mainly tech companies who have come together and said that um, by making advanced market commitments, they can help accelerate the, te the technology, lower the cost, and lead to greater scalability of some of these approaches. And marine CDR is representing a growing part of the portfolio. You see it here is the in the um, purple and the dark green, the macro algae, and some of the um, enhanced weathering approaches like Project Vesta. But as you can see, these the the price of these is. Um, is per ton is still um, e extremely high and these subsidies from Frontier Fund, for instance, um, are really designed to, to grow these capabilities and make them more affordable. So just a few um, closing thoughts on research needs and marine CDR. Um, as I mentioned, I mean, there's a huge opportunity to, on the technology side, really produce sufficient gains in carbon removal. So leading to lower power, more scalable um, technologies, advancing the TRL and the, the, the RD and D um, aspects of existing technologies is a really important area. Also, innovation. I mean, we see these waves of innovation on CDR and particularly ocean CDR. There's more and more hybrid approaches that really work with the natural systems. That are are coming in to the in and they kind of they defy easy categorization, but are some of the more promising approaches that are emerging. 
On the science side, um, it's come up before during today, the importance of widespread carbonate chemistry monitoring. Um, it was also mentioned in relation to OOI monitoring, the importance of um, understanding the ch and measuring the changes in the stability of ocean carbon sinks. Um, for instance, that might be uh, changed through um, shifts in AMOC or the, the weakening of AMOC ecosystem impacts. Um, and also research to inform and or advance and or advance regulatory frameworks for how to approach the um, the use of these technologies. The um, Pegley had really a beautiful phrase, climate scale observatory, and I want to echo that here and um, really emphasize the importance of novel adaptive multi-use platforms. Um, with low cost sensors and that can build on the capabilities and really hopefully expand capabilities like BCG Argo and CO2 direct flux measurements that were are, were shown so um, nicely through on the OOI platform. Um, also, I think it's really important to improve near term high resolution decadal modeling, particularly with the advent of new generative AI tools like the transformer architectures and diffusion models for uncertainty that were mentioned during the um, the AI session earlier. Uh, I wanted to just draw attention to a few things. I was part of a CLIVAR ARC transition study group. It came out um, with the report in August and the whole approach of our study was really looking at strategic uh, use cases driven by climate extremes and impacts and to really um, examine the ways that the the measurements and locations of measurements can really tie into societal needs and understanding climate extremes. And there's a lot of strategies in there for funding agencies um, who are, are looking at that ARC interface. A couple of themes I wanna draw out. Um, one is on workforce preparation. We're seeing a really strong need for um, people trained in data science. It's These are our physicians that are are just growing over time, also in climate tech and just general climate science. And the importance of diversity here was also brought up by, um, by Luann. Um, in terms of orchestration and coordination, uh, you know, NSF has a lot of program centers and initiatives. And one of the things that um, I was part of in National Academy of Sciences um, study group on sustaining ocean observations, and we were really drawn to the concept of a collective impact organization that can act as a backbone and create the interstitial connectivity to a range of different activities that could span industry startups, national labs, and be very nimble and agile, and yet really um, create transcendent outcomes that go beyond the capabilities of any one of those entities. So an example that's come up through NSF in a collaboration with NOAA are these um, industry uh, consortia and this new one announced between NSF and NOAA on climate um, risk um, as it relates to the insurance sector is the latest one. There's also been one on wildfire risk in the climate space. So I wanted to draw your attention to that. I think this is almost my last slide. Um, uh, there was just a, a announced a dear colleague letter from NSF on interest in CO2 removal and solar radiation management strategies. Um, and this uh, uh, emphasizes that the, the mm, it's, it's essentially a drawing attention to these topics and there isn't a dedicated funding line or a um, particular call for proposals that's associated with it. And yet it covers a lot of different groups within NSF um, GEO. And so I think there's an opportunity here to reach also over to the TIP directorate or some sort of focused research organization for potential programs that really center CDR um, research development and demonstration, and also climate scale modeling and observing um, that could really get at some of the fundamental questions we have about tipping points in, in the Earth system. Um, thanks for your attention. I'd be really happy to to answer questions and get, engage in a discussion. Thank you.
Excellent. Thank you to both you, David and Julie. Um, I think you all hit hit this at just the right level for us. Um, there's already some questions coming in on Slido, and I see multiple questions that are really, um, you know, variations of the same question. So I'll call on on one of those who asked a question. Um, uh, it's sort of maybe that belongs into this family. Kersey, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, and. I saw that a number of people also kind of asked similar questions. So I'll try to incorporate their questions into my overall question, which is really related to recognizing that the industry related to carbon dioxide removal is far ahead of the science. And I know, David, you were talking about this timeline of the amount of research we need to do, and I think it was 2030, by 2030 or something to that effect, if I'm remembering that correctly. And it occurred to me that right now, there are organizations that are applying for permits and getting them to do pilot projects for marine carbon sequestration. So how do we, as a science community, kind of balance the need to both do work for an industry that's moving faster than we have answers for in terms of impacts? And more importantly, how do we avoid being in this position in the future for um, other potential uh, other potential impacts that humans might cause from uh, innovative desires to utilize the, the ocean in various capacities? I'll maybe David, start here. Yeah, why don't you start? Yeah, so your second question is very difficult to answer, but let's start with the first because that's tractable and that's actually happening on the ground. Sorry, so I'll just add that I think part of the answer is in more engagement with private industry from the science community, but mm -hmm. go ahead. Well, I think you foreshadowed my response, which is that um, I think you're right to characterize a lot of activity in the um, MCDR industry, the very nascent but growing MCDR industry. And I think the ac academic community is quite frankly at a crossroads where you can collectively as a body decide that you wanna lean in to engagement with MCDR, uh, the private sector, or you can decide that you don't wanna, that you wanna lean out. And my recommendation is to lean in because it's only by leaning in that you can help steer the ship and help make sure that those pilot projects are being done to the best available science. I wanna stress that many of the pilot projects that are um, being done and led by these companies are um, founded on technologies and often have members of their founding team that are among some of the best scientists and engineers that we have in this country. Um, and so I'm thinking about examples like Ebb Carbon that was founded on technology developed by Dr. Matt Eisenman as an example. And there's many other examples like that. And so I think a challenge for the whole community right now is to think about and get comfortable with the idea of new models of partnership and collaboration that are going to cross traditional sectors. So that means that academics, industry, and national labs, and even some nonprofits are all gonna be working together. And I think the question to ask is not necessarily who's leading these pilot projects, but how are they being done? Are they transparent? Are they equitable? Are they inclusive? Have they engaged local communities? Are they collecting data in a manner that facilitates outside scrutiny and transparency? And if the answers to those questions are yes, then I think those are really strong indicators to lean in. Thank you, David. Julie, do you have thoughts on this? No, I have nothing more to add. Yeah, David, you did do a really good job. Um, I guess I will just add a little bit of a story um, that I might have shared with some of you, but certainly not all of you, a much smaller example of how this can play out um, is sort of the experience that we've had with the wave energy industry here in Oregon, where about 15 years ago, all of a sudden, wave energy wanted to come to Oregon. They realized we have big waves. Big waves have big energy. Um, and I think what we did choose to do with the help of organizations like Sea Grant um, was to lean in. Um, and essentially, one of the things that happened is that the development of the industry did slow down. It did. 
because now we were we had sort of gotten into this mode of you know community engagement and making sure that we take environmental impacts into account one step at a time testing first in the lab then maybe in the bay um, and right now we're building it the first grid connected wave energy testing facility for the United States and so off the coast of Oregon again with the idea that this is a pre-permitted place uh, but it also comes with very strict environmental monitoring requirements so the moment something starts going in the wrong direction we can yank this thing and you know stop that trial um, and so David I'm, I'm hearing you say some of these words now the example that I gave is you know the the potential environmental impacts are tiny compared to what we're talking about here in terms of marine CDR but nonetheless, it feels like that's the kind of approach, David, that you're talking about. And we do have a, an example of that being successful in pacing the industry development so that we can do things responsibly. I, I want to respond to that very quickly with one point, which is that my comments were about an accelerated research and development agenda, which includes um, starting with small scale field trials. And I think we often have this, um, uh, we often have this mindset where we think these small scale field trials won't matter at all for climate benefits, but that they are likely to have the same kinds of environmental impacts as gigaton scale deployment operations. And I think we, that's not true. We have to be, we have to really consider that the size of the field trial is um, likely to dictate both any carbon sequestration benefit as well as any environmental impacts. And so if we do this in a really careful and stage-gated way, we can learn and the size of these field trials can increase and we can mitigate environmental risks associated with those field trials. But I think it's it's not right to assume that very small scale field trials that may or may not commence in the next few years would have um, lasting, irreversible, substantial impacts to marine ecosystems. There's no historical precedent for that. Yeah, very good. Thank you, David. Now, the one thing that you did say, though, is that you said you were imagining an accelerated program. So I guess maybe another way to think about the question that um, uh, the question that uh, um, Kersey asked, thank you, um, is to think about, you know, if the industry is moving so fast, maybe another way to approach it is to have our research accelerate. Um, is, is that sort of where you were going with that, David, or no? Yeah, exactly. That's what I was um, talking about, laying out that agenda and how NSF can be really supportive of this. Again, I think the biggest thing that NSF can be doing is funding um, really carefully well-designed field trials that are designed to give information at relevant spatial and temporal scales about the efficacy and impacts of any one of these technologies. There's a whole host of ancillary other science needs that I laid out, you know, MRV related needs, fundamental laboratory and mesocosm science needs and social science research. But that's the single biggest ticket item. And I, I just wanna put some numbers there. We, we did a budgeting exercise where we designed what a field trial would look like if you did um, research for sinking seaweed. And, you know, large scale field trials are likely to run into the tens to hundreds of millions of dollars. That's dependent upon the duration and the size and the scope. But I just, I really want to put that out there so that, you know, you're all, when you're all thinking about NSF's priorities for the next decade, you have it really clear in your mind how expensive this science is going to be. And that's why I think it's really critical that governments step in. Mm -hmm. There is a question on Slido um, from one of our online participants, I think and I'll read it, um, CDR research makes sense. Does it make sense to move? Oh, 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 it's not one of our, so I'll hand the microphone to the person who asked this question. Yeah, I, I, I saw a talk last week at Scientific Talk about uh, marine CDR and the research. Uh, research was widely, widely supported by the scientific audience, but the person started their talk by saying that, that large scale deployment of uh, technology, uh, large scale deployments of CDR makes no sense if if we don't cut emissions first, or at least drastically reduce them. And I wonder what you think about that, because it would, you know, by 2030, there's not going to be a, a huge cut in emissions it's, it's based on everything we've seen. And, and, uh, and yet, perhaps the companies themselves are starting to move toward large scale uh, uh, C, uh, marine CDR by 2030. Is that 
can you comment on that? Julie, do you want to um, take the first stab? I've been talking a lot. So emissions reductions is always the best solution and it won't be enough. And so, you know, the research program that David's organization has laid out, Ocean Visions, for what it will, will take to um, understand how these technologies work to de-risk them relative to the climate risks that we face and to um, do that stage gating. I mean, that's a multi-year process. And quite frankly, it's in some ways open-ended. Like we don't know when we're going to get there with any particular technology, but that shouldn't hold us back from going forward with it. Just like you know, based on the global stock take, we are headed for a 2.6 degree C world, and that's based on the latest global stock take. Um, and yet we shouldn't stop emissions reductions. We should actually, you know, amplify what we're doing, and we just need to go a lot faster. And so um, I, I think, I mean, the urgency is clear is clear to everyone, and I think that there is an ability to move forward on on multiple multiple fronts, but but it, it absolutely is incredible. It's vital that the emissions um, reductions uh, happen. There will still be some sectors that will be really difficult to eliminate all emissions from, and that's you know, that's why you see those plots of the of the net zero and the the expectation that some of the countries aren't going to meet their emissions targets. So for all of those reasons, the negative emissions need to need to occur um the ocean piece of that the ocean cdr is is the one that we're talking about today there are also terrestrial and air sides of the cdr component that you all may be familiar with as well so i want to expand on the question that jim just asked because there is a question that i've heard asked um there is uh, in, there is one thought that uh, com countries that don't actually want to reduce their emissions um, because it is so difficult will instead move into this mode of operation of funding climate intervention technologies to almost take the spotlight off of the fact that they're not reducing their emissions. And maybe that work on climate interventions will involve yet more increased emissions so the sort of negative feedback loop, is that something you've heard about? I was kind of a little uh, taken aback by that question and not sure how to answer it. I have cert, I mean, that is one of the concerns that people have raised that there is sort of a moral hazard with employing something like solar radiation management because it decreases the um, incentives to decarbonize and to scale up durable carbon removal. I would say, look, if the, my understanding of this um, um, committee's um, purpose is to develop a research agenda for NSF for the next 10 years. And if that's correct, I would say that the questions around MCDR are some of the most fundamental and substantial that I think um, NSF's Ocean Science Division could wrap its head around. And, and so I think that those questions are philosophical and important, but I think they're really separate from places where NSF can make a really meaningful contribution to generating new knowledge that answers questions about whether or not these um, technologies are going to be viable climate solutions. And that's still an outstanding question. It's possible that the answer to that is no. I want to be, I want to be super clear there. But I think we all collectively have a responsibility to look. And I think NSF is really well positioned to be one of the leaders in helping us look collectively as society. Very well done, David. You brought us right back to our statement of task. You belong in a National Academy Committee. Well done, well done. Um, so more questions are pouring in. I see, Jay-Z, that you put in a question. Would you like to ask that? If I got you a microphone? Here, here. Yeah, I have uh, multiple questions in, but I'll just keep it to sort of one central question, which has to do with, you know, for better or worse, we have to rely on Earth system models to, in some ways, project the impacts of one ocean acidification in general, but um, CDR, especially for we're using, say, ocean or alkalinity enhancement. And so 
are we in at a state where the models, where, where there is this sort of um, collaboration with the modeling community, uh, one, and are the models still not good enough to accurately project the impacts of uh, ocean CDR? Julie, so you're the modeling an, expert. Yeah, this is an active area of, of research. Um, you know, there's multiple groups working very quickly to improve um, biogeochemistry and applying it to these um, kind of use cases. The, the NOP um, proposal, our uh, proposal called ARPA-E, have been government, um, and, and NOAA in and of itself have been um, funding lines that have supported the coordinated um, research between the modeling academics and some startups to really tackle how these um, work together and how they interplay and the ability to assess um, the efficacy of these technologies when they might be um, trialed and in at a in very um, small pilot projects. Um, and it's I I look it's a it's a it's a to do this on the scale that is required it's an absolute grand challenge it's the sort of grand challenge that in the past the nsf has just risen to the occasion i mean i was with some people the other day um philanthropic funding and as they sort of thought about the what all of this entails i mean they started talking about manhattan project scale funding to really um get accomplish what needs to be done here. I mean, it's a, it's a breathtaking ambition on the modeling, on the observing side, on the technology development side. And there's just so much at stake that I don't see how we can, we can fail at it. I mean, there'll be certain technologies that will fail. And then we move forward with new ones. I mean, we, 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 we just have to go after this and figure out um, what will work, um, how, when, and where. And the models are really key to all of it. We, thank you, Julie. We have another question online um, on Slido that sort of pertains to what you just said about how we move forward. Mona, do you wanna ask your question? Sure. Hi, Julie. Hi, David. Hi, Mona. <laughs> Thanks so much for your, for your remarks. I wanted to ask you um, a question related to governance. So the open ocean is relatively free from um, regulation. And so could you reflect on the kind of governance frameworks that will be required to facilitate research on MCDR? I'm also thinking in the context of deep sea mining, for example, you know, how do we how do we think about frameworks in which science and technology advances on issues like this? Julie, do you want to start or you want me to start? Yeah, you, you spent more time on this one. Get, you go ahead. So I, I would contest the statement that the um, high seas are relatively free of governance. You know, the UNCLAWS, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, the London Convention and London Protocol, the recently signed um, BBNJ Treaty of Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdictions. I do think, and it's relatively recognized within the scholarly community that studies these things, that none of these governance regimes are fit for purpose for marine carbon dioxide removal, research and development, much less deployment. And so one of the outstanding needs of the field is governance clarity and regulatory clarity, both within national waters and in international waters. Um, there are a number of efforts underway to try to provide that regulatory clarity within US waters, I'll, I'll highlight two. Um, one is the recently announced Fast Track Action Committee through the Office of Science, or through, excuse me, um, it was announced through the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, it has representatives from um, 12 federal agencies who are sitting there to consider the science, technology, permitting, and governance needs for MCDR research in U.S. waters. There's another effort that was released by um, Columbia University to propose a model federal law that would streamline the permitting process for doing responsible research in U.S. waters. At the international scale, though, moving beyond the U.S., um, it is... A lot, there's a lot of confusion and lack of clarity about how people may or may not move forward with research and development projects. And especially when those research and development projects may include um, 
uh, financial interests. Um, and so that's actually like a, an area of contention and consideration and deliberation that um, was just re-energized in the last week or two with some announcements that came out of the International Maritime Organization and some analysis of those um, comments. And the reality is that you can talk with multiple people right now and get multiple interpretations. So there's a, a big need for um, clarity there. Wow, great. Thank you very much, David. And thank you very much, Julie. We are unfortunately out of time. I feel like this conversation could go on for much longer. Um, clearly, this is an area where I am sensing some discomfort in the room in a way that I didn't earlier in the day. Um, so the, these are topics that we just need to keep talking about. So I really appreciate the input, David and Julie. Okay, we're going to uh, move on and uh, to the next topic, which is uh, uh, critical minerals, potential uh, potential topic for us to include in our report. And uh, we have two speakers. One is um, uh, Beth Orcutt and Amy, I um, can't read my own writing, or can't, uh, Garmin. And um, not sure who's supposed to, who wants to speak first, but whoever is going to go first is welcome to start. Great. Um, thanks for the intro, Jim. I'll go first. Let's see if I succeed at the sharing. Um, yeah, he looks good. Okay. Um, great. Is it still in presentation mode? You had, it, you had it going for a minute and uh, okay, now it, I lost it. Let me yeah, try again. Yeah. Let's go ahead and start. I'll, I'll okay. just hit the start. There, you got it now. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks again for the invitation to, to speak. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, chat about critical minerals uh, for this um, NSF OCE um, meeting. Um, I wanted to start with some background uh, on the topic that we're discussing, uh, most specifically uh, untangling a few different terms, uh, intersecting phrases that are sometimes used as though they're synonyms, um, but they're really not. And those phrases are marine minerals, um, deep sea minerals, marine mineral resources, and critical minerals, um, specifically in, in this sphere, critical minerals relevant to the marine zone. Um, so first, I'd like to introduce the topic of deep sea minerals. Um, so the three uh, deep sea minerals that are most often discussed um, are cobalt-rich ferromanganese crusts, polymetallic nodules, and polymetallic sulfides, also known as ferromanganese crusts, ferromanganese nodules, um, and, and hydrothermal sulfide minerals. Um, they uh, are the only three that have been defined by the International Seabed Authority, uh, which is the body that's tasked with regulating seabed mining in areas outside of uh, domestic waters. Um, and so they're uh, the only three that have exploration uh, contracts issued um, in those waters. Um, to date, there has been no mining uh, of any of these three mineral types anywhere in the ocean. They occur in completely different ocean environments. Uh, crusts are predominantly found on, on seamounts and hard rock surfaces. Um, nodules uh, are predominantly found on, on abyssal plains. Um, I'll note that there's also seamount nodules, but those vary significantly in extent and composition compared to abyssal plain nodules. So the purpose of this talk, uh, we're gonna talk about abyssal plain nodules. Nodule is just a morphological term. Um, and then hydrothermal minerals uh, form anywhere you have extensional uh, settings. Um, the points uh, on the bottom are showing the elements, uh, the minerals that, that these um, minerals are of interest for. Get into that uh, in a little bit. And then I've folded the elements um, that are on the current critical minerals list. So cobalt-rich manganese crusts are being discussed as potential sources for manganese cobalt nickel copper, um, and then potentially rare earth elements, um, maybe some other uh, minerals as byproducts. 
Um, polymetallic nodules are, are being discussed as potential sources for nickel, copper, cobalt, manganese uh, with potential byproduct uh, for thalamates and lithium. Um, and then uh, polymetallic sulfides are, are considered potential resources for copper, zinc, silver, gold, and lead. Um, so there's a, a couple of other types of uh, deep sea minerals um, that are a little bit less frequently discussed. I do want to acknowledge them, but I think they're less relevant to the critical marine minerals lens. Um, we can get into this later, and I'm happy to chat about them, um, including in the, the Q&A. Uh, but those are phosphorite minerals, uh, which is phosphorites or sedimentary rock with a high concentration of phosphate minerals. Uh, there's a number of different settings in which marine phosphates, uh, phosphorites occur. Um, most, um, most relevant are, are those occurring on continental shelves uh, and slopes. Um, and then there's also rare earth element in, in neutrium rich mines. Um, so these occur in deep water abyssal plains with low sedimentation rates. And they often they can co-occur co with nodules. Um, the rare earth elements in, in these are, are appetite hosted and they occur fairly deep into the sediment column. So not uh, so it's right on the floor, sea floor, um, but five or, or more meters into the sediment um, column. So um, these maps, uh, again, for crusts, nodules, um, and hydrothermal minerals, which I'm not describing by the, the geologic terms uh, that refer to them, uh, rather than the economic geology or commodity terms, uh, because crusts and nodules are both predominantly composed of ferromanganese, uh, whereas cobalt-rich uh, refers to cobalt being an element of interest in them. They're not made of cobalt, uh, same thing with polymetallic. Uh, all of these minerals are, are polymetallic, uh, but polymetallic refers to the fact that that's uh, the potential uh, commodity profile. Um, so these maps, uh, specifically those for crusts and nodules, show the areas uh, that crusts and nodules are predicted to occur based on oceanographic and geologic criteria. Um, we They don't show locations uh, containing mineral deposits. Um, same thing with hydrothermal minerals. We've highlighted uh, extensional settings, so mid-ocean ridges, arcs, and back arcs. Um, so, um, these, uh, again, we could overlay these maps with regions where uh, we've sampled uh, particular uh, examples of, of all of these mineral types. Um, but again, uh, it helps refine the predictions, but it does not um, show us a mineral resource, right? One sample, a handful of samples does not indicate a mineral resource. Um, so what is this distinction that I'm making between marine minerals as geologic and oceanographic occurrences, uh, which are widespread for ferromagnes, we refer to them as the most ubiquitous in the global ocean, uh, versus marine minerals as potential commodities, right? Because um, there is a distinction here. Um, and so marine mineral resources are those that occur uh, in such form and amount that economic extraction is currently or potentially feasible. Um, and since no mining of deep ocean minerals specifically has occurred to date, um, that's actually a bit a little bit tricky uh, to consider where these cutoffs may be. But I would argue the really crucial point here is that there is in fact a cutoff. Uh, there is a distinction. And when we happen to see uh, some seamount nodules or some thermines crust on an ROB dive, um, it's not it's not valid. We can't immediately refer to that as a as a resource um, or a potential resource without um, more information about the minerals um, extent and composition. Um, and so that's the few steps of background uh, before we get to the topic that we're actually here for today, which is critical minerals. Um, so critical minerals. I've got the definition here up here at the top. Um, is a non-fuel mineral or mineral material 
central to the economic or national security of the U.S. and has a supply chain vulnerable to disruption. Um, so a few points specifically, uh, this definition is from the Energy Act of 2020. It is a U.S. specific definition. Um, and uh, besides uh, that fact, um, the other thing uh, that I need to point out um, is that this, this list uh, can change through time, right? So um, it's based on um, supply risk, uh, disruption potential, trade exposure, economic vulnerability. Um, all of these factors are, are factors about, um, they're not intrinsic to the minerals themselves. Uh, they have to do with the minerals as commodities um, and within the supply chain. Um, and so I think that's, that's a really crucial thing um, to keep in mind. Um, again, because deep ocean minerals are not currently in the supply chain. Um, and so, uh, uh, I think uh, this is a really interesting contrast with the maps that we've been looking at earlier, um, because the maps we've been looking at before are the really broad regions in the oceans where we predict uh, marine minerals to occur. Um, and now we're looking at locations where marine minerals are known to occur and have quantitative resource data um, to go with that. So uh, within the Clarion Clipperton zone, which is broadly outlined here, there are a number of subregions where a resource um, has in fact been demonstrated. Um, potential commodities to be extracted from nodules in the CCC include nickel, manganese, cobalt, and copper. So nickel, manganese, and cobalt are critical minerals. So we can say that those are uh, potential deep ocean critical minerals um, in, the, in the near term. Um, Again, for uh, polymetallic sulfide locations, um, potential commodities of interest include copper, zinc, silver, gold, maybe lead. Zinc is a critical mineral. Um, so those are potentially um, near term uh, critical minerals of relevance to this sphere. Um, another uh, uh, topic that I'd like to briefly throw in there, um, I think. This group is mainly interested in deep ocean minerals, but coastal minerals are an entirely uh, different category. Um, coastal minerals are currently extracted um, most significantly um, tin from offshore Indonesia. Um, so that is a current uh, critical mineral potentially of, of interest uh, to the sphere that I think we don't typically talk about because it's not a, a deep ocean mineral. Um, and that's what we usually uh, put together. Um, but I think um, one of the really important things to keep in mind is that if you want to move beyond, uh, so tin, which is entering the supply chain in, in the coast, um, and a handful of other locations where we do have um, deep ocean minerals that have been delineated, um, the uncertainty is not just about uh, environmental setting um, and, and potential consequences of extraction, but the uncertainty extends to the minerals themselves, uh, whether the minerals constitute a resource, uh, whether or not in a specific location, um, if they have the potential to enter the supply chain and the time frame over which that may occur. So it's kind of a, a big um, level of uncertainty. Um, what Given that, how do you decide where to prioritize work uh, beyond, beyond those handful of regions? Um, I'd suggest this is a really great opportunity for partnerships, um, because as far as I'm aware, economic geology is not something that's been emphasized in OCE for quite a while. Even in the terrestrial sphere, I'd suggest that it's a, a discipline that's been de-emphasized in the US for quite a while. Um, and just to, to, to excuse me, um, to expand uh, beyond a couple of locations that are well uh, measured and constrained, um, we need um, partnerships are they're really crucial. Um, if you don't want to end up with heavy investments in regions that fall under the broad umbrella, um, those those really broad maps where it may contain critical minerals, um, but when we do the work, we find that they might actually have no relevance um, from a critical minerals perspective. Um, briefly, uh, I think also challenges and priorities relate to uh, assets to do the work with the exception of critical minerals. Um, 
most of the areas of interest that we're talking about are at abyssal depths that require ships and, and assets to do that um, work. Um, so in the U.S., it's pretty exclusively uh, UNOS global class vessels plus abyssal depth winch wire. Um, for mineral quantification for coin or dredging, uh, drilling is a is a requirement. Um, and um, I think, uh, yeah, another uh, opportunity and a, a broad challenge for OCD. You know, there's a number of studies that are working on uh, potential uh, impacts in a given location. Um, but I think what's harder to address in a more community scale question um, is, is how far do those impacts extend um, and uh, affect broader marine processes and, and what thresholds for these may be. So uh, I think I, over time, uh, sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, can everybody in the room hear me okay? Yeah, well, yeah, you had it you had it up there a minute ago. Yeah, there. looks good. All right. Um, thank you, Amy, for that uh, introduction. Thank you to the committee for inviting me to speak today. Um, I want to recognize that, um, you know, there's a lot of traumatic events going on in the world that might be distracting your attention. So thank you for spending the time thinking about this topic. Um, I will try to be an engaging final speaker for this uh, day, very long day for the committee. Um, and I look forward to the Q&A. <clears throat> um, for anybody that doesn't know me, uh, Beth Workut, I'm the Vice President for Research at Big Oat Laboratory, but I'm really here on behalf of the COBRA um, NSF funded a cell net, um, which is really trying to think about um, research gaps in this space. Um, and so if you don't know about COBRA, there's our places to find us online. Uh, and so this is my perspective on some science priorities related to the critical minerals, right? Uh, Amy gave us a good background about how we use these terms. Um, so I'll, I'll try to follow that. <clears throat> um, uh, I like to start with an image like this to really frame how I am thinking about what might be happening in the deep sea related to interest in potentially exploiting marine minerals. Um, and that in all of the environment types that Amy talked about and the uh, um, minerals that are found there, um, you can have complex uh, animal and microbial communities living in those places. Um, in some cases, very unique animals that are dependent on the chemistry of those environments. Um, OCE has a long history of supporting research in those places and understanding those cool uh, ecosystems. Um, there's a lot of research into understanding kind of those chemical processes and things. And so um, what I'm thinking about, what Cobra's thinking about is, you know, how might this new human industry um, impact what is happening in these environments. And we'll see in this uh, diagram that there's a part over there on the right uh, showcasing a scientific drilling vessel and connecting that to subsea floor carbon sequestration. So sidebar, if anyone wants to talk about that, I'd be happy to. That's not what I'm going to focus on here. Um, so uh, as scientists, we often talk about what happens in the deep sea in like very academic terms of like carbon fixation and chemosynthesis. Um, and um, I have been uh, training myself to also think about these things more from a societal context. And this often gets um, put into kind of more of a capitalist framework of what does the ecosystem do for you? Uh, and, you know, referring to things that happen in the environment kind of in that framework, right? So a service is that these ecosystems provide food, they do climate regulation. They cycle nutrients that support everything else. Um, there are reservoir for genetic resources, on and on. Um, and there's some great uh, resources available from the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative, if anybody would like to learn more about these types of services that happen in the environments that might be targeted for marine mineral um, exploitation. Um, and when we think about those services, then we think about what might be potential impacts of exploitation. Um, and so here's one schematic of one of those types of impacts where you can imagine that to collect marine minerals, um, you would use some kind of collection device uh, that will create sediment plume disturbances, 
You will also have disturbances higher in the water column from the return plume uh, from the after the ship has processed the uh, materials. Um, I think it's important to recognize in some of these really nice schematics that a key element is missing in them and that there are no animals shown here. Um, but we clearly know that there are animals on the seafloor that will be impacted by these, um, these activities. Um, and I was part of a paper led by Diva Eman uh, that came out last year that did an extensive literature review to try to understand what do we know about environmental baselines in these types of habitats um, and some of the key topics you would need to study to have a baseline. <clears throat> The uh, intensity of the color is a reflection of that there's more and more information available. Um, and so uh, maybe not surprisingly, considering the investment of OCE and other programs, right? we have comparatively more information from the hydrothermal vent environments um, than we do from some of these other habitats that might be um, <clears throat> uh, considered for mineral exploitation. Um, and in particular, for instance, if you look at that bottom line, life histories, things like how do animals reproduce in the deep sea? We have very little information about that in some of these ecosystems. Furthermore, if you look at things like what are potential impacts, how do these ecosystems respond to those impacts, being things like noise, uh, um, the, the creating sediment plume disturbances, metal toxicity, um, we have really little information. And so I think that's a key thing for OCE to be considering is, you know, these are big knowledge gaps that would need to be uh, resolved to underpin understanding if we can start this industry responsibly. Um, I am a microbial biogeochemist. Uh, uh, and so I am often thinking about this in a microbial context. And I would say that the role of microbes in these deep sea ecosystems um, hasn't gotten as much attention as uh, animal uh, um, things, maybe for obvious reasons, animals are a little bit easier to think about than microbes. Um, uh, but again, if we think about what microbes do in these deep sea ecosystems, right, they, they provide services um, that are really essential for the ecosystems to function, things like primary production, uh, the transformation of organic material, nutrient mineral recycling. Um, uh, and so to give you some examples, if you don't think about what microbes do, right, like the conversion of carbon dioxide into organic carbon fueled by chemosynthetic processes um, or chemolithotrophic reactions, right, that's a very important service, right? They are providing new food to this ecosystem. They Microbes are an incredible reservoir of genetic information that could potentially be used for things like antibiotic discovery, anti-cancer compounds, you name it. Um, the point I want to emphasize here is, again, we have, we have big knowledge gaps in terms of what are the values, what are the ranges of these services, what is the variability of these services, um, to then understand how we might value them in comparison to the value we might get uh, from exploitation of critical minerals or marine minerals. Um, so just as one example, this is from a study that came out a few years back uh, led by uh, some teams based in Germany where they had gone to an environment that had previously been experimentally dredged um, and it was a place that had nodules um, and went back and asked a bunch of different questions. I'm just focusing on one of them. How is primary productivity in the form of creation of new uh, organic carbon from carbon fixation, uh, how is that rate affected if you compare pristine sediment, sediment that was dredged 26 years ago, and sediment that was just dredged on the expedition? And so to draw your attention to that graph on the right, the orange bars are the rates in the sediment that have been impacted decades ago, right? So often we think of microbial processes as being kind of very resilient um, uh, and that they can recover on much faster timescales than animals might be able to like recolonize, for example. And this study shows that like you even decades later have a loss of microbial ecosystem service. Um, and so that's something that we'll want to keep in mind uh, for evaluating uh, what's happening in these ecosystems. 
So I would say some cre critical knowledge gaps related to this topic of marine minerals that OCE might want to think about. Um, uh, uh, first one, echoing Amy, right? We need to actually understand the marine mineral content of what is on the seafloor. Um, these, these global maps might tell us where there's potential, <laughs> but they don't actually tell us what the resource is, what the content is, um, you know, what is the mineral forms, all those things, right? So that's still uh, uh, an area that requires research. Um, but we also then need to understand the biodiversity and ecosystem services that are in these habitats and how they could be impacted by exploitation, and not just on the seafloor, but also in the water column. Uh, likewise, we have very, very little data on resilience of ecosystem services in the deep sea um, to these kinds of perturbations, right? Again, I emphasize that we almost, we know almost nothing about how animals reproduce in the deep sea. Um, so it's really hard to understand how uh, uh, impacts might translate to organisms that you don't even know how they reproduce. Um, but we need that kind of research. We need studies on impacts and resilience. We also need, if we, this industry is gonna develop, right? we need to figure out cost-effective strategies to provide early warning related to preventing harm. Uh, so monitoring strategies, observation strategies, shipboard analyses, all those kinds of things are gonna be, need to you know, accelerate. Um, and then we also need to think about this in the context of cumulative impacts with other stressors in the deep sea, for instance, like climate change. Uh, if we're gonna accelerate on ocean CDR strategies that are sinking all kinds of things to the deep sea, like how does that impact areas uh, where there's other stressors going on? And I would say that a critical need that we have to address these knowledge gaps, and again, a place where OCE could help, is in relation that we need a lot more deep sea scientists <laughs> to be helping with this kind of research. And we need to also think about how scientists are trained to communicate their scientific findings to these stakeholders, right? Um, this was also brought up in the other sessions about CDR and deoxygenation, you know, all these things. Um, uh, we know we're really good at talking to each other as scientists, but we may be less good at explaining what we're finding and what matters. Um, uh, and I would just like to emphasize that one of the other um, findings of that paper, um, the Amon and L paper, is that, you know, this is like decadal scale research <laughs> that is required for each of these resource types to really get at these baselines, the natural variability, what are the methods we should be using, um, uh, so, you know, I think this is appropriate for considering for this decadal survey of ocean sciences, like this could be a decadal type program. Um, uh, there's obviously way more I could say about this. If you want to read more about these knowledge gaps or about what's going on related to deep sea mining uh, potential, the COBRA program that I talked about, um, we've had several webinars on this topic over in the past year. Um, so I'd invite you to see those. They're recorded. They're up on YouTube um, uh, in case you want to some more detail about all these things. Um, and then just uh, again, to emphasize that part I made uh, when I was talking about the needs, right? Um, I think what COBRA is doing as well as other cell nets that are in the ocean space, like the deep ocean observing strategy um, as another example, right? Of these kind of international network of networks I think are really essential for trying to help uh, uh, identify research strategies to like accelerate filling those knowledge gaps, to bring the training to for a scientists and students on how to translate to policymakers, um, and also to try to increase that education for the next generation. Um, uh, so, you know, in terms of thinking about OCE strategies, I think it's also a, a broader NSF wide strategy of like, are there other programs in NSF that we can look to as examples so that we're not just individual project focus, but thinking about things more collectively. Um, and just as an example of that, just a few weeks ago, the um, COBRA and the other um, one of the other um, NSF cell nets for um, in the ocean space, I do collaboratively held this workshop specifically about like, okay, scientists, you have all this knowledge or you're developing all this knowledge. How would you translate this for policymakers who are right now trying to come up with thresholds and guidelines for these very important topics that we have very little data on? 
um, and, and helping with that data translation um, to policymakers. Um, and taking that a step further, like actually like trying to show scientists like you can actually go to these policy meetings and share your information and have direct impact um, uh, to make sure that science is informing these new industries that are forming and the regulation of them. Um, uh, I know I'm going a little over time. Uh, hopefully uh, I'm okay here. Just a couple things I wanna emphasize. So I, I think I said this already, like we need to accelerate the development of shipboard and in-situ methods for assessing ecosystem service changes in real time. So that if an industry is operating, they see they're causing harm, they can stop <laughs> before it becomes serious. Um, and right now we don't have a lot of technology to do that. Um, we, we're gonna need more ocean observing technology and approaches, right? And translating what we're learning from OOI to these types of environments because they're gonna require monitoring. Um, and I love this graphic because it shows all the ways you can measure stuff in the surface ocean and like the deep sea is like just a little part of that, right? So like we've really got to push the deep sea aspect of our ocean observing technologies. Um, as Amy said, right, we're going to need uh, deep sea assets for this kind of research. Ships, ROVs, AUVs, HOVs, moorings, profilers, coring systems, right? Like we... We need to make sure that we have these, and if not, like increase these capacities. If it's only like one expedition a year studying this, we're never gonna close that decadal gap. Um, and I'm gonna end with this, uh, just highlighting two things from a recent um, advisor, uh, the European Academy's Science Advisory Council, right? So the, like the individual science advisory councils of all these different European countries in at a higher level at the European Academy level, they recently came out with a report just a few months ago about this topic. Um, and one of the things they highlight, um, and this is something that Amy also brought up, right, like the types of minerals we're considering for this new industry, um, it's questionable how much we need them from the deep sea in terms of their supply risk. Um, is one of the things they emphasized here. But what I wanted to point out is one of these statements that was in this summary, is that the lack, lack of consensus on what constitutes serious harm and the current lack of quantitative thresholds is gonna limit the ability of in the international waters, International Seabed Authority, um, but that you could translate this to any country that's considering it in their waters. It's gonna limit the abil ability to effectively protect the marine environment until we understand these ecological consequences. Um, and so that's really what I want to emphasize here is, again, we have an industry that's maybe going out the door and we don't have yet the baselines. We need to fill those critical knowledge gaps. And I really hope OCE um, is interested in doing that. With that, I am done. Hey, Amy and uh, Beth, thank you very much. And uh, we're, we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, we'll ask uh, Tubash. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, so it, tell me, can you tell me a little bit more about the kind of seagoing capabilities you would need in order to do this research that um, you're thinking about as prior research areas in particular? Um, you know, we've recently taken a deep dive in, into the ocean drilling program. But overall, you know, this morning we heard about the Ocean Observing Initiative. And of course, we're going to hear more about the you know, seagoing capabilities. So can you tell me a little bit more what is required on your end? Um, I'll, I'll go first, Amy, I'm curious your perspective. Yeah. Um, right, so the, the research that's currently happening uh, that I'm aware of, um, you know, it requires commitments uh, to like do multiple cruises to the same place repeatedly. Uh, you know, if not within a year, like several years, right? To again understand those impacts, uh, you want to, you know, you want to set some baseline data. You want to understand the variability. You want to understand impacts. You want to understand recovery from impacts, right? So that's a commitment to have assets in a place where there's kind of an agreement. We're going to try to do this work in this place, um, uh, and you're. Um, uh, to do these studies well requires like having moorings, having um, uh, sediment traps, having 
things in the water column to look at sediment plumes, having ROVs that can go in the water right as impacts are happening to see like where things are moving um, or other, you know, like cameras um, on landers, um, right? I mean, uh, where this is all proposed to happen is in, in the deep sea, <laughs> far away from land. And so thinking about, right, like um, so many of the OI um, demonstrations that have happened, right, based on like the regional cable array, right, there's power. Like that's gonna be a huge thing we've got to solve for doing this out far away from land is like, how are you gonna power all the equipment to do monitoring in an effective way? Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but hopefully at least it gives you a sense of the scale that I think we're going to need. Yeah, I'll I'll add to what um, Beth said. Uh, I, I think part of it depends on what OCE decides is within their mandate. Um, so, you know, Beth talked about monitoring as a really uh, critical component of, of understanding, you know, impacts if, if this goes forward. Um, at a minimum, we need, you know, ships that can stay at sea for, for a month at a time to do this work uh, because you're often, you know, a week's transit from shore. So uh, shorter trips than that don't don't really make sense. Um, ROVs and AUVs that can work to 6,000 meters. So it's a basic requirement. Um, I did mention drilling before and you mentioned it too. So if you want to quantify crusts or hydrothermal minerals, you do need, you know, lander type or ROV type drills. Um, I'm not sure whether OC would would consider that in their workload, but um, yeah, there's uh, pretty serious assets depending on what you want to do. Thanks ladies, this is Allison. Um, while I fully appreciate the need to do more scientific research on some of the examples you gave, Beth, the impacts, how animals reproduce in the deep sea, et cetera, et cetera, I'm wondering, do we really need to know more to know that mineral extraction would be bad for these animals or for these ecosystems? And I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Um, yeah, thanks for that question. It's an interesting one. Um, uh, you know, one of the case studies we have is the work that's been happening in the Clarion Clipperton zone, um, which Amy highlighted in her, uh, talk as a place where there's a lot of attention for nodules, right? Um, and there you, the, there's kind of an agreement that there are these set aside areas, um, uh, where no harm should happen, nothing should change. And that even within a contracted area for potential exploitation, that a contractor would have to have impact zones and preservation zones um, uh, to show that, uh, to kind of think about that, you know, maybe we're impacting the animals right where we're doing our work, but if there are similar animals somewhere nearby and they're not impacted, maybe it's okay, you know, maybe their larva could spread or whatever they need. Um, uh, and, uh, what I have seen in the data so far is that often, uh, the assignments of those preservation zones and the impact zones have actually different communities in them. Uh, and so, uh, we maybe don't know, are we, are we preserving what we need to preserve? Uh, you know, do we have enough spatial variability, um, here? So, in some ways, I think, yes, we still need to understand if we're going to cause impacts. Like, I don't know if we're going to be able to understand everybody, every organism's reproductive strategy, but we at least need to know, are they in the, are they in places where they're going to be impacted or not? If they're more widespread, that's one thing. If they're very rare, that's a different thing. Um, and, uh, and then I'll answer this another way too. I know that, for instance, uh, other federal agencies are also interested in this topic in terms of uh, should we be accelerating technology development, for instance, in this space, um, and kind of doing some of those economic assessments of given what we already know at a low level about ecosystems and what they provide and the potential monetary value of those services, and then we compare that to the potential monetary value of exploiting minerals, is there an, a justifiable economic case for doing that? Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's also something that we're going to need to do 
you know, scientists collaborating with econom uh, economists to think about those things and to help calibrate those kinds of uh, estimates. I had a, a follow-up question to that related question is, um, given the you know, what you said about the need for technology and observations on impact and so on, it, what what is the responsibility of the mining companies in the open ocean away from the uh, ocean ocean um, uh, controlled zones of individual countries? Are, are they responsible for doing an environmental impacts and assessing that? Uh does that depend on where those companies are based, which country those countries are based? Uh, right. So the, the mining code is still being developed for work in international waters um, in the area. Um, but yes, in principle, uh, every contractor would have to do an environmental impact assessment and present a plan for how they're going to monitor uh, environmental impacts. Um, and that's a very hot topic right now at the International Seabed Authority of what are the requirements for those types of assessments? Um, what would be the required monitoring strategy? Uh, is it a one size fits all or is it kind of a resource location uh, approach dependent, right? Um, uh, so uh, there's not a firm answer to your question other than yes, in general, it is the contractor's responsibility to do that monitoring assessment. Um, the worry of um, people like myself is that uh, if we develop the regulations before we actually know that the regulations will work to ensure the effective protection of the marine environment, um, are we setting, you know, we're setting ourselves up for precedent of giving uh, permission to do something before we know if it actually will prevent harm. Thank you, Beth. Um, this is too, but Jim just handed me the microphone for my second question. Um, Amy, you spoke about um, the need for more partnerships towards the end of your remarks. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what kinds of partnerships you were referring to? Is this with other agencies like USGS or is this with industry? Tell us more. Yeah, um, I mean, potentially both, right? So I think the the one of the points that I was trying to make um, is that if we're talking about critical minerals, we're talking about a topic um, that is based on minerals entering the supply chain, which to date is terrestrial minerals and coastal minerals. So deep sea minerals are currently not in that sphere, right? Like this is a potential future where deep sea minerals enter that sphere. Um, and so I think on all sorts of topics, we need partnerships with people who understand the current landscape of, of critical mineral systems, right? So when we're talking about um, harm or environmental impacts of deep ocean mineral extraction, um, I think one of the things that people have been trying to do for a while, and it's not in any way trivial to do, uh, is to compare those impacts to impacts of terrestrial mineral extraction. Um, can we compare those? Um, and so that's a, a major ongoing challenge. Um, I think when we're talking about, you know, designing an in, in, uh, environmental uh, baseline study or some experimental work to consider what impacts of extraction um, in a given region might be, uh, as I mentioned in my talk, there are a handful of, of regions where we have quantified resources in the deep sea. Um, for anything outside of those regions, um, I think you need a, a partnership to determine if the region is relevant um, for the work. Um, so I think this is a, a far, far reaching um, need. Okay, I see that uh, Shannon has a question. Hi, I guess the one is for Amy as well. It's just curious about the kind of scientific co-benefits, if you will. Um, what are what other research lines could benefit from um, exploration of looking at critical minerals? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's a a really uh, great topic. Um, I think if you switch from the the critical minerals lens briefly to marine minerals lens, um, all of a sudden there's a many different aspects of, uh, of OCE um, and other topics that are relevant. You know, permanganese crusts accrete really slowly from seawater. 
Uh, so they have significant uses uh, as paleo-oceanographic records, um, which is a really important thing to understand um, right now. I think, uh, you know, in terms of uh, hydrothermal systems, um, it's uh, both an, an ongoing question, uh, how trace elements from hydrothermal systems impact the wider oceans, and how hydrothermal systems impact ocean ecosystems um, once they become inactive, what that intersection is. Um, my team does a lot of work on um, ferromanganese minerals and how they vary in composition in different areas, which is generally as, as a, um, well, almost entirely as a result of um, changing oceanic parameters in, in basin scale regions. Um, so I think um, there's a wealth of information um, to to be gained um, about the ocean system from, from studying marine minerals. Beth, I have a question for you about, about the slow rate of recovery. I was curious to know if that's just because of the slow metabolic rates in deep sea or if there's something else there and how we should think about that in terms of um, impacts over long periods of time. Yeah, thanks for that question. I'm not sure who asked it. I can't really see the room. Um, this is Ajit. Oh, hi, Ajit. Um, uh, the, so the study I was referencing, uh, right, is in a, a nodule area. Those areas tend to co-locate with places that are really low sedimentation rates. Um, and so uh, in this case, right, it was experimental removal of the top layer of sediment, which would also happen with... Um, industrial sale collection of nodules, right? It would basically perturb the upper, let's say 10 centimeters of sediment. Uh, that's like millions of years of sediment accretion uh, in these low, uh, you know, tens of thousands to millions of years. And uh, those are relatively organic poor materials. And so uh, it, essentially what you're doing is you're removing the most organic rich material uh, and exposing much older sediment at the seafloor and so it's going to take, you know, geologic timescales <laughs> to get the sediment back to where it had been. Um, and so you're basically just left with a, a much more organic core and lower biomass microbial community that can never recover to those rates um, of activity um, is essentially how I view those types of um, uh, uh, products. I, I will say, right, that, that one thing to keep in mind, right, that was an experimental study that doesn't actually replicate what mining will look like. And in every study that has been done uh, since that study, right, of like actual test mining, right, the results end up being different because you're scaling the, the impacts to like closer to what they will be. Uh, and it doesn't mean that what you did in an experimental study actually scales to the industrial level scale. Um, in terms of how sediment is redistributed, you might have places, now you've moved all the more organic rich and put it somewhere else, uh, you might reactivate heterotrophy, you might have more remineralization. Um, so it's going to be a, a heterogeneous response within the ecosystem is something I also think we need to keep in mind. Okay, I think we're uh, out of time for this session. And uh, I want to thank both Beth and Amy. It's a very interesting talks and appreciate you your participation thank you